Second Journey, Part 5 of Narrative of the Operations and Recent Discoveries in Egypt and Nubia by Giovanni Belzoni. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Journey, Part 5 in the morning the men appeared rather late but we recommenced the work at the temple with much enthusiasm and good hopes i perceived the necessity of drawing the sand from the sides of the door so that it might run off from the centre toward which on the contrary if the sand were taken from the centre that from the sides would continually run the enterprising count de forben who never was within five hundred miles at least of the place judged that the sand might have been easily thrown into the river i wish he had been there once in his life and then he might have seen whether it were such a trifle as he represents it it was a mass of sand accumulated by the winds for many centuries and to have had it removed and thrown into the river would have been an undertaking that all the people the adjacent country afforded could not have effected in twelve months i was contented to make it my principal object to reach the door as the most speedy means of entering the temple this day i divided the men into two parties and stationed one on each side of the colossal figure that stood over the entrance they worked pretty well but were so few that the little sand they removed could scarcely be perceived seeing that it would be a very tedious business that way in the evening i made a proposal to the kachef to pay three hundred piastres for opening the temple which was agreed to by the kachef and the working men they continued their labor for three days with much ardor for they supposed they could finish it in that time as their number was increased to eighty by order of the kachef but on the evening of the third day there was as little prospect of seeing the door as on the first they got tired at last and under the pretext that the ramadan was to commence on the next day they left us with our temple the sand and the treasure and contented themselves with keeping the three hundred piastres which were partly paid to them previously to their beginning and partly on the third day during this time the kachefs dined with us our mess was in company with them and all their followers our banquet consisted of a small piece of mutton the water in which it was stewed some bread and a little butter or fat no sooner was the dinner set on the ground than a scramble took place every one crowded round the earthen bowl the kachefs was the first to dip in his hand and immediately the rest followed his example we four the two captains irby and mangles mr beechey and myself contrived to keep as close together as possible that we might all eat out of the same side of the dish and by this means have some chance of a cleaner meal the kachef seeing that we stood no chance against his people who at last plunged their hands into the dish from all quarters politely picked out the most fleshy parts from the bowl which he distinguished from the bones by a squeeze with his hand placed them on the sleeve of his gown and then continued to eat till the bowl was nearly emptied when all had done eating he presented each of us with a piece of the fleshy parts he had reserved as a compliment which we gladly devoured as there was no other chance of our having a morsel to eat till the next morning this day being the first of ramadan the fellows could not work but they could feast according to their holy law for though they know very little of religion they keep their own festivals as correctly and as regularly as an european the next day again nobody came near us and the two kachefs daoud and khalil went away from that time we took the resolution to work at the sand ourselves we were only six but the crew offered their services and thus our party amounted to fourteen in all finding that one of us did as much work as in the proportion of one to five of the barabra we were well satisfied and resolved to continue we rose every morning at the dawn of day and left off two hours and a half after sunrise our perseverance and independence drew some of the peasants to offer their services which we accepted but as many of them were from the opposite side of the nile they could not agree with those of isambul and there was a perpetual warfare between them besides from jealousy they increased to such a number that we could not employ them all which gave rise to fresh disputes so that we resolved to dismiss them all and continue the work by ourselves 
they still persisted in offering their services to what number we pleased but we saw it would not prevent their having quarrels and fighting every day and we therefore refused their offer one day we observed a boat on the opposite side of the nile steering toward us and as it approached we perceived that it was filled with well-armed men after the kachefs of isambul left us there was a man of that village who in spite of their orders still remained with us and occasionally helped us in the work his name was musmar which in english signifies nail mr nail was a great man told us wonderful stories of his astonishing courage gave us to understand that when the bedoweens from the desert attacked the village of isambul he was the first to resist them and vaunted that he was not afraid of any man in the world we were of course charmed at having such a gallant knight with us on the approach of the boat he seemed agitated and was very anxious to know who the people were while they were at a distance he said no one dared come where he was when they were nearer and he might see distinctly who they were he could not conceive what they wanted on this side of the water as soon as they had nearly reached the shore still pretending he was unable to guess who they could be he would ascend the mountain to observe them better with this he took to his heels and ran off as fast as he could scamper the men landed and ascended the hill of sand where we were we seized our arms for this is the only way to be respected by these gentry they approached the first was an elderly man who had strong traits of resolution in his countenance he held out his hand which i immediately shook according to the custom of the country they were the kachefs of ibrim father and son they seated themselves on the sand and the others stood they appeared in greater style than our sovereigns of isambul and had more swords and firearms we were pleased to find them friends particularly as we knew they were at war with hassan kachif and his sons daoud and khalil i perceived their disappointment for our attire did not bespeak riches besides seeing us at work like laborers they concluded we were but poor people they told us they were afraid of mahomed ali bashaw of egypt and presented us with two small and meagre sheep i was not pleased at this for i knew how the politeness of such gifts always ends we returned this civility by paying the servant who brought the sheep twice as much as they were worth and told the kachifs that we were sorry we had nothing to give them as we had exhausted everything but that we should recollect them on our return to the country they said they did not come thither to have anything from us and hoped on our return to cairo we would speak to the bashaw in their favour we answered we could not say anything against them as they never did us any harm or ever saw us before soon after they rose and we gave them the usual salute but they said they were going to see the small temple below our interpreter followed them as the boat was near that place and when they reached the temple they took him aside and told him that they were the masters of the country if the other kachefs killed one man they killed two they could stop or let us proceed on our works as well as the other kachefs for they were more powerful adding they knew we gave guns powder shot soap and tobacco to the others therefore they expected we should do more for them as they were superior and we might expect the consequences of refusing to comply with their demands at such proceedings i thought we were in as bad a situation as ever respecting our works at the temple for we had nothing left to give these people accordingly we sent them an answer that we had nothing for them at present but that they might depend on our words that we would bring them something on our future visit to nubia they replied we had no business to come into the country without written orders directed to them as they were the true masters of it we informed them we had a firman from the bashaw and sent our interpreter with it to show it them they opened it and looking at it said they could not understand one word in it besides it was not for them and therefore was good for nothing and even if we had one it would be to no purpose unless it was accompanied with presents of more value than we had given to the other kachefs 
while all this was passing the great potentates and their honourable followers walked towards their boat and hinted that we must think on the business while they were going to the village of isambul we left off work at our usual time and resumed our labour in the afternoon expecting that we should have some interruption in our proceedings but on the next day to our astonishment we heard that the great men were off at night we continued our operations regularly and in the course of a few days more we perceived a rough projection from the wall which indicated apparently that the work was unfinished and no door to be found there at this the hopes of some of our party began to fail nevertheless we persevered in our exertions and three days after we discovered a broken cornice the next day the torus and of course the frieze under which made us almost sure of finding the door the next day accordingly i erected a palisade to keep the sand up and to my utmost satisfaction saw the upper part of the door as the evening approached we dug away enough sand to be able to enter that night but supposing there might be some foul air in the cavity we deferred this till the next morning early in the morning of the first of august we went to the temple in high spirits at the idea of entering a newly discovered place we endeavoured as much as we could to enlarge the entrance but our crew did not accompany us as usual on the contrary it appeared that they intended to hinder us as much as lay in their power for when they saw that we really had found the door they wished to deter us from availing ourselves of it the attempt however failed they then pretended that they could not stop any longer with the boat in that place and if we did not go on board immediately they would set off with her and leave us on our refusal they knelt on the ground and threw sand over their faces saying that they would not stop an instant the fact was they had promised to the cacheffs to play some trick to interrupt our proceedings in case we should come to the door but even all this would not do we soon made the passage wider and entered the finest and most extensive excavation in nubia one that can stand a competition with any in egypt except the tomb newly discovered in biban al maluk from what we could perceive at the first view it was evidently a very large place but our astonishment increased when we found it to be one of the most magnificent of temples enriched with beautiful intaglios paintings colossal figures and so forth we entered at first into a large pronaos fifty-seven feet long and fifty-two wide supported by two rows of square pillars in a line from the front door to the door of the secos see plate forty three each pillar has a figure not unlike those at medinet abu finely executed and very little injured by time the tops of their turbans reach the ceiling which is about thirty feet high the pillars are five feet and a half square both these and the walls are covered with beautiful hieroglyphics the style of which is somewhat superior or at least bolder than that of any others in egypt not only in the workmanship but also in the subjects they exhibit battles storming of castles triumphs over the ethiopians sacrifices and so forth in some places is to be seen the same hero as at medinet abu but in a different posture some of the columns are much injured by the close and heated atmosphere the temperature of which was so hot that the thermometer must have risen to above a hundred and thirty degrees the second hall is about twenty-two feet high thirty-seven wide and twenty-five and a half long it contains four pillars about four feet square and the walls of this also are covered with fine hieroglyphics in pretty good preservation beyond this is a shorter chamber thirty-seven feet wide in which is the entrance into the sanctuary at each end of this chamber is a door leading into smaller chambers in the same direction with the sanctuary each eight feet by seven the sanctuary is twenty-three feet and a half long and twelve feet wide it contains a pedestal in the centre and at the end four colossal sitting figures the heads of which are in good preservation not having been injured by violence on the right side of this great hall entering into the temple are two doors at a short distance from each other each lead into two long separate rooms the first thirty-eight feet ten inches in length 
and eleven feet five inches wide the other forty eight feet seven inches by thirteen feet three at the end of the first are several unfinished hieroglyphics of which some though merely sketched give fine ideas of their manner of drawing at the lateral corners of the entrance into the second chamber from the great hall is a door each of which leads into a small chamber twenty two feet six inches long and ten feet wide each of these rooms has two doors leading into two other chambers forty three feet in length and ten feet eleven inches wide there are two benches in them apparently to sit on the most remarkable subjects in this temple are first a group of captive ethiopians in the western corner of the great hall second the hero killing a man with his spear another lying slain under his feet on the same western wall third the storming of a castle in the western corner from the front door the outside of this temple is magnificent it is a hundred and seventeen feet wide and eighty-six feet high the height from the top of the cornice to the top of the door being sixty-six feet six inches and the height of the door twenty feet there are four enormous sitting colossi the largest in egypt or nubia except the great sphinx at the pyramids to which they approach in the proportion of near two-thirds from the shoulder to the elbow they measure fifteen feet six inches the ears three feet six inches the face seven feet the beard five feet six inches across the shoulders twenty-five feet four inches their height is about fifty-one feet not including the caps which are about fourteen feet there are only two of these colossi in sight one is still buried under the sand and the other which is near the door is half fallen down and buried also on the top of the door is a colossal figure of osiris twenty feet high with two colossal hieroglyphic figures one on each side looking towards it on the top of the temple is a cornice with hieroglyphics a torus and a frieze under it the cornice is six feet wide the frieze is four feet above the cornice is a row of sitting monkeys eight feet high and six across the shoulders they are twenty-one in number this temple was nearly two-thirds buried under the sand of which we removed thirty-one feet before we came to the upper part of the door it must have had a very fine landing-place which is now totally buried under the sand it is the last and largest temple excavated in the solid rock in nubia or egypt except the new tomb it took twenty-two days to open it besides six days last year we sometimes had eighty men at work and sometimes only our own personal exertions the party consisting of mr beechey captains irby and mangles myself two servants and the crew eleven in all and three boys it is situated under a rock about a hundred feet above the nile facing the southeast by east and about one day and a half's journey from the second cataract in nubia or wadi halfa the heat was so great in the interior of the temple that it scarcely permitted us to take any drawings as the perspiration from our hands soon rendered the paper quite wet accordingly we left this operation to succeeding travellers who may set about it with more convenience than we could as the place will become cooler our stock of provision was so reduced that the only food we had for the next six days was dura boiled in water without salt of which we had none left the kachefs had given orders to the people not to sell us any kind of food whatever hoping that we might be driven away by hunger but there was an abadi who lived in the village and as he was of a different tribe he was not so much afraid of disobeying the kachefs he sometimes came at night and brought us milk but he was at last detected and prevented from bringing any more great credit is due to mr beechey and the two captains for their laborious exertions in assisting me in the above operation i must not omit to mention that in the temple we found two lions with hawks heads the body as large as life a small sitting figure and some copper work belonging to the doors we left isambul on the fourth of august and did not stop at ibrim as we had seen it before on passing tomas a village on the western banks of the nile 
we were told that daou kachef was there we found he was ready to receive us and came himself on board entreating us to go on shore which we did though not without hesitation as he had not behaved well to us he wished us to stop all night and attempted to be very civil we stated to him that we had not been well treated by the people of isambul to which he replied hastily that he knew nothing of the matter but how could he be ignorant of it when one of his men who came to see us at work and inquired whether we attest one was at that moment standing by his side as well as others whom we recognized to have been of the party and who came there to raise a disturbance perceiving we knew what he had done to us he attempted to make us amends presenting us with a sheep and a basket of bread and on quitting the place i received a present from his wife for mrs belzoni of a millet goat two small baskets and a carpet made of palm leaves i gave in return two pair of turkish women's boots and two small looking-glasses on our arrival at deir we met khalil kachaf who crossed the nile in a boat and hailed us saying he would return to us very soon by this time it was quite dark and we went to see the temple immediately with candles as we hoped to set off early in the morning and avoid meeting such a sincere friend on our return we attempted to procure some provision but it was too late at night about ten o'clock khalil returned but we were asleep early in the morning we were told that he had sent us some aqua vita and a lamb we were sorry for this as it retarded us some time after he came on board accompanied by his party we returned him thanks for what we had received but told him that we could not give him anything in return as we were destitute ourselves and that at isambul we had lived on boiled dura for several days as the peasants had refused to sell us anything to eat we knew very well that all this was done by his order but he pretended like his brother not to know anything of it we did not think proper to say much as we wished to be gone and leave these affectionate friends on peaceful terms at last after examining our boat and the strange figure we had found in the temple he with great sorrow quitted us and we set off immediately it is to be remarked that all his civility was out of opposition to his brother daoud in hopes that we should bring him something on our coming up again for it was plain to be seen that it was all forced politeness the temple at deir is in a very ruinous state i saw but one or two figures entire the fragments of the rest indicate that it was dedicated to osiris there was a portico with sixteen pillars twelve of which are fallen down it was a chamber and a sanctuary with two small chambers one on each side in about two hours we arrived at almeida the ruins of a small temple on the north of the nile the river there takes its course from northwest to southeast it is a small temple and has served for a greek chapel the hieroglyphics are pretty well finished but nearly covered with plaster by the greeks there are other apartments of unburnt bricks which served as a monastery to the works towards evening we arrived at sabua the ruins of the temple here i have described before four days more brought us down to el kalabsha we landed to visit the temple but the fellas seeing our boat at some distance gathered together at the entrance to the temple determined we should not go in unless we first paid them for leave we were accordingly stopped and money was demanded we refused to comply but promised that if they would let us in we would give them a bakshis afterward as this did not satisfy them and they behaved in a very insolent manner we were returning to our boat when our soldier said that he would remember them on this their daggers were instantly drawn and his gun was seized a scuffle took place which gave us something to do to rescue the gun from the one who had taken it from the soldier and was endeavouring to decamp with it on our approaching the boat some of them perceiving our indifference whether we saw the temple or not came to offer to let us enter while others were of a different opinion but as we had seen the temple before we did not think it worth our while to venture to force our way into it while all this was going on at the temple others attacked the boat 
but as our people were armed with pistols and guns they retreated one man entered the boat with a drawn sword but was turned out having left el calabcia we passed by taffa but could not land there as the narrow passage of the nile did not permit us to approach the shore there are two small temples at taffa which i had seen before one consists of a single chamber and two columns one of which is not finished the other has some few hieroglyphics in a good style it serves as a stable for sheep and cows we arrived the same evening at hindau where we saw an extensive wall apparently made to enclose a vast building or probably more than one there are the remains of a portal on the north side and a great quantity of ruins within coming down we saw several quarries and ruins in one of which is a door cut in the rock in the egyptian style and a number of greek inscriptions written i suppose by some greek workmen and which i think serve to prove that the greeks procured stones from this place we observed the remains of a temple of which six columns are standing beautifully adorned with the lotus and other emblematic devices of the egyptians farther down there is another column standing alone in a few hours we arrived at tabu this temple has a portico and a sikos which leads into the cella at each side of which is a small chamber in the portico also are two chambers and a staircase leading to the top there are a few hieroglyphics and in the sikos are two monolite temples of granite in the porch of the building are three portals one before another the whole building is surrounded by a wall on the water side is a quay with an entrance toward the temple we arrived on the same day at the island of philo mrs belzoni went to aswan by land and we resolved to pass the cataract in a boat in which we came the barbarians made objections and took some advantage but they will do anything for money accordingly we set off from the island and began to take our course gradually among the rapids and rocks of the shellal as we advanced we expected every moment to arrive at the spot where the great fall is but having passed over several rapids one in particular a little stronger but not more extraordinary than are seen in other rivers we were agreeably surprised to find that in less than an hour we were out of all danger i have seen the great cataract at the west side when the water is low and its fall was then in length about six hundred yards forming an angle of thirty or thirty-five degrees divided by the interspersed rocks into several branches on our arrival at aswan we prepared immediately for our departure but meanwhile we visited the island of elephantine once more and in the evening went to see the column with the latin inscription which i discovered in the mountain of aswan we had some difficulty to find it again as the guide conducted us by another road different from that which i took the first time next day we left that place and as the current of the nile it being now near its height was very strong we reached thebes in three days on our passage we visited edfu once more and farther down we landed at Alethius and took a cursory view of its ruins and grottoes there is a high thick wall of unburnt bricks which surrounds the whole town it is a square enclosure of six hundred and seventy yards we saw the ruins of three or four temples one appears to have been very extensive but only six columns of the portico remain see plate forty one and part of the seacoast of another this town was formerly much more extensive than it is at present as appears by its ruins i observed part of the walls of ancient buildings at some distance from the great wall which surrounds the town among the ruins of the largest temple i noticed part of a large sphinx of white marble with the head of a woman and the body of a lion there were also fragments of several statues and other ornaments of the temple part of which are covered by its own ruins on the east of this temple was a small lake or rather tank which perhaps was a public bath as we may likewise presume of those near the temple in karnak but at present there is no water in it on the west of the town is another building of a later date which extends from the great wall to the river there are many ruins of houses with arches but the walls are inferior in point of size 
the remains of a pier or landing place are visible when the water is low and it appeared to me that there had been a causeway from the stair at the water side to the temple the country round the town is pretty flat and extends above a mile from the nile to the mountains it must have been all cultivated and fertile as the few spots that are now in cultivation are very productive some excellent grapes are produced in this place and it is to be remarked that from the representations in the grottoes or sepulchres in the mountains the dressing of vines appears to have formed one of the chief occupations of the people the sepulchres in these rocks are numerous and several are much on the same plan as those of gournou some contain various agricultural representations from which may be formed a more exact idea of their manner of living than i have seen anywhere else the figures and colors are in pretty good preservation i cannot say however that they can boast of any great perfection in their sculpture and it is evident that the dead deposited in those places must have been husbandmen i am of opinion that this town had a communication with the red sea my reason for which i shall state hereafter one mile to the north of the town is a small peripteral temple situated in the midst of an extensive plain now covered with sand but which evidently was once cultivated the rock in which the tombs are cut forms a solitary hill that commands the surrounding country from its summit i could see an extensive plain of sand extending north and south of the town nine or ten miles along the banks of the nile and a mile and a half in breadth from the river to the foot of the mountain when the whole of this land was cultivated it must have produced provisions sufficient for a town of considerable importance three miles to the north of Alethias, the rocks reach close to the nile there is a village named el kab which includes the whole of the above-mentioned land with the ruins of Alethias. on our arrival at luxor we took up our former abode in the seacoast of the temple and found ourselves at home again for thebes was now become quite familiar to me we received letters from mr salt by which we learned that he was purposing to ascend the nile the two captains irby and mangles set off for cairo mr beechey began to take drawings of the different places and i recommenced my researches at gournou i found two more agents of mr Duetti busied in digging the ground in all directions and who had been tolerably successful in their researches for mummies these agents were of a different caste from the two comps who had been there before both of them were piedmontese one a renegade who had deserted from the french army when in egypt and entered the service of the bashaw the other had left piedmont after the fall of the late government i did not like to begin my work in either place near these people and therefore gave up the idea of prosecuting my researches in gournou it was fortunate for me i did so and from that time i made the valley of biban el maluk the scene of my researches which is completely separated from gournou by the chain of mountains that divides thebes from the valley i went to this plain quite alone and spent the whole day in making observations the result of which confirmed me in the opinion that there was a sufficient prospect to encourage me to commence my work End of part thirteen. second journey part six of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain second journey part six it will be recollected that when we left thebes for the island of philo we could not obtain any laborers in consequence of the orders of the bay supposing the same would be the case at this time i sought the cachef of ermentz to obtain an order to allow the men to work i found that the old cachef had fallen into disgrace with the defrader bay and was displaced and gone consequently i applied to the cachef of goose who had become ruler over the great city of a hundred gates he was well aware that to allow us to engage men to work would not please the defrader bay but reflecting on the firman we had from the bashaw himself and the barefaced distinction made in favour of the opposite party who had many men at work he could not well refuse me a small number of arabs 
i accordingly obtained from him a firman to the sheikhs of gournou to furnish me with twenty men with whom i began my operations in the valley above mentioned here i entered upon an undertaking that appeared rather presumptuous when i recollected that many travellers had been there and many had inquired as to the possibility of discovering more tombs than were already known even from the time of herodotus and strabo the former speaks of the tombs as being above forty in number in the time of strabo not half so many were known to exist having found by experience that the reports of ancient authors are not always to be depended upon particularly when they speak from hearsay i put them out of the account and proceeded entirely on my own judgment to search for the tombs of the monarchs of thebes i began in the valley to the westward of babu el maluk near the same place where i discovered the tomb the year before here i must acquaint my reader that the only guide i had in these discoveries was the knowledge i had acquired in the continued researches for tombs i made in gournou in these i found that the egyptians had a particular manner of forming the entrance into their tombs which gave me many leading ideas to the discovery of them besides the supposition that many of these tombs must have been buried under the stones and rubbish which continually fall from the upper parts of the mountains the great quantity of materials cut out of the tomb accumulated in considerable heaps in different parts of the valley might give various suggestions of the spots where the entrance to the tombs was to be found as is justly observed by mr hamilton but all these striking reasons it appears were insufficient to lead any traveller to persevere in the attempt or to make the attempt at all and indeed it would have been the same with me had i not been acquainted with a more secure mode of proceeding after a long survey of the western valley i could observe only one spot that presented the appearance of a tomb accordingly i set the men to work near a hundred yards from the tomb which i discovered the year before and when they had got a little below the surface they came to some large stones which had evidently been put there by those who closed the tomb having removed these stones i perceived the rock had been cut on both sides and found a passage leading downwards i could proceed no farther that day as the men were much fatigued and we had more than four miles to return to thebes the next day we resumed our labour and in a few hours came to a well-built wall of stones of various sizes the following day i caused a large pole to be brought and by means of another small piece of palm tree laid across the entrance i made a machine not unlike a battering ram the walls resisted the blows of the arabs for some time as they were not romans nor had the pole the ram's head of bronze at its end but they contrived to make a breach at last and in the same way the opening was enlarged we immediately entered and found ourselves on a staircase eight feet wide and ten feet high at the bottom of which were four mummies in their cases lying flat on the ground with their heads toward the outside farther on were four more lying in the same direction the cases were all painted and one had a large covering thrown over it exactly like the pall upon the coffins of the present day i went through the operation of examining all these mummies one by one they were much alike in their foldings except that which had the painted linen over it among the others i found one that had new linen apparently put over the old rags which proves that the egyptians took great care of their dead even for many years after their decease that which was distinguished from the rest i observed was dressed in finer linen and more neatly wrapped up it had garlands of flowers and leaves and on the side over the heart i found a plate of the metal which i have already described soft like lead covered with another metal not unlike silver leaf it had the eyes of a cow which so often represents isis engraved on it and in the centre of the breast was another plate with the winged globe both plates were nearly six inches long on unfolding the linen we still found it very fine which was not the case with the other mummies for after three or four foldings it was generally of a coarser kind at last we came to the body of which nothing was to be seen but the bones which had assumed a yellow tint 
the case was in part painted but the linen cloth covering it fell to pieces as soon as it was touched i believe owing to the paint that was on it which consisted of various devices and flowers the cases were sunk four inches into the cement i have already mentioned some of the painting on the inside of the cases appeared quite fresh as if recently done and there was generally a coat of varnish whether laid on over the colours or incorporated with them i do not know for what purpose this tomb might have been intended i cannot pretend to say perhaps it was originally designed for one of the royal blood it appeared by the entrance to have been commenced on a scale similar to those of the kings though it seems to have been finished for a more humble family the result of my researches gave me all the satisfaction i could desire of finding mummies in cases in their original position but this was not the principal object i had in view for as i was near the place where the kings of egypt were buried i thought i might have a chance of discovering some of their relics the sacred valley named biban al maluk begins at gournou runs toward the southwest and gradually turns due south it contains the celebrated tombs of the kings of egypt and divides itself into two principal branches one of which runs two miles farther to the westward making five miles from the nile to the extremity the other which contains most of the tombs is separated from gournou only by a high chain of rocks which can be crossed from thebes in less than an hour the same rocks surround the sacred ground which can be visited only by a single natural entrance that is formed like a gateway or by the craggy paths across the mountains the tombs are all cut out of the solid rock which is of hard calcareous stone as white as it is possible for a stone to be the tombs in general consist of a long square passage which leads to a staircase sometimes with a gallery at each side of it and other chambers advancing farther we come to wider apartments and other passages and stairs and at last into a large hall where the great sarcophagus lay containing the remains of the kings some of these tombs are quite open and others encumbered with rubbish at the entrance nine or ten may be reckoned of a superior class and five or six of a lower order strabo may have counted eighteen as may be done to this day including some of an inferior class which cannot be esteemed as tombs of the kings of egypt from any other circumstances than that of having been placed in this valley for my part i could distinguish only ten or eleven that could be honoured with the name of the tombs of kings nor do i suppose when strabo was told by the egyptian priest that there were forty-seven tombs of the kings of egypt they meant to say these tombs were all in the place now named biban al maluk in confirmation of this i would observe that similar tombs and perhaps even more magnificent ones are to be found out of this valley which are open to this very day i do not mean the tombs in the western valley that forms the other branch of biban al maluk but those in gournou which the traveller seldom fails to see there are various tombs in that place which are worthy to be compared with those in biban al maluk and i will venture to say that there is one in gournou far superior to any in that valley being more extensive and from the fragments that remain apparently of greater magnificence but the frequent exposure to all sorts of injury from the various visitors owing to their being nearer to the nile has reduced the tombs at gournou to a state of the greatest dilapidation from the besmoked and defaced walls it is easy to see that they have been frequently visited and perhaps inhabited by herds of arabs at a time who retired to these recesses to escape the violent hands of their pursuers if we add the tombs in the valley above mentioned to those of the superior class at gournou i will allow that the egyptian priests were right in their reports otherwise i must say it is my firm opinion that in the valley of biban el malu there are no more than are now known in consequence of my late discoveries for previously to my quitting that place i exerted all my humble abilities in endeavouring to find another tomb but could not succeed and what is a still greater proof independent of my own researches after i quitted the place mr salt the british consul 
resided there four months and labored in like manner in vain to find another i think therefore i may venture to assert that the whole forty or forty-seven tombs of the kings of egypt could not be in this valley but some of them were in various other places one argument more i shall offer on this subject if the tombs of gournou above mentioned which are superior to those in the valley of biban al maluk in size in variety of apartments consequently in number and i will add from what now remains to be seen in the excellence of the sculpture were not for the kings of egypt what other person in that country could aspire to such high honours and presume to have tombs superior to those of the kings if i may be permitted to give my humble opinion on the subject i should conclude that the tombs in the valley of biban al maluk were erected subsequently to those in gournou for i could scarcely find a spot in the latter place adapted to the excavation of one of the great tombs and it may be supposed that when all the best spots for large tombs in gournou had been occupied the egyptians went over the rocks to seek another situation in which to deposit their kings certain it is that the tombs in the valley of biban al maluk are in far better condition than those in gournou under these circumstances reflecting on the possibility of discovering some of the tombs of the kings i set the few men i had to work on the sixth of october i began my excavation and on the ninth discovered the first tomb the apparent arrangement of the entrance indicated it to be a very large one but it proved to be only the passage of one that was never finished the egyptians however would not lose their labour for they used it as a tomb notwithstanding though it is not extensive they plastered it very finely with white and painted some very fine figures on it in the most finished style this passage is ten feet five inches wide and seventy-five feet from the entrance to the part where we come to evidently the unfinished work from the appearance as it stands it is plain that they intended to proceed and that some particular event caused the work to be stopped the painted figures on the wall are so perfect that they are the best adapted of any i ever saw to give a correct and clear idea of the egyptian taste this tomb lies south-east from the centre of the valley and quite at the foot of the large rocks that overlook gournou as i had several parties of fellahs at work in different directions i hoped to make farther discoveries and indeed this first success gave me much encouragement as it assured me that i was correct in my idea of discovering the tombs on the same day we perceived some marks of another tomb in an excavation that had been begun three days before precisely in the same direction as the first tomb and not a hundred yards from it in fact i had the pleasure to see this second tomb on the same day the ninth this is more extensive but entirely new and without a single painting in it it had been searched by the ancients as we perceived at the end of the first passage of brick wall which stopped the entrance and had been forced through after passing this brick wall you descend a staircase and proceed through another corridor at the end of which is the entrance to a pretty large chamber with a single pillar in the centre and not plastered in any part at one corner of this chamber we found two mummies on the ground quite naked without cloth or case they were females and their hair pretty long and well preserved though it was easily separated from the head by pulling it a little at one side of this room is a small door leading into a small chamber in which we found the fragments of several earthen vessels and also pieces of vases of alabaster but so decayed that we could not join one to another on the top of the staircase we found an earthen jar quite perfect with a few hieroglyphics on it and large enough to contain two buckets of water this tomb is a hundred feet from the entrance to the end of the chamber twenty feet deep and twenty-three wide the smaller chamber is ten feet square it faces the east by south and runs straight towards the west by north several days before we received news that there were some english people coming up from cairo and we were anxiously expecting them as we know by letter from that place that they were three english gentlemen 
Early on the morning of the 10th, they reached Biban al-Maluk, accompanied by Mr. Beechey, who was at Luxor, where they arrived the evening before. They were the first to enter into the two discovered tombs, and observed that the painted figure in the first was the best to be seen in Egypt in point of preservation. We were just quitting the valley to go over the mountain to Medinet Abu, when I was informed that there was some other discovery in one of the excavations near the centre of the valley. Thither we went immediately, and I perceived that there was another tomb. But as it could not be opened that day, the travellers proposed to return the next morning. That night I went over to Luxor also, where we arrived very late in the evening." early on the next morning the eleventh we began the tour of thebes we went to see the tombs at gurnu and the little temple in the valley behind the memnonium about twelve o'clock word was brought me that the tomb discovered the day before was opened so that we might enter it on this we took the road over the rocks immediately and arrived in less than three-quarters of an hour i found the tomb just opened and entered to see how far it was practicable to examine it having proceeded through a passage thirty-two feet long and eight feet wide i descended a staircase of twenty-eight feet and reached a tolerably large and well-painted room i then made a signal from below to the travellers that they might descend and they entered into the tomb which is seventeen feet long and twenty-one wide the ceiling was in good preservation but not in the best style we found a sarcophagus of granite with two mummies in it and in a corner a statue standing erect six feet six inches high and beautifully cut out of sycamore wood it is nearly perfect except the nose we found also a number of little images of wood well carved representing symbolical figures some had a lion's head others a fox's others a monkey's one had a land tortoise instead of a head we found a calf with the head of a hippopotamus at each side of this chamber is a smaller one eight feet wide and seven feet long and at the end of it is another chamber ten feet long by seven wide in the chamber on our right hand we found another statue like the first but not perfect no doubt they had been placed one on each side of the sarcophagus holding a lamp or some offering in their hands one hand being stretched out in the proper posture for this and the other hanging down the sarcophagus was covered with hieroglyphics merely painted or outlined it faces southeast by east next day the twelfth the party could not proceed on their voyage the wind being foul on the thirteenth i caused some spots of ground to be dug at gurnu and we succeeded in opening a mummy pit on that day so that the party had the satisfaction of seeing a pit just opened and receiving clear ideas of the manner in which the mummies are found though all tombs are not alike this was a small one and consisted of two rooms painted all over but not in the best style it appeared to me that the tomb belonged to some warrior as there were a great number of men enrolling themselves for soldiers and another writing their names in a book there are also several other figures and so forth in the lower apartment we saw the mummies lying here and there one on another without any regularity to all appearance therefore this pit had been opened by the greeks or some other people to plunder it the same day we visited another mummy pit which i had opened six months before the construction is somewhat similar to what i have just described a portico and a subterraneous cavity where the mummies are here the paintings are beautiful not only for their preservation but for the novelty of their figures there are two harps one with nine strings and the other with fourteen and several other strange representations in particular six dancing girls with fifes tambourines pipes of reeds guitars and so forth on the sixteenth i recommenced my excavations in the valley of biban al-maluk and pointed out the fortunate spot which has paid me for all the trouble i took in my researches i may call this a fortunate day one of the best perhaps of my life i do not mean to say that fortune has made me rich for i do not consider all rich men fortunate but she has given me that satisfaction that extreme pleasure which wealth cannot purchase 
the pleasure of discovering what has been long sought in vain and of presenting the world with a new and perfect monument of egyptian antiquity which can be recorded as superior to any other in point of grandeur style and preservation appearing as if just finished on the day we entered it and what i found in it will show its great superiority to all others not fifteen yards from the last tomb i described i caused the earth to be opened at the foot of a steep hill and under a torrent which when it rains pours a great quantity of water over the very spot i have caused to be dug no one could imagine that the ancient egyptians would make the entrance into such an immense and superb excavation just under a torrent of water but i had strong reasons to suppose that there was a tomb in that place from indications i had observed in my pursuit the fellows who were accustomed to dig were all of opinion that there was nothing in that spot as the situation of this tomb differed from that of any other i continued the work however and the next day the seventeenth in the evening we perceived the part of the rock that was cut and formed the entrance on the eighteenth early in the morning the task was resumed and about noon the workmen reached the entrance which was eighteen feet below the surface of the ground the appearance indicated that the tomb was of the first rate but still i did not expect to find such a one as it really proved to be the fellows advanced till they saw that it was probably a large tomb when they protested they could go no further the tomb was so much choked up with large stones which they could not get out of the passage i descended examined the place pointed out to them where they might dig and in an hour there was room enough for me to enter through a passage that the earth had left under the ceiling of the first corridor which is thirty-six feet two inches long and eight feet eight inches wide and when cleared of the ruins six feet nine inches high i perceived immediately by the painting on the ceiling and by the hieroglyphics in basso relievo which were to be seen where the earth did not reach that this was the entrance into a large and magnificent tomb at the end of this corridor i came to a staircase twenty-three feet long and of the same breadth as the corridor the door at the bottom is twelve feet high from the foot of the staircase i entered another corridor thirty-seven feet three inches long and of the same width and height as the other each side sculptured with hieroglyphics in basso relievo and painted the ceiling also is finely painted and in pretty good preservation see plate two the more i saw the more i was eager to see such being the nature of man but i was checked in my anxiety at this time for at the end of this passage i reached a large pit which intercepted my progress this pit is thirty feet deep and fourteen feet by twelve feet three inches wide the upper part of the pit is adorned with figures from the wall of the passage up to the ceiling the passages from the entrance all the way to this pit have an inclination downward of an angle of eighteen degrees on the opposite side of the pit facing the entrance i perceived a small aperture two feet wide and two feet six inches high and at the bottom of the wall a quantity of rubbish a rope fastened to a piece of wood that was laid across the passage against the projections which form a kind of door appears to have been used by the ancients for descending into the pit and from the small aperture on the opposite side hung another which reached the bottom no doubt for the purpose of ascending we could clearly perceive that the water which entered the passages from the torrents of rain ran into this pit and the wood and rope fastened to it crumbled to dust on touching them at the bottom of the pit were several pieces of wood placed against the side of it so as to assist the person who was to ascend by the rope into the aperture i saw the impossibility of proceeding at the moment mr beechey who that day came from luxor entered the tomb but was also disappointed the next day the nineteenth by means of a long beam we succeeded in sending a man up into the aperture and having contrived to make a bridge of two beams we crossed the pit 
the little aperture we found to be an opening forced through the wall that had entirely closed the entrance which was as large as the corridor the egyptians had closely shut it up plastered the wall over and painted it like the rest of the sides of the pit so that but for the aperture it would have been impossible to suppose that there was any farther proceeding and any one would conclude that the tomb ended with the pit the rope in the inside of the wall did not fall to dust but remained pretty strong the water not having reached it at all and the wood to which it was attached was in good preservation it was owing to this method of keeping the damp out of the inner parts of the tomb that they were so well preserved i observed some cavities at the bottom of the well but found nothing in them nor any communication from the bottom to any other place therefore we could not doubt their being made to receive the waters from the rain which happens occasionally in this mountain the valley is so much raised by the rubbish which the water carries down from the upper parts that the entrance into these tombs is become much lower than the torrents in consequence the water finds its way into the tombs some of which are entirely choked up with earth when we had passed through the little aperture we found ourselves in a beautiful hall twenty seven feet six inches by twenty five feet ten inches in which were four pillars three feet square i shall not give any description of the painting till i have described the whole of the chambers at the end of this room which i call the entrance hall and opposite the aperture is a large door from which three steps lead down into a chamber with two pillars this is twenty eight feet two inches by twenty five feet six inches the pillars are three feet ten inches square i gave it the name of the drawing-room for it is covered with figures which though only outlined are so fine and perfect that you would think they had been drawn only the day before returning into the entrance hall we saw on the left of the aperture a large staircase which descended into a corridor it is thirteen feet four inches long seven and a half wide and has eighteen steps at the bottom we entered a beautiful corridor thirty-six feet six inches by six feet eleven inches we perceived that the paintings became more perfect as we advanced farther into the interior they retained their gloss or a kind of varnish over the colors which had a beautiful effect the figures are painted on a white ground at the end of this corridor we descended ten steps which i call the small stairs into another seventeen feet two inches by ten feet five inches from this we entered a small chamber twenty feet four inches by thirteen feet eight inches to which i gave the name of the room of beauties for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures in basso relievo like all the rest and painted when standing in the centre of this chamber the traveller is surrounded by an assembly of egyptian gods and goddesses proceeding farther we entered a large hall twenty seven feet nine inches by twenty six feet ten inches in this hall are two rows of square pillars three on each side of the entrance forming a line with the corridors at each side of this hall is a small chamber that on the right is ten feet five inches by eight feet eight inches that on the left ten feet five inches by eight feet nine inches and a half this hall i termed the hall of pillars the little room on the right isis room as in it a large cow is painted of which i shall give a description hereafter that on the left the room of mysteries from the mysterious figures it exhibits at the end of this hall we entered a large saloon with an arched roof or ceiling which is separated from the hall of pillars only by a step so that the two may be reckoned one the saloon is thirty-one feet ten inches by twenty-seven feet on the right of the saloon is a small chamber without anything in it roughly cut as if unfinished and without painting on the left we entered a chamber with two square pillars twenty-five feet eight inches by twenty-two feet ten inches this i called the sideboard room as it has a projection of three feet in form of a sideboard all around which was perhaps intended to contain the articles necessary for the funeral ceremony 
the pillars are three feet four inches square and the whole beautifully painted as the rest at the same end of the room and facing the hall of pillars we entered by a large door into another chamber with four pillars one of which is fallen down this chamber is forty-three feet four inches by seventeen feet six inches the pillars three feet seven inches square it is covered with white plaster where the rock did not cut smoothly but there is no painting on it i named it the bull's or apis room as we found the carcass of a bull in it embalmed with asphaltum and also scattered in various places an immense quantity of small wooden figures of mummies six or eight inches long and covered with asphaltum to preserve them there were some other figures of fine earth baked colored blue and strongly varnished on each side of the two little rooms were some wooden statues standing erect four feet high with a circular hollow inside as if to contain a roll of papyrus which i have no doubt they did we found likewise fragments of other statues of wood and of composition but the description of what we found in the centre of the saloon and which i have reserved till this place merits the most particular attention not having its equal in the world and being such as we had no idea could exist it is a sarcophagus of the finest oriental alabaster nine feet five inches long and three feet seven inches wide its thickness is only two inches and it is transparent when a light is placed in the inside of it it is minutely sculptured within and without with several hundred figures which do not exceed two inches in height and represent as i suppose the whole of the funeral procession and ceremonies relating to the deceased united with several emblems and so forth i cannot give an adequate idea of this beautiful and invaluable piece of antiquity and can only say that nothing has been brought into europe from egypt that can be compared with it the cover was not there it had been taken out and broken into several pieces which we found in digging before the first entrance the sarcophagus was over a staircase in the centre of the saloon which communicated with a subterraneous passage leading downwards three hundred feet in length at the end of this passage we found a great quantity of bats dung which choked it up so that we could go no further without digging it was nearly filled up too by the falling in of the upper part one hundred feet from the entrance is a staircase in good preservation but the rock below changes its substance from a beautiful solid calcareous stone becoming a kind of black rotten slate which crumbles into dust only by touching this subterraneous passage proceeds in a southwest direction through the mountain i measured the distance from the entrance and also the rocks above and found that the passage reaches nearly halfway through the mountain to the upper part of the valley i have reason to suppose that this passage was used to come to the tomb by another entrance but this could not be after the death of the person who was buried there for at the bottom of the stairs just under the sarcophagus a wall was built which entirely closed the communication between the tomb and the subterraneous passage some large blocks of stone were placed under the sarcophagus horizontally level with the pavement of the saloon that no one might perceive any stairs or subterranean passage was there the doorway of the sideboard room had been walled up and forced open as we found the stones with which it was shut and the mortar in the jams the staircase of the entrance hall had been walled up also at the bottom and the space filled with rubbish and the floor covered with large blocks of stone so as to deceive any one who should force the fallen wall near the pit and make him suppose that the tomb ended with the entrance hall and the drawing-room i am inclined to believe that whoever forced all these passages must have had some spies with them who were well acquainted with the tomb throughout the tomb faces the northeast, and the direction of the hole runs straight southwest. To give an accurate description of the various representations within this tomb would be a work above my capacity. I shall therefore only endeavor to describe the most remarkable that are to be seen in the various parts of it. 
from these the reader may form some idea of this magnificent excavation end of part fourteen second journey part seven of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain second journey part seven the entrance into the tomb is at the foot of a high hill with a pretty steep ascent the first thing the traveller comes to is a staircase cut out of the rock which descends to the tomb the entrance is by a door of the same height as the first passage i beg my kind reader to observe that all the figures and hieroglyphics of every description are sculptured in basso relievo and painted over except in the outlined chamber which was only prepared for the sculptor this room gives the best ideas that have yet been discovered of the original process of egyptian sculpture the wall was previously made as smooth as possible and where there were flaws in the rocks the vacuum was filled in with cement which when hard was cut along with the rest of the rock where a figure or anything else was required to be formed after the wall was prepared the sculptor appears to have made his first sketches of what was intended to be cut out when the sketches were finished in red lines by the first artist another more skilful corrected the errors if any and his lines were made in black to be distinguished from those which were imperfect when the figures were thus prepared the sculptor proceeded to cut out the stone all round the figure which remained in basso relievo some to the height of half an inch and some much less according to the size of the figure for instance if a figure were as large as life its elevation was generally half an inch if the figures were not more than six inches in length its projection would not exceed the thickness of a dollar or perhaps less the angles of the figures were all smoothly rounded which makes them appear less prominent than they really are the parts of the stone that were to be taken off all around the figure did not extend much farther as the wall is thickly covered with figures and hieroglyphics and i believe there is not a space on those walls more than a foot square without some figure or hieroglyphic the garments and various parts of the limbs were marked by a narrow line not deeper than the thickness of a half crown but so exact that it produced the intended effect when the figures were completed and made smooth by the sculptor they received a coat of whitewash all over this white is so beautiful and clear that our best and whitest paper appeared yellowish when compared with it the painter came next and finished the figure it would seem as if they were unacquainted with any color to imitate the naked parts since red is adopted as a standing color for all that meant flesh there are some exceptions indeed for in certain instances when they intended to represent a fair lady by way of distinguishing her complexion from that of the men they put on a yellow color to represent her flesh yet it cannot be supposed that they did not know how to reduce their red paints to a flesh color for on some occasions where the red flesh is supposed to be seen through a thin veil the tints are nearly of the natural color if we suppose the egyptians to have been of the same hue as their successors the present copts some of whom are nearly as fair as the europeans their garments were generally white and their ornaments formed the most difficult part when the artist had to employ red in the distribution of the four colors in which they were very successful when the figures were finished they appear to have laid on a coat of varnish though it may be questioned whether the varnish were thus applied or incorporated with the color the fact is that nowhere else except in this tomb is the varnish to be observed as no place in egypt can boast of such preservation nor can the true customs of the egyptians be seen anywhere else with greater accuracy with the assistance of mr ricci i have made drawings of all the figures hieroglyphics emblems ornaments and so forth that are to be seen in this tomb and by great perseverance i have taken impressions of everything in wax to accomplish this work has been a laborious task that occupied me more than twelve months 
the drawings show the respective places of the figures so that if a building were erected exactly on the same plan and of the same size the figures might be placed in their situations precisely as in the original and thus produce in europe a tomb in every point equal to that in thebes which i hope to execute if possible immediately within the entrance into the first passage on the left hand are two figures as large as life one of which appears to be the hero entering into the tomb he is received by a deity with a hawk's head on which are the globe and serpent both figures are surrounded by hieroglyphics and farther on near the ground is a crocodile very neatly sculptured the walls on both sides of this passage are covered with hieroglyphics which are separated by lines from the top to the bottom at the distance of five or six inches from one another within these lines the hieroglyphics form their sentences and it is plain to be seen that the egyptians read from the top to the bottom and then recommenced at the top the ceiling of this first passage is painted with the figure of the eagles as in plate two beyond the first passage is a staircase with a niche on each side adorned with curious figures with human bodies and the heads of various animals and so forth at each side of the door at the bottom of the stairs is a female figure kneeling with her hands over a globe above each of these figures is the fox which according to the egyptian custom is always placed to watch the door of sepulchres on the front space over the door are the names of the hero and his son or his father at each side of which is a figure with its wings spread over the names to protect them as is seen in plate three the names are distinguished by being enclosed in two oval niches in that of nikau is a sitting figure known to be a male by the beard he has on his head the usual corn measure and the two feathers on his knees the sickle and the flail over his head is a crescent with the horns upward above which is what is presumed to be a faggot of various pieces of wood bound together and by its side a group twisted in a serpentine form behind the figure are what are thought by some to be two knives by others feathers but as the feathers are of a different form i for my part think they are sacrificing knives which may have served as emblems of the priesthood for we know that the heroes or kings of egypt were initiated into the sacred rites of the gods below the figure is a frame of two lines drawn parallel to each other and connected by similar lines beneath which is the emblem of moving water in the next oval on the right is a sitting female figure with a band round the head fastening a feather and on her knees she holds the keys of the nile above the head is the globe and beneath the figure the form of a tower as it is supposed to represent strength the faces of both figures are painted blue which is the color of the face of the great god of the creation on each of the oval frames there is the globe and feathers and beneath it two hieroglyphics not unlike two overflowing basins as they are under the two protecting figures at each side of the oval frame next is the second passage on the right hand side of which are some funeral processions apparently in the action of taking the sarcophagus down into the tomb the usual boat which carries the male and female figures upon it and in the centre the boat with the head of the ram drawn by a party of men the wall on the left is likewise covered with similar processions among them is the scarabaeus or beetle elevated in the air and supported by two hawks which hold the cords drawn by various figures and many other emblems and symbolical devices the figures on the wall of the well are nearly as large as life they appear to represent several deities some receiving offerings from people of various classes next is the first hall which has four pillars in the centre at each side of which are two figures generally a male and a female deity on the right hand side wall there are three tiers of figures one above the other which is the general system almost all over the tomb in the upper tier are a number of men pulling a chain attached to a standing mummy which is apparently unmoved by their efforts the two beneath consist of funeral processions and a row of mummies lying on frames horizontally on the ground on the left is a military and mysterious procession consisting of a great number of figures all looking toward a man who is much superior to them in size and faces them 
at the end of this procession are three different sorts of people from other nations evidently jews ethiopians and persians behind them are some egyptians without their ornaments as if they were captives rescued and returning to their country followed by a hawk-headed figure i suppose their protecting deity for this procession see plates six seven and eight i have the satisfaction of announcing to the reader that according to dr young's late discovery of a great number of hieroglyphics he found the names of nikao and samethis his son inserted in the drawings i have taken of this tomb it is the first time that hieroglyphics have been explained with such accuracy which proves the doctor's system beyond doubt to be the right key for reading this unknown language and it is to be hoped that he will succeed in completing his arduous and difficult undertaking as it would give to the world the history of one of the most primitive nations of which we are now totally ignorant nikao conquered jerusalem and babylon and his son samethis made war against the ethiopians what can be more clear than the above procession the people of the three nations are distinctly seen the persians the jews and the ethiopians come in followed by some captive egyptians as if returning into their country guarded by a protecting deity the reason why the egyptians must be presumed to have been captives is their being divested of all the ornaments which serve to decorate and distinguish them from one another the jews are clearly distinguished by their physiognomy and complexion the ethiopians by their colour and ornaments and the persians by their well-known dress as they are so often seen in the battles with the egyptians in the front of this hall facing the entrance is one of the finest compositions that ever was made by the egyptians for nothing like it can be seen in any part of egypt it consists of four figures as large as life the god osiris sitting on his throne receiving the homages of a hero who is introduced by a hawk-headed deity behind the throne is a female figure as if in attendance on the great god the whole group is surrounded by hieroglyphics and enclosed in a frame richly adorned with symbolical figures the winged globe is above with the wings spread over all and a line of serpents crowns the whole the figures and paintings are in such perfect preservation that they give the most correct idea of their ornaments and decorations see plate nineteen straightforward is the entrance into another chamber with two pillars the wall of this place is outlined ready for the sculptor to cut out his figures it is here that we may plainly see the manner in which the artist prepared the figure on the wall ready to be cut and it is almost impossible to give a description of the various figures which adorn the walls and pillars of this chamber there are great varieties of symbolical figures of men women and animals apparently intending to represent the different exploits of the hero to whom the tomb is dedicated on getting out of the chamber into the first hall is a staircase which leads into a lower passage the entrance into which is decorated with two figures on each side a male and a female as large as life the female appears to represent isis having as usual the horns and globe on her head she seems ready to receive the hero who is about to enter the regions of immortality the garments of this figure are so well preserved that nothing which has yet been brought before the public can give a more correct idea of egyptian customs the figure of the hero is covered with a veil or transparent linen folded over his shoulder and covering his whole body which gives him a very graceful appearance isis is apparently covered with a net every mesh of which contains some hieroglyphic serving to embellish the dress of the goddess the necklace bracelets belt and other ornaments are so well arranged that they produce the most pleasing effect particularly by the artificial lights all being intended to conduce to this purpose see plate eighteen on the wall to the left on entering the passage is a sitting figure of the size of life it is the hero himself on his throne having the sceptre in his right hand while the left is stretched over an altar on which are twenty divisions as will be seen in plate one a plate in the form of an egyptian temple is hung to his neck by a string it contains an obelisk and two deities one on each side of it 
plates of this kind have been much sought after as they appear to have been the decoration or breastplate of the kings of egypt few have been found and i have seen only two one is in the british museum and the other i was fortunate enough to procure from an arab who discovered it in one of the tombs of the kings in biban al maluk it is of black basalt much larger and superior in workmanship to the other which proves that they were of various sizes and more or less finished it has the scarabaeus or beetle in alto relievo on a small boat with a deity on each side of it and on the reverse is the usual inscription over the head of this figure is the eagle with extended wings as if protecting the king on the upper part of each side of the walls of the passage is the history of the hero divided into several small compartments nearly two feet square containing groups of figures eighteen inches high the hero is to be seen everywhere standing on a heap of corn receiving offerings from his soldiers or companions in war farther on is a small staircase leading into a short passage where the procession still continues and the sacrifice of a bull is to be seen as in plate thirteen the walls of both passages are covered with hieroglyphics in separate divisions from this short passage there is an entrance into another much wider than the rest the charming sight of this place made us give it the name of the room of beauties all the figures are in such perfection that the smallest part of their ornaments can be clearly distinguished the sides of the doors are most beautifully adorned with female deities surrounded with hieroglyphics and the lotus is to be seen both in bud and in full bloom with the serpent on a half globe over it see plate seventeen farther on is the great hall with six pillars containing on each side of it two figures as large as life the walls are adorned with the procession and other symbolical figures over the door on the inside is the figure of a female with extended wings as in plate three at each side of this hall is a small cell that on the left containing various mummies and other figures and that on the right a cow of half the natural size with a number of figures under it which form a very curious group the walls also are covered with hieroglyphics in the large hall close to the door are a number of men carrying a long slender pole at each end of which is a cow's head and on the pole two bulls as in plate fifteen still farther the hall opens into a large vaulted chamber it would be impossible to give any description of the numerous figures which adorn the wall of this place it was here that the body of the king was deposited as i found in its centre the beautiful sarcophagus this is sculptured within and without with small figures in intaglio colored with a dark blue and when a light is put into the inside of it it is quite transparent the ceiling of the vault itself is painted blue with a procession of figures and other groups relating to the zodiac the next is a chamber with a projection like a sideboard it has two square pillars with two figures on every side as represented in plates four and five the walls in every part of this chamber are also beautifully adorned with symbolical figures a specimen of which is given in plate two which represents a compartment over the door within the chamber it is useless to proceed any further in the description of this heavenly place as i can assure the reader he can form but a very faint idea of it from the trifling account my pen is able to give should i be so fortunate however as to succeed in erecting an exact model of this tomb in europe the beholder will acknowledge the impossibility of doing it justice in a description the arabs made such reports of this discovery that it came to the ears of hamad aga of kina and it was reported to him that great treasure was found in it on hearing this he immediately set off with some of his soldiers to thebes generally a journey of two days but such was his speed in travelling that he arrived in the valley of biban al maluk in thirty-six hours by land before his arrival some arabs brought us intelligence that they saw from the top of the mountains a great many turks on horseback entering the valley and coming toward us i could not conceive who they could be as no turks ever came near this place half an hour after they gave us the signal of their approach by firing several guns i thought an armed force was sent to storm the tombs and rocks as no other object could bring the turks there 
at last when this mighty power reached us i found it to be the well-known hamad aga of kina for some time commander of the eastern side of thebes and his followers accordingly i was at a loss to conceive what he wanted there as we were on the west and under another ruler but i suppose in case of a treasure being discovered the first that hears of it seizes it as a matter of privilege he smiled and saluted me very cordially indeed more so than usual i presume for the sake of the treasure i had discovered of which he was in great expectation i caused as many lights to be brought as we could muster and we descended into the tomb what was on the walls of this extraordinary place did not attract his attention in the least all the striking figures and lively paintings were lost on him his views were directed to the treasure alone and his numerous followers were like hounds searching in every hole and corner nothing however being found to satisfy their master or themselves after a long and minute survey the aga at last ordered the soldiers to retire and said to me pray where have you put the treasure what treasure the treasure you found in this place i could not help smiling at his question which confirmed him in his supposition i told him that we had found no treasure there at this he laughed and still continued to entreat that i should show it him i have been told he added by a person to whom i can give credit that you have found in this place a large golden cock filled with diamonds and pearls i must see it where is it i could scarcely keep myself from laughing while i assured him that nothing of the kind had been found there seeming quite disappointed he seated himself before the sarcophagus and i was afraid he would take it into his head that this was the treasure and break it to pieces to see whether it contained any gold for their notions of treasure are confined to gold and jewels at last he gave up the idea of the riches to be expected and rose to go out of the tomb i asked him what he thought of the beautiful figures painted all around he just gave a glance at them quite unconcerned and said this would be a good place for a harem as the women would have something to look at at length though only half persuaded there was no treasure he set off with an appearance of much vexation everything must come round and be told in proper time i shall now introduce what happened previous to this period it will be recollected on my first voyage up to nubia i took possession in the island of philo of sixteen large blocks of stone which formed a fine group of various figures in basso relievo that i had them cut thinner to be taken more easily down the nile and that the boat which was engaged to carry them returned without them as the race had not intended to take the great head on board his boat on our arrival at the island on my second voyage we found these stones had been mutilated and written upon in the french language operation manque the handwriting could not be ascertained as it was done with charcoal but we knew there had been only three french agents there mr caliud mr jacques and the renegado rosignana all in the employ of mr Duetti ignorant which of the three to point out as the perpetrator of this wanton and spiteful mischief we contented ourselves with writing to the consul in cairo and nothing more was said but by this time mr jacques who had parted from the others and was alone came to us and by way of exculpating himself said that caliud was the man who mutilated the figures with his little hammer which he always carried with him to break stones mr caliud was now in cairo and mr beechey wrote to the consul an account of what had passed mr caliud afraid of being turned out of employment assured the consul that he would prove his innocence in the face of mr jacques when he arrived in thebes some time after mr caliud reached thebes with a letter from the consul stating the promise he had made of clearing himself from the imputation of mr jacques concerning the breaking of the stones but instead of confronting mr jacques who was there he contented himself with abusing the english consul for having spoken to him about the business while in cairo and did not choose to meet mr jacques and us or say whether the charge was true or false after abusing the consul who was now five hundred miles distant from him mr caliud meditated more mischief before his departure he became the friend again of mr jacques 
who stated to the consul that all that had been written to him by mr beechey concerning mr caliud was not true and that he never told us anything of the kind on the arrival of the consul at thebes mr jacques was questioned before us whether he had not told us that caliud mutilated the stones in the island of philo he again repeated to the consul before us that Kaliu did break the stones, and being questioned by the consul why he afterwards wrote that such was not the case, said with the greatest sang-froid that he merely contradicted it at the request of Kaliu. One broke the stones, the other first betrayed him, then retracted, and lastly confirmed it again. These were the sorts of honorable messieurs I had to guard against." Twenty days after the tomb was opened, we heard by the boats which came up the Nile that there were three maches, or large boats, coming up with Englishmen on board. And a few days after, Earl Belmore and family, Mr. Salt, the consul, Captain Corey, Dr. Richardson, and the Reverend Mr. Holt, arrived at Thebes. In passing Kina, they went to see Hamad Aga, who told them of the new discovery of the tomb they were delighted when they saw it and as his lordship was anxious to find a tomb i pointed out two likely spots of ground in the valley of biban al maluk but they turned out to be two small mummy pits this proves that small tombs were permitted to be dug out in that valley where it was supposed that none but the tombs of the kings of egypt were to be found and agrees with my former opinion that it was not in this valley alone the tombs of the kings were excavated during his stay his lordship made many researches and was pleased to send down the nile two of the lion-headed statues i discovered in karnak thus with what was found and brought by the arabs he accumulated a vast quantity of fragments which when in europe will form a pretty extensive cabinet of antiquities the consul was so enraptured with the sight of the tomb and i suppose of the sarcophagus that he also began making excavations in the valley of biban al maluk in order to find some more of the depositories of kings he continued his research for months and what he has found he will of course describe himself with more minuteness than i could do lord belmore and his family proceeded to nubia a few days after and i prepared to descend the nile as i had business in cairo such however was the impression made on me by that beautiful tomb that i resolved to return to thebes and form a complete model of it of which i shall speak hereafter the three travellers were now come back from nubia but they passed on without stopping having embarked all that was found this season i left thebes with another accumulation of antiquities of which an account will be found at the end of this volume i shall not describe this voyage as i think it useless to repeat almost the same things over again we arrived at bulak on the twenty first of december after ten months absence my business in cairo detained me longer than i wished as i was anxious to return to thebes for the sole purpose of taking models and impressions in wax of all the figures and hieroglyphics in the newly discovered tomb first called that of apis but now of Samethis. finding i could not immediately dispatch my little business there i sent up the boat with the intention of going myself by land i had engaged signor ricci a young man from italy who was very clever at drawing and who with a little practice became quite perfect in his imitations of the hieroglyphics he was to begin the drawings of the tomb on his arrival at thebes mrs belzoni resolved to visit the holy land and wait for me at jerusalem to which place i intended to go after finishing my model of the tomb my purse was now pretty well exhausted for all my former stock of money was spent and very little remained of the present i received from mr burckhardt and the consul after my first voyage with the colossal head mrs belzoni set out for jerusalem accompanied by james the irish lad and a janizary who went to meet a traveller in syria to escort him to egypt at this time the celebrated and veracious count de forben arrived at cairo i then lodged at the consulate and the count visited the house to see the collection i had just brought down with me as well as what had been brought the year before the count was not a little confounded at the sight of so many valuable things and being director of the french museum they could not fail to be interesting to him
the colossal head the altar with the six deities the colossal arm and the various statues particularly attracted his attention i was then in possession of some statues which i had brought from thebes on my own account according to an understanding with the consul i intended to send them to my native town for which purpose i had arranged for their embarkation at alexandria the count made a proposal to purchase them and being told they were destined for europe immediately he urgently requested that i would dispose of them to him saying he would be under great obligations to me if i would comply with his request i recollected that i might find more and accordingly consented to gratify him what he paid me for them was not one-fourth of their value but i was fully satisfied as i never was a dealer in statues in my life at this time i received several journals from europe and found to my great surprise that all my former discoveries and labors had been published in the names of other people while mine was not even mentioned i must confess i was weak enough to be a little vexed at this for after such exertions as i had made in upper egypt it was not pleasant to see the fruits and the credit of them ascribed to others who had no more to do with them than the governor of siberia except as far as related to supplying me with money thinking all was not right and that people were by some means misinformed i drew up a statement of the facts i gave this account of my operations in egypt to the count de forben in the shape of a letter which he promised to have published in france but it would have been better if i had never entrusted it to him as the use he made of it was quite the reverse of what was intended everything was again thrown into confusion by the french journals who confounded one thing with another so that the public knew but little of the truth from that quarter and some others of the european journals which copied and extracted from them were also misled i had despaired of correcting these misstatements but the many travellers who afterwards visited that country and were impartial spectators wrote to europe an account of what they saw and heard and by these means the real facts in time came out at this period major moore arrived in cairo with dispatches from india and as he could not set off on the same day for alexandria for want of a congier he went with me to visit the pyramids inside and out while on the top of the first pyramid i descanted to him on the various opinions entertained concerning the second and what a pity it was that in an intelligent age like the present it had not been opened so that the interior remained quite unknown on major moore's departure for england he took with him the account of my operations in egypt and some of the plans of the newly discovered places which he faithfully delivered to lord aberdeen president of the society of antiquaries agreeably to my request and this was one source by which the truth began to be known the count de forben made much inquiry about upper egypt and expressed his wish to see that country i know not whether it were my persuasions or his own inclinations but he took the resolution to go up though the whole of his journey from his departure to his return occupied only one month having done so he gave an account of the country the city of thebes its monuments tombs temples colossi scarabi europeans and so forth but he said his enterprising spirit of penetrating into africa failed him when he saw european women walking about luxor a very pretty excuse for a traveller at the time of norden european women could not go about in alexandria as they can now in thebes yet norden continued to make his way as far as deer if the count wanted to signalize himself as a traveller he should not have scorned to enter the extensive sandy ocean of africa merely because he saw a european family walking freely at luxor in egypt if the count look at the map of that unknown country he will find that the civilization of egypt will diminish very little of the glory he seems to wish to acquire by penetrating into africa the count mentions having found a colossal arm in thebes and that i by advice of the british consul had it taken away though it belonged to him such an arm never existed 
but if the count be ashamed to say that he has been in egypt without finding a single piece of antiquity and returned without bringing anything to france except the statues he obtained from me i think he might have been more candid and have confessed that the attraction of a more easy life did not permit him to proceed any farther into africa the count abuses almost every one who comes in his way merely because he did not succeed in making anything of egypt himself but i should not have mentioned his name had he not impelled me to it by the falsehoods inserted against me in his journal one thing more i must observe respecting the count on his return from thebes i met him at cairo in the house of the austrian consul i had begun the task of opening the pyramids and had already discovered the false passage the count requested in a kind of sarcastic manner when i had succeeded in opening the pyramid which no doubt he supposed would be never that i would send him the plan of it as he was about setting off for alexandria the next day and thence to france i thought the best retaliation i could make was to send him the desired plan and i did so as soon as i opened the pyramid which was in a few days after his departure would any one believe that the noble count on his arrival in france gave out that he had succeeded in penetrating the second pyramid of giza and brought the plan of it to paris whether this be the fact or no will appear from the following paragraph taken from a french paper now in my possession on the twenty fourth of april mr le comte de forbin director general of the royal museum of france landed at the lazaretto of marseilles he came last from alexandria and his passage was very stormy he has visited greece syria and upper egypt by a happy chance some days before his departure from cairo he succeeded in penetrating into the second pyramid of giza mr forbin brings the plan of that important discovery as well as much information on the labors of mr Druetti at karnak and on those which mr salt the english consul pursues with the greatest success in the valley of biban al and in the plain of medinet abu the museum of paris is going to be enriched with some of the spoils of thebes which mr forbin has collected in his travels was this written in ridicule of the count de forbin by some person in france or is it an attempt to impose on the public by a tissue of falsehoods end of part fifteen second journey part eight of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain second journey part eight having seen so many erroneous accounts in the journals of europe i thought it my duty to inform the public of the real facts before my departure for thebes i visited the pyramids in company with two other persons from europe on our arrival at these monuments they went into the first pyramid while i took a turn round the second i seated myself in the shade of one of those stones on the east side which formed the part of the temple that stood before the pyramid in that direction my eyes were fixed on that enormous mass which for so many ages has baffled the conjectures of ancient and modern writers herodotus himself was deceived by the egyptian priest when told there were no chambers in it the sight of the wonderful work before me astonished me as much as the total obscurity in which we are of its origin its interior and its construction in an intelligent age like the present one of the greatest wonders of the world stood before us without our knowing even whether it had any cavity in the interior or if it were only one solid mass the various attempts which have been made by numerous travellers to find an entrance into this pyramid and particularly by the great body of french savans were examples so weighty that it seemed a little short of madness to think of renewing the enterprise indeed the late researches made by mr salt himself and by captain cabilia during four months round these pyramids were apparently sufficient to deter any one a short time before this period the few franks who resided in egypt had some idea of obtaining permission from mohammed ali 
and by the help of a subscription which was to be made at the various courts in europe to the amount of at least twenty thousand pounds were to force their way into the centre of this pyramid by explosions or any other means that could be suggested mr drouetti was to have had the superintendence of this work indeed it had created some difference among themselves who was to have had the direction of the whole concern was not this enough to show the difficulties i had to encounter and to make me laugh at myself if any thought of such an attempt should cross my mind besides there was another obstacle to overcome i had to consider that in consequence of what i had the good fortune to do in upper egypt and under the circumstances above mentioned it was not likely that i should obtain permission to make such an attempt for if it could be supposed that there was any possibility of penetrating into the pyramid the operation would certainly be given to people of higher influence than myself with all these thoughts in my mind i arose and by a natural impulsion took my walk toward the south side of the pyramid i examined every part and almost every stone i continued to do so on the west at last i came round to the north here the appearance of things became to my eye somewhat different from that at any of the other sides the constant observations i made on the approach to the tombs at thebes perhaps enabled me to see what other travellers did not indeed i think this ought to be considered as a standing proof that in many cases practice goes farther than theory other travellers had been also in various places where i had been and came often to the same spot where i was but perhaps did not make the observations i did i certainly must beg leave to say that i often observed travellers who confident of their own knowledge let slip opportunities of ascertaining whether they were correct in their notions and if an observation was made to them by any one who had not the good fortune of having received a classical education they scorned to listen to it or replied with a smile if not a laugh of disapprobation without investigating whether the observation were just or not i had often the satisfaction of seeing such travellers mortified by the proof of being wrong in their conjecture i do not mean to say that a man who has had a classical education should think himself under a disadvantage in regard to knowing such things compared with him who has not but that a man who thinks himself well informed on a subject often does not examine it with such precision as another who is less confident in himself i observed on the north side of the pyramid three marks which encouraged me to attempt searching there for the entrance into it still it is to be remarked that the principal signs i discovered there were not deduced solely from the knowledge i had acquired among the tombs of the egyptians at thebes for any traveller will acknowledge that the pyramids have little in common with the tombs either in their exterior appearance or in any shape whatever they are two different things one is formed by a vast accumulation of large blocks of stones the other is entirely hewed out of the solid rock my principal guide i must own was the calculation i made from the first pyramid and such was my assurance on this point that i then almost resolved to make the attempt i had been at the pyramids various times before but never with any intention of examining into the practicability of finding the entrance into them which was deemed almost impossible the case was now different i saw then what i had not seen before i observed that just under the centre of the face of the pyramid the accumulation of materials which had fallen from the coating of it was higher than the entrance could be expected to be if compared with the height of the entrance into the first pyramid measuring from the bases i could not conceive how the discovery of the entrance into the second pyramid could be considered as a matter to be despaired of when no one had ever seen the spot where it must naturally be presumed to exist if there were any entrance at all i further observed that the materials which had fallen exactly in the centre of the front were not so compact as those on the sides and hence concluded that the stones on that spot had been removed after the falling of the coating consequently i perceived the probability of there being an entrance into the pyramid at that spot 
encouraged by these observations i rejoined my companions in the first pyramid we visited the great sphinx and returned to cairo the same evening i resolved to make a closer examination the next day which i did accordingly without communicating my intention to any one as it would have excited great inquiry among the franks at cairo and in all probability i should not have obtained permission to proceed in my design the next day's examination encouraged me in the attempt i was confident that if my purpose had been known to certain persons who had influence at the court of the bashaw i should never succeed in obtaining permission on the following day therefore i crossed the nile to embabe as the cacheff who commanded the province which includes the pyramids resided there i introduced myself to him and acquainted him with my intention to excavate the pyramids if it met his approbation his answer was as i expected that i must apply to the bashaw or to the kakia bey for a firman without which it was not in his power to grant me permission to excavate at the harans or pyramids i asked him whether he had any other objection provided i obtained the firman from the bashaw he replied none whatever i then went to the citadel and as the bashaw was not in cairo i presented myself to the kakia bey who knew me from the time i was at subra and who on my request for permission to excavate at the pyramids had no other objection than that of not being certain whether round the harans there were any ploughed grounds on which he could not grant permission to dig he sent a message to the above Kachef at Embeb, who assured him that round the Harans there was no cultivated land, but that on the contrary it was solid rock. With such an assurance I obtained a firman to the Kachef to furnish me with men to work at the pyramids. My undertaking was of no small importance. It consisted of an attempt to penetrate into one of the great pyramids of Egypt, one of the wonders of the world i was confident that a failure in such an attempt would have drawn on me the laughter of all the world for my presumption in undertaking such a task but at the same time i considered that i might be excused since without attempting we should never accomplish anything however i thought it best to keep my expedition as secret as possible and i communicated it only to mr walmus a worthy levantine merchant of cairo and partner in the house of briggs it is not to be understood that i intended to conceal the attempt i wished to make on the pyramids for the effects of my work would plainly show themselves but being near the capital where many europeans resided i could not prevent myself from being interrupted during my operations and as i knew too well how far the influence and intrigues of my opponents could be carried i was not certain that the permission i had procured might not have been countermanded so as to put an end to all my proceedings accordingly having provided myself with a small tent and some provision that i might not be under the necessity of repairing to cairo i set off for the pyramids my sudden departure from cairo was supposed to be an expedition to the mountain of mokatan for a few days as i had given out at the pyramids i found the arabs willing to work and immediately set about the operation my purse was but light for very little remained of what i received as a present from mr burkhardt and the consul and though it had been a little strengthened by the two statues i lately disposed of to the count de forban who had paid me one-third of the money on account my whole stock did not amount to two hundred pounds and if i did not succeed in penetrating the pyramid before this was exhausted i should have been at a stand before the accomplishment of my undertaking and perhaps prepared the way for others stronger than myself in purse two points principally excited my attention the first was on the north side of the pyramids and the second on the east there is on the latter side part of a portico of the temple which stood before the pyramid and which has a causeway descending straight towards the great sphinx i thought that by opening the ground between the portico and the pyramid i should necessarily come to the foundation of the temple which in fact i did i set eighty arabs to work forty on the above spot and forty in the centre of the north side of the pyramid where i observed the earth not so solid as on the east and west the arabs were paid daily one piaster each which is sixpence english money 
I had also several boys and girls to carry away the earth, to whom I gave only twenty paras, or three pence a day. I contrived to gain their good will by trifles I gave as presents, and by pointing out to them the advantage they would gain if we succeeded in penetrating into the pyramid, as many visitors would come to see it, and they would get bakshis from them. Nothing has so much influence on the mind of an Arab as reasoning with him about his own interest and showing him the right way to benefit himself anything else he seems not to understand and i must confess at the same time that i found this mode of proceeding quite as efficacious in europe the works on each side continued for several days without the smallest appearance of anything on the north side of the pyramid the materials which were to be removed consisted of what had fallen from the coating notwithstanding the appearance of having been removed at a later period than the first were so closely cemented together that the men could scarcely proceed the only instrument they had to work with was a kind of hatchet or spade which being rather thin and only fit to cut the soft ground could not stand much work among stones and mortar which latter i suppose as it fell from the pyramid had been moistened by the dew and gradually formed itself almost into one mass with the stones on the east side of the pyramid we found the lower part of a large temple connected with a portico and reaching within fifty feet of the basis of the pyramid its exterior walls were formed of enormous blocks of stone as may now be seen some of the blocks in the porticos are twenty-four feet high the interior part of this temple was built with calcareous stones of various sizes but many finely cut at the angles and is probably much older than the exterior wall which bears the appearance of as great antiquity as the pyramids in order to find the basis of the pyramid on this side and to ascertain whether there were any communication between it and the temple i had to cut through all the material there accumulated which rose above forty feet feet from the base and consisted of large blocks of stone and mortar from the coating as on the north side at last we reached the basis and i perceived a flat pavement cut out of the solid rock i caused all that was before me to be cut in a right line from the basis of the pyramid to the temple and traced the pavement quite to the back of it so that there was evidently a spacious pavement from the temple to the pyramid and i do not hesitate to declare my opinion that the same pavement goes all round the pyramid it appeared to me that the sphinx the temple and the pyramid were all three erected at the same time as they all appear to be in one line and of equal antiquity on the north side the work advanced towards the basis a great number of large stones had been removed and a great part of the face of the pyramid was uncovered but still there was no appearance of any entrance or the smallest mark to indicate that there ever had been one the arabs had great confidence in the hopes i had excited among them that if any entrance into the pyramid were found i would give great bakshis in addition to the advantage they would derive from other strangers but after many vain expectations and much hard labor in removing huge masses of stone and cutting the mortar which was so hard that their hatchets were nearly all broken they began to flag in their prospect of finding anything and i was about to become an object of ridicule for making the attempt to penetrate a place which appeared to them as well as to more civilized people a mass of solid stone however as long as i paid them they continued their work though with much less zeal my hopes did not forsake me in spite of all the difficulties i saw and the little appearance of making the discovery of an entrance into the pyramid still i observed as we went on with our work that the stones on that spot were not so consolidated as those on the sides of them and this circumstance made me determine to proceed till i should be persuaded that i was wrong in my conjecture at last on the eighteenth of february after sixteen days of fruitless labor one of the arabian workmen perceived a small chink between two stones of the pyramid at this he was greatly rejoiced thinking we had found the entrance so eagerly sought for i perceived the aperture was small 
but I thrust a long palm stick into it upwards of two yards. Encouraged by this circumstance, the Arabs resumed their vigor on the work, and great hopes were entertained among them. Thus it served my purpose, as the work now went on briskly. I was aware that the entrance to the pyramid could not be between two stones in this manner, but I was in hopes that the aperture would furnish some clue by which the right entrance would be discovered. Proceeding farther, I perceived that one of the stones, apparently fixed in the pyramid, was, in fact, loose. I had it removed the same day, and found an opening leading to the interior. This sort of rough entrance was not more than three feet wide, and was choked up with smaller stones and sand, which, being removed, it proved to be much wider within. A second and third day were employed in clearing this place, but the farther we had advanced, the more materials we found. On the fourth day I observed that sand and stones were falling from the upper part of this cavity, which surprised me not a little. At last I found that there was a passage from the outside of the pyramid by a higher aperture, which apparently was thought to have had no communication with any cavity. When all the rubbish was taken out and the place cleared, I continued the work in the lower part beneath our feet, and in two days more we came to an opening inward. Having made it wide enough, I took a candle in my hand, and looking in, perceived a spacious cavity, of which I could not form any conjecture. Having caused the entrance to be cleared of the sand and stones, I found a tolerably spacious place, bending its course towards the center. It is evidently a forced passage, executed by some powerful hand, and appears intended to find a way to the center of the pyramid. Some of the stones, which are of an enormous size, are cut through. Some have been taken out, and others are on the point of falling from their old places for want of support. Incredible must have been the labor in making such a cavity, and it is evident that it was continued farther on towards the center. But the upper part had fallen in and filled up the cavity to such a degree that it was impossible for us to proceed any further than a hundred feet. Half this distance from the entrance is another cavity, which descends forty feet, see plate eleven, in an irregular manner, but still turns towards the center, which no doubt was the point intended by the persons who made the excavation. To introduce many men to work in this place was dangerous, for several of the stones above our heads were on the point of falling. Some were suspended only by their corners, which stuck between other stones, and with the least touch would have fallen and crushed any one that happened to be under them. I set a few men to work, but was soon convinced of the impossibility of advancing any farther in that excavation. In one of the passages below, one of the men narrowly escaped being crushed to pieces. A large block of stone, no less than six feet long and four wide, fell from the top while the man was digging under it. But fortunately it rested on two other stones, one on each side of him higher than himself, as he was sitting at his work. The man was so incarcerated that we had some difficulty in getting him out. Yet, happily, he received no other injury than a slight bruise on his back. The falling of this stone moved many others in this passage. Indeed, they were so situated that I thought it prudent to retreat out of the pyramid, or we might have reason to repent when too late. For the danger was not only from what might fall upon us, but also from what might fall in our way, close up the passage, and thus bury us alive." My expectation in this passage was not great, as I perceived from the beginning it could not be the true entrance into the pyramid, though I had strong hopes that it would lead to some clue for the discovery of the real entrance. But alas, it gave me none, and I remained as ignorant of it as I was before I began. 
having spent so many days at the pyramids without being discovered by any of the people at cairo i did not expect that my retreat could be concealed much longer as there were constantly franks from cairo making a sunday excursion to the pyramids or travellers who of course made it a point to see these wonders on their first arrival at the metropolis in fact the very day i was to have quitted this work i perceived in the afternoon some people on the top of the first pyramid i had no doubt they were europeans as the arabs or turks never go up unless to accompany somebody to gain money they saw a part of my men at work at the second pyramid and concluded that none but europeans could be conducting such an operation they fired a pistol as a signal and i returned another they then descended the angle which led towards us and on their arrival proved to be monsieur l'abbé de forbin who had accompanied his cousin the celebrated count into egypt but did not proceed higher with him were the father superior of the convent of terra santa mr costa an engineer and mr gaspard a vice-consul of france by whom i was introduced to the abbé they all entered into the newly discovered passage but it gave the abbe less pleasure than a cup of coffee which he honoured me by accepting in my humble tent naturally after such a visit all the franks in cairo knew what i was doing and not a day passed without my having some visitors i was determined to proceed still farther with my researches the recent disappointment making me rather more obstinate than i was before i had given a day's rest to the arabs which i dedicated to a closer inspection of the pyramid it often happens that a man is so much engulfed in the pursuit of his views as to be in danger of losing himself if he do not quickly find the means either of an honourable retreat or of attaining the accomplishment of his intended purpose such was my case the success of my discovery of the false passage was considered as a failure i cared little what was thought of it but i was provoked at having been deceived by those marks which led me to the forced passage with the loss of so much time and labour however i did not despair i strictly noticed the situation of the entrance into the first pyramid and plainly saw that it was not in the centre of the pyramid i observed that the passage ran in a straight line from the outside of the pyramid to the east side of the king's chamber and this chamber being nearly in the centre of the pyramid the entrance consequently must be as far from the middle of the face as the distance from the centre of the chamber to the east side of it having made this clear and simple observation i found that if there were any chamber at all in the second pyramid the entrance or passage could not be on the spot where i had excavated which was in the centre but calculating by the passage in the first pyramid the entrance into the second would be near thirty feet to the east satisfied with this calculation i repaired to the second pyramid to examine the mass of rubbish there i was not a little astonished when i perceived the same marks which i had seen on the other spot in the centre about thirty feet distant from where i stood this gave me no little delight and hope returned to cherish my pyramidical brains i observed in the spot also that the stones and mortar were not so compact as on the east side which mark had given me so much encouragement to proceed in the first attempt but what increased my hopes was an observation i made on the exterior of the front where the forced passage is i observed the stones had been removed several feet from the surface of the pyramid which i ascertained by drawing a line with the coating above to the basis below and found the concavity was inclined to be deeper towards the spot where i intended to make my new attempt any traveller who shall hereafter visit the pyramids may plainly perceive this concavity above the true entrance such has been the effect of two different hints first my old guide from thebes i mean the spots where the stony matter is not so compact as the surrounding mass and secondly the concavity of the pyramid over the place where the entrance might have been expected to be found according to the distance of the entrance into the first pyramid from its centre 
i immediately summoned the arabs to work the next day they were pleased at my recommencing the task not in hopes of finding the entrance into the pyramid but for the continuation of the pay they of course were to receive as to expectation that the entrance might be found they had none and i often heard them utter in a low voice the word magroon in plain english madman i pointed out to the arabs the spot where they had to dig and such was my measurement that i was right within two feet in a straight direction as to the entrance into the first passage as will be seen from plates nine and ten and i have the pleasure of reckoning this day as fortunate being that on which i discovered the entrance into the great tomb of semethis at thebes the arabs began their work and the rubbish proved to be as hard as that of the first excavation with this addition that we found larger blocks of stone in our way which had belonged to the pyramid besides the falling of the coating the stones increased in size as we went on a few days after the visit of the abbe de forbin i was surprised by the appearance of another european traveller it was the chevalier frediani who on his return from the second cataract of the nile came to visit the great pyramids i had known him at thebes on his ascending the nile and was much pleased to see him as i thought he might be an impartial spectator of the event of my operations which in fact he was he greatly approved of my undertaking but after being two days with me was ready to take his departure i suppose he had as much expectation that i should open the pyramid as the arabs who named me the magnoon it happened that on the very day he was to set off for cairo i perceived in the excavation a large block of granite inclining downward at the same angle as the passage into the first pyramid and pointing towards the centre i requested the chevalier to stay till the morrow thinking perhaps he might have the pleasure of being one of the first who saw the entrance into the pyramid he consented and i was pleased to have a countryman of my own to be a witness of what passed on this important occasion the discovery of the first granite stone occurred on the twenty eighth of february and on the first of march we uncovered three large blocks of granite two on each side and one on the top all in an inclined direction towards the centre my expectation and hope increased as to all appearance this must prove to be the object of my search i was not mistaken for on the next day the second of march at noon we came at last to the right entrance into the pyramid the arabs whose expectation had also increased at the appearance of the three stones were delighted at having found something new to show to the visitors and get bakshis from them having cleared the front of the three stones the entrance proved to be a passage four feet high three feet six inches wide formed of large blocks of granite which descended towards the centre for a hundred and four feet five inches at an angle of twenty six degrees nearly all this passage was filled up with large stones which had fallen from the upper part and as the passage is inclined downwards they slid on till some larger than the rest stopped the way end of part sixteen second journey part nine of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain second journey part nine i had much ado to have all the stones drawn out of the passage which was filled up to the entrance of the chamber it took the remainder of this day and part of the next to clear it and at last we reached a portcullis at first sight it appeared to be a fixed block of stone which stared me in the face and said ne plus ultra putting an end to all my projects as i thought for it made a close joint with the groove at each side and on the top it seemed as firm as those which formed the passage itself on a close inspection however i perceived that at the bottom it was raised about eight inches from the lower part of the groove which is cut beneath to receive it and i found by this circumstance that the large block before me was no more than a portcullis of granite one foot three inches thick 
having observed a small aperture at the upper part of the portcullis i thrust a long piece of barley straw into it and it entered upwards of three feet which convinced me that there was a vacuum ready to receive the portcullis the raising of it was a work of no small consideration the passage is only four feet high and three feet six inches wide when two men are in it abreast of each other they cannot move and it required several men to raise a piece of granite not less than six feet high five feet wide and one foot three inches thick the levers could not be very long and otherwise there was not space in the four feet height to work with them and if they were short i could not employ men enough to raise the portcullis the only method to be taken was to raise it a little at a time and by putting some stones in the grooves on each side to support the portcullis while changing the fulcrum of the levers it was raised high enough for a man to pass an arab then entered with a candle and returned saying that the place within was very fine i continued to raise the portcullis and at last made the entrance large enough to squeeze myself in and after thirty days exertion i had the pleasure of finding myself in the way to the central chamber of one of the two great pyramids of egypt which have long been the admiration of beholders the chevalier frediani followed me and after passing under the portcullis we entered a passage not higher or wider than the first it is twenty-two feet seven inches long and the works including the portcullis occupy six feet eleven inches in all where the granite work finishes at the end of this passage there is a perpendicular shaft of fifteen feet and at each side of the passage an excavation in the solid rock one of which on the right as you enter runs thirty feet in an upward direction approaching the end of the lower part of the forced passage as will be seen in place nine and ten before us we had a long passage running in a horizontal direction toward the centre we descended the shaft by means of a rope at the bottom of it i perceived another passage running downward at the same angle of twenty-six degrees as that above and toward the north as my first object was the centre of the pyramid i advanced that way and ascended an inclined passage which brought me to a horizontal one that led toward the centre i observed that after we entered within the portcullis the passages were all cut out of solid rock the passage leading toward the centre is five feet eleven inches high and three feet six inches wide as we advanced farther on we found the sides of this passage covered with arborizations of nitre some projecting in ropes some not unlike the skin of a white lamb and others so long as to resemble an endive leaf i reached the door at the centre of a large chamber see plate twelve i walked slowly two or three paces and then stood still to contemplate the place where i was whatever it might be i certainly considered myself at the centre of that pyramid which from time to time immemorial had been the subject of the obscure conjectures of many hundred travellers both ancient and modern my torch formed of a few wax candles gave but a faint light i could however clearly distinguish the principal objects i naturally turned my eyes to the west end of the chamber looking for the sarcophagus which i strongly expected to see in the same situation as that in the first pyramid but i was disappointed when i saw nothing there the chamber has a painted ceiling and many of the stones had been removed from their places evidently by some one in search of treasure on my advancing toward the west end i was agreeably surprised to find that there was a sarcophagus buried on a level with the floor by this time the chevalier frediani had entered also and we took a general survey of the chamber which i found to be forty-six feet three inches long sixteen feet three inches wide and twenty-three feet six inches high it is cut out of the solid rock from the floor to the roof which is composed of large blocks of calcareous stone meeting in the center and forming a roof of the same slope as the pyramid itself the sarcophagus is eight feet long three feet six inches wide and two feet three inches deep on the inside it is surrounded by large blocks of granite apparently to prevent its removal which could not be effected without great labor 
the lid had been broken at the side so that the sarcophagus was half open it is of the finest granite but like the other in the first pyramid there is not one hieroglyphic on it looking at the inside i perceived a great quantity of earth and stones but did not observe the bones among the rubbish till the next day as my attention was principally bent in search of some inscription that would throw light on the subject of this pyramid we examined every part of the walls and observed many scrawls executed with charcoal but in unknown characters and nearly imperceptible they rubbed off into dust at the slightest touch and on the wall at the west end of the chamber i perceived an inscription in arabic as follows readers note here follows two lines of arabic end note and the various interpretations given of it compel me to explain some points which will perhaps lead to a satisfactory explanation it appears to me that all the difficulty lies in the last letters of the inscription which are supposed to be obscure this indeed is the fact but i must say that these letters were so blotted on the wall that they were scarcely visible the transcriber was a copt whom i had brought from cairo for the purpose as i would not trust to my own pen and not being satisfied of his protestations of accuracy though it was copied under my own eyes i invited many other persons who were considered as the best skilled in the arabic language of any in cairo and requested them to compare the copy with the original on the wall they found it perfectly correct except the concluding word which indeed appeared obscure but if it be considered how much that word resembles the right one we shall find a correct sense and the whole inscription made out translation of the inscription by mr salam the master mohammed ahmed lapiside has opened them and the master otman attended this opening and the king alij mohammed at first from the beginning to the closing up i must add that the circumstance of the pyramid having been again closed up agrees with what i have said of my finding it so on several parts of the wall the nitra had formed many beautiful arborizations like those in the passage but much larger and stronger some were six inches long resembling in shape a large endive leap as i mentioned before under one of the blocks that had been removed i found something like the thick part of a hatchet but so rusty that it had lost its shape at the north and south sides were two holes which run in an horizontal direction like those that are seen in the first pyramid but higher up returning out of this chamber we reached the passage below at the bottom of the perpendicular shaft were so many stones as nearly to choke up its entrance and after removing these we found the passage running to the north at the same inclination as above an angle of twenty six degrees as is to be seen in plate ten this passage is forty eight feet six inches in length when it joins an horizontal passage of fifty five feet still running north halfway up this passage on the right is a recess eleven feet long and six feet deep on the left opposite to it is another passage running twenty two feet with a descent of twenty six degrees towards the west before we proceeded any farther toward the north we descended this passage and entered a chamber thirty-two feet long nine feet nine inches wide and eight feet six inches high this chamber contains many small blocks of stone some not more than two feet in length it has a pointed roof like that before mentioned though it is cut out of the solid rock for it is to be understood as i before observed that after we entered through the portcullis all the passages and the large chamber as high as the roof are cut out of the solid rock of calcareous stone on the walls and roof of this chamber are several unknown inscriptions as there are in the upper chamber they are perhaps coptic reascending into the horizontal passage at the end of it we found grooves for a portcullis like the former but the stone of granite which served for this purpose had been taken down and is to be seen under the rubbish and stones near the place passing the portcullis we entered into a passage which ascended in a direction parallel with that above as in plate ten 
This passage runs up 47 feet 6 inches. Here we found a large block of stone, placed there from the upper part, and by calculation I found that this passage ran out of the pyramid at its basis, as from the upper part of this square block I could perceive other stones, which filled up the passage to the entrance, so that this pyramid has two entrances to it. Halfway up the horizontal passage, which leads into the large chamber, is some mason's work, but I believe it to be only the filling up of a natural cavity in the rock. Having made all my observations, we came out of the pyramid with no small degree of satisfaction, and I was highly gratified with the result of my labor of very little more than a month, the expense of which did not amount in all to 150 pounds, though I had accomplished a task which was supposed would have required several thousands. The Chevalier Frediani went to Cairo the same day, and the news of the opening of the pyramid soon brought the Franks to visit its interior. As I had no fear that the Arabian women would break the pyramid, I left the entrance open, pro bono publico, and in that place where the perpendicular descent just inside the portcullis is, I made a stone step for the accommodation of visitors, leaving half of the passage to enter into the lower chamber. A young man of the name of Pieri, employed in the counting-house of Briggs and Walmus in Cairo, came the next day to visit the pyramid, and having rummaged the rubbish inside of the sarcophagus, found a piece of bone, which we supposed to belong to a human skeleton. On searching farther, we found several pieces which, having been sent to London, proved to be the bones of a bull. Some consequential persons, however, who would not scruple to sacrifice a point in history rather than lose a bon mot, thought themselves mighty clever in baptizing the said bones those of a cow, merely to raise a joke so much for their taste for antiquity. It has been stated also that it might be supposed these large sarcophagi were made to contain the bones of bulls, as a sarcophagus which we found in the tombs of the kings at Thebes was of enormous size and more fit for a bull than a human body. I cannot agree in this opinion, however, for if the person who made the observation had an opportunity of seeing and examining the cases and sarcophagi in which the Egyptians were buried, he would find that the better classes of people had cases within cases, some nearly double the size requisite to contain one person, and it is natural, therefore, to suppose that the kings of Egypt had more cases than one or two, consequently the sarcophagus, which was the outer case, must have been much larger than the rest to contain them all. Outside of the pyramid I observed the rock surrounding it on the north and west sides to be on a level with the upper part of the chamber, and as the rock is evidently cut all round, it appeared to me that the stones taken from it must have been applied to the erection of the pyramid. Accordingly, I am of opinion that the stones which seem to form these enormous edifices were not all taken from the east side of the Nile, as is supposed and mentioned by ancient writers. I cannot conceive why the Egyptians should be thought so simple as to fetch stones at seven or eight miles distance and across the Nile, when they could have them from much nearer points. Indeed, from the very spot where the pyramids stand. It is evident that stones of an enormous size have been cut out of the very rocks around the pyramids, and for what purpose were these stones extracted? It might as well be asserted that they were cut to build old Babylon of Egypt, or to fill up the vacancies in the quarries of the Mokatam. If any traveller will go within less than half a mile of the pyramids, particularly on the east and south sides, he may see many places where the rock has been formerly quarried to a great length, and he will find that there is stone enough to build many other pyramids if required. It is true that Herodotus says the stones to erect the pyramids were brought from quarries on the other side of the Nile, but I firmly believe he was misinformed on this subject, unless what he asserts is to be understood of the granite alone. And as to the causeways in front of the pyramids, said to have been made to convey the stones for the erection of these masses, 
i believe they were intended for the accommodation of visitors particularly at the time of high nile for if they were only to convey stones the labor of making them must have been nearly equal to the erection of the pyramids so much has been already said about the pyramids that very little is left to observe respecting them their great appearance of antiquity certainly leads us to suppose that they must have been constructed at an earlier period than any other edifices to be seen in egypt it is somewhat singular that homer does not mention them but this is no proof that they did not exist in his time on the contrary it may be supposed they were so generally known that he thought it useless to speak of them it appears that in the time of herodotus as little was known of the second pyramid as before the late opening with the exception that in his time the second pyramid was nearly in the state in which it was left when closed by the builders who must have covered the entrance with the coating so that it might not be perceived but at the time i was fortunate enough to find my way into it the entrance was concealed by the rubbish of the coating which must have been nearly perfect at the time of herodotus notwithstanding this we were as much in the dark in this present age as he was in his we know however now that it has been opened by some of the rulers or chiefs of egypt a fact that affords no small satisfaction to the inquirer on the subject of these monuments some persons who would rather let this circumstance remain in obscurity regretted that i should have found the inscription on the wall which proved it to have been opened at so late a period as very little more than a thousand years ago but i beg them to recollect that the present opening has not only made known this very interesting circumstance but has thrown much light on the manner in which these enormous masses were erected as well as explained the occasion of them the circumstance of having chambers and a sarcophagus which undoubtedly contained the remains of some great personage so uniform with those in the other pyramid i think leaves very little question but that they were erected as sepulchres and i really wonder that any doubt has ever existed considering what could be learned from the first pyramid which has been so long open this contains a spacious chamber with a sarcophagus the passages are of such dimensions as to admit nothing larger than the sarcophagus they had been closely shut up by large blocks of granite from within evidently to prevent the removal of that relic ancient authors are pretty well agreed in asserting that these monuments were erected to contain the remains of two brothers cheops and sephron kings of egypt they are surrounded by other smaller pyramids intermixed with mausoleums on burial grounds many mummy pits have been continually found there yet with all these proofs it has been asserted that they were erected for many other purposes than the true one and nearly as absurd as that they served for granaries some consider them as built for astronomical purposes but there is nothing in their construction to favor this supposition others maintain that they were meant for the performance of holy ceremonies by the egyptian priests anything in short for the sake of contradiction or to have something new to say finds its advocate if the ancient authors had advanced that they were erected for treasuries the moderns would have agreed perhaps more in conformity with the truth that they were made for sepulchres and they would not have failed to see plainly those circumstances which clearly prove the facts and which are not noticed as they ought to be i will agree with others thus far that the egyptians in erecting these enormous masses did not fail to make their sides due north and south and consequently as they are square due east and west their inclination too is such as to give light to the north side at the time of the solstice but even all this does not prove in the least that they were erected for astronomical purposes though it is to be observed that the egyptians connected astronomy with their religious ceremonies as we found various zodiacs not only among the temples but in their tombs also by the measurement i took of the second pyramid i found it to be as follows the basis six hundred and eighty four feet apotomy or a central line down the front from the top to the basis five hundred and sixty eight feet perpendicular four hundred and fifty six feet 
coating from the top to the place where it ends a hundred and forty feet the circumstance of not finding hieroglyphics in or out of it makes it appear that they were erected before this mode of writing was invented for strange as it may seem not a single hieroglyphic is found in all these enormous masses yet i must beg leave to remark a circumstance which perhaps will lead to the conjecture that it might not have been the custom of the egyptians in that part of the country who might perhaps be even of a different religion from their countrymen to put hieroglyphics on their monuments for there are many mausoleums round the pyramids and some of them very extensive without an hieroglyphic to be seen within or without them and i observed that those which contain chambers with hieroglyphics are evidently of a later date than the former all this would seem to prove that till a certain period subsequent to the building of the pyramids hieroglyphics were not known but what can be said when i assure the reader that in one of these mausoleums which stands on the west of the first pyramid and which is so decayed that it has fallen in and is in a very ruinous state i saw and made others observe some hieroglyphics and figures reversed in one of the blocks which formed that mausoleum and the hieroglyphics so preserved within as if they were to be hidden from the view it certainly must be concluded that this stone had been employed in a building which was adorned with hieroglyphics and consequently proves that they were known previous to the erection of these mausoleums though they were without any of these ornaments or inscriptions this being the case it may be supposed that the people who built the pyramids were of the same way of thinking as those who built the mausoleums consequently nothing can be inferred respecting the age of the pyramids from the circumstance of their not having any hieroglyphics it has been supposed that the first pyramid or that of cheops was not coded i must agree in this opinion for there is not the slightest mark remaining of any coding as to the coding of the second pyramid i had an opportunity of investigating this subject in the excavation i made on the east side of it where i found the lower part as rough as any of the upper below the remaining coating which confirms the account of herodotus in this respect who says that the coating was begun from above and i believe myself that it never was quite finished to the basis for if it had i should have met with some below as the accumulation of rubbish over the basis would have kept the stones in their places or at least enough of them to show there was a coating as was the case in the third pyramid of which i shall have to speak presently it is supposed that the inundations of the nile surrounded the pyramids so that they remained like islands i cannot say that it was not so for the situation of the pyramids is like an island of rocks separated from those on the west only by a valley of sand which might naturally have been accumulated by the wind in the course of so many centuries i think we cannot have a stronger proof of this than the sphinx itself the basis of which is so much below the present surface that if all the sand around the pyramids were on a level with it i have no doubt the nile must have run around them which probably was the case in the early ages having thus finished my operation on the second pyramid i felt a great inclination to have a cursory view of the third i observed that some one had made an attempt to penetrate it by excavations on the east side i commenced my labors on the north side and after removing a great quantity of materials found a considerable accumulation of enormous blocks of granite which had evidently formed the coating proceeding yet lower as i cleared away the rubbish i found that part of the coating still remained in its place down to the bases the removal of these blocks would evidently have brought me to the entrance into the pyramid but it required more money and time than i could spare by this time the consul who was at thebes hearing of the opening of the pyramid wrote to me that he was coming down the nile and at the same time lord belmore and family arrived at cairo it is somewhat singular and i mention it with much satisfaction that his lordship arrived at thebes one month after my discovery of the celebrated tomb of samethis and was the first british traveller who entered it 
on his return from nubia he arrived at cairo a little more than a month after my opening the second pyramid and was the first british traveller who entered this also his lordship and family had been at thebes for some time and had accumulated no small collection of antiquities indeed i esteem it the largest ever made by any occasional traveller dr richardson had taken the opportunity of observing the ruins of ancient thebes at leisure and i believe by his minute remarks he must have made himself well acquainted with many interesting points not yet explained and i have no doubt this account will be highly interesting the earl and family set off for jerusalem by way of the desert and i prepared for my departure for thebes my old residence which i knew better than any other place in egypt a few days later the consul arrived and in half an hour after him colonel fitzclarence with dispatches from india for england the consul mr salt would have been kind enough to have paid all the expenses i had incurred in opening the pyramid but this i positively refused as i thought it would not be fair and right that he should pay for what he had nothing to do with i had the pleasure of accompanying the colonel on a visit to the pyramid as described by himself in his account of his journey from india to england through egypt he had suffered many hardships on his journey but did not appear fatigued in the least his short stay in cairo did not permit me to write a full account of my labours but at night i made a hasty sketch as well as i could and addressed it to the antiquarian society of london which he was kind enough to take to england for me mr salt the consul took the same opportunity of sending an official account of my operations in egypt and nubia to the ministers in england i suppose because he had no opportunity of sending any correct account before that time my next and principal object was to make a small collection on my own account and to take drawings of the tomb of samethis with impressions in wax of all the figures emblems and hieroglyphics the whole of which are in basso relievo noting the colours exactly as in the originals so as to enable me to erect a facsimile in any part of europe this project deserved my serious consideration not only in calculating the time that it would require to complete it but the expense i must incur however though i was only in cairo i did not want means of finding supplies for what i intended to execute and in a few days all was ready for my departure on my third voyage up the nile when having arranged my affairs with the consul i set off for my old habitation among the tombs of thebes end of the second journey end of part seventeen third journey of a narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain in the narrative of this my third journey to thebes i shall not detain the reader with an account of my stopping here or setting off there as it would be no more than a repetition of what has been said before but shall remark only the principal things worthy of notice i made an extraordinary quick voyage from cairo to malawi which place we reached in two days and a half though it occupied eighteen days in our second voyage i stopped two days at mr brine's the sugar baker as it was a calm and in two days more arrived at siout the next morning i went to see the bay that worthy fellow and dear friend to the english he was about a mile out of town exercising his soldiers and young mamelukes in gunnery and horsemanship the cannon exercise was with balls against the rocks and i must say there were better marksmen than i expected to find among soldiers without discipline he fired himself at the same mark with two balls in one barrel of an english gun of which some one in cairo had made him a present he liked it extremely and observed these guns may become offensive to their makers some day or other i told him if ever such a period should arrive the english would still be superior in their weapons as by that time they would have invented some guns of another construction much superior to the most effective of the present day as they are continually studying something new 
i saw he was not pleased with my answer but i said it and would have said it again after the cannon exercise they began to fire at an earthen pot placed on a kind of pedestal of about six feet high they commence their course at two hundred feet from it ride towards it at full gallop at the distance of fifty feet drop the bridle take their gun and fire at the pot while at full speed the horse is so accustomed to this that before he reaches the stand on which the pot is he wheels to the right to make room for the next in the course it is a very difficult matter to hit a small pot about a foot high while the horse is running with all speed in about two hundred shots i saw only six pots broken the favorite mameluke of the bay a lad of twelve years old broke three he had the best horse belonging to the bay and went as near the pot as the length of a gun and a half two other mamelukes broke one each at a good distance and one was broken by the bay himself for which he received of course great praise from all his subjects the gold and silver on the riders gave them quite a theatrical appearance when the exercise was ended the bay seated himself under a tree and was very curious to know the particulars of my opening the pyramid as he had heard of it and desired to see a plan as i was to visit him in the afternoon i promised he should then see one at four o'clock i went to his palace he was sitting on a very high armed chair a fashion not common among turks though he did not sit like an european but in the turkish manner with his legs up here i had an opportunity of being present at a trial upon life or death the case was this a soldier belonging to the bay had been found dead upon the road near the village of Amon, with his throat cut and several marks of violence upon his body. He was on his return from Mecca, where he had been on a pilgrimage. His camel was found dead near the door of a peasant, and it was supposed that he had a great deal of money about him. He was seen in the house of the peasant near which the camel was found, in company with seven other men, among whom was a Bedouin. The soldiers of the village, who took the prisoners into custody, asserted that the prisoners had assisted the Bedouin in making his escape and the sheikh of the same village affirmed that one of them said he knew where to find him at any time several witnesses were examined but no one gave any evidence that could bring the facts home to the supposed culprits one point however was very much against one of them and this was his countenance did not please the bay for no sooner did the bay set his eyes on the poor fellow than he exclaimed ho ho the case is evident i see plainly who is the murderer look at that man can there be any doubt but it was he who committed the crime so own at once that you did it for denial will be useless i see it in your face i must confess i never saw more appearance of the assassin in a countenance in my life but god forbid that our courts of justice should adopt such a method of proceeding and condemn people merely because the expression of their features is against them several witnesses came forward to prove that the peasant in whose house the soldier was could have had nothing to do with it as he was not in the town at the time i have reason to believe that witnesses in that country are rather more exact in their depositions than those of europe for they do not get off so easily as in our country to make them impartial they generally get so severe a bastinado on the soles of their feet that all the flesh is off to the bones and they are unable to walk for a long time after a thousand blows is reckoned a moderate number for a witness to receive the business ended this day with beating and sending to prison again i heard afterwards however that several of those supposed to be concerned in the murder had their heads cut off but for this i have no further authority than my own interpreter after the trial the bey sent to me as if he were desirous of some conversation i took the interpreter with me as the bey will speak no language but the turkish and seated myself on the bench near his chair he began to talk again about the pyramids and wondered we could not tell when they were built he wished to be made acquainted with things but in such a manner that his ignorance might not be perceived asking questions as if he were already informed of what he was most anxious to learn i showed him the plan of the second pyramid 
he understood it immediately as he said taking a general view of it without inquiring into a single circumstance as i knew he passed for an architect among the turks i took a pair of compasses and showed him the scale of english feet by which the plan was made the word scale was mistaken for the italian scala and he asked me where a person mounted with that scale and the interpreter who was as curious as himself asked nearly the same question i could not help smiling and turned the discourse to the forced passage on which he rightly observed that they who made it must have been in search of gold or else they would not have given themselves so much trouble with some similar remarks i quitted him that evening as it was rather late being half an hour after sunset and went to him to take my leave the next morning i had a firman for him to renew and to my surprise he did it without hesitation he seemed to be pleased when he was told that i was going to make a collection for myself for which reason as he said he had given me the firman with full power to dig wherever i pleased right and left of the nile i answered that i felt much obliged to him but that i hoped he would consider what i did for myself would be still for the english party he made no reply to this but i could easily see that he felt a kind of displeasure at my returning to search as connected with the english i wish mr salt had been there incognito as he would have seen the difference of this man when behind his back from what he had been before his face he introduced the little story of the pipe made by kalind and sold as an antique to mr salt laughed much and wondered how a person so full of knowledge could suffer himself to be so easily deceived by a frenchman i told him that any one might well be deceived as we bought many things from the peasants good and bad together in lots without even looking to see what they were till they were brought home consequently this pipe might have been bought in that manner he asked me many curious questions and among them whether i should shave my beard when i returned to europe supposing my answer would be that i should not do any such thing for my beard appeared the finest of all that were before him at that moment even superior to his own i told him to his astonishment that no sooner should i reach the shore of my dear europe than i should rid myself of it as a great burden he saw he had got himself into a scrape by exposing the sanctity of the beard to be despised before so many of his bearded countrymen by asking such questions of a christian and thinking to mend the matter as some of the french told him that in france many wear their beards he said he knew that in france many people wore them but did not know whether it was so in england i replied that neither in france england nor in any part of europe except by a few of the russians were beards ever worn this sort of disrespect for beards did not appear to meet the approbation of the assembly and he was glad to turn the discourse upon horses and so forth having received my firman i left siout the same day and on the next arrived at teta this i recollected was the residence of my old acquaintance solomon kachif of ermentz who played me so many tricks but as in the latter part of his command in that province he became our friend at least in appearance i thought proper to pay him a friendly visit as according to the way of thinking of the turks an injury is not easily forgotten and sometimes revenge is taken when the offender is in disgrace or in misfortune i do not know whether this man were pleased at seeing me in his hut as perhaps he might be mortified at the supposition that i must recollect his prejudice and the trouble he had given me certain however it is that he received me with all the marks of cordiality that can be expected from a turk he gave me to understand that as the deficiency found in his account with the bashaw was nearly made good out of his monthly pay his employ would be soon ended when he should be a free man and could go where he pleased and if the bashaw did not come to good terms with him he would go to a place above ibrim knowing he meant to dongola to the mamelukes i told him that his highness the bashaw was a worthy man and if some friends of his in cairo were to speak to him all would end well 
he said he expected that the french consul would have done something for him from his friendly professions but he was disappointed and added many other things but all of trivial importance at a moment when we remained alone however even without the interpreter he told me in the arabic language that he should be under great obligations to our consul if he would speak to the bashaw in his favour and that he might be assured he would gladly come to an understanding with him as he had made great improvements in the lands from which the bashaw derived considerable advantages but above all as his debt was paid with the kansha our treasury i promised i would do all i could for him and some time after i wrote all the particulars to mr salt acquainting him that if he could succeed in getting this man restored to his situation at ermont's he might depend on having a good friend in the commander of thebes i could scarcely get away from him he sent his horses and soldiers to accompany me to the waterside and on board our conger i found the customary provisions of bread a sheep and so forth proceeding on my voyage the next day at about a league before we reached Ackman, on the fifth of may eighteen eighteen at eight o'clock in the morning i saw the finest eclipse i ever beheld the moon at its full passed completely before the sun the eclipse lasted about three-quarters of an hour i saw the full moon in the centre of the sun which formed a disc or ring the moon appeared to me in the proportion of about half the size of the sun on the tenth of may i arrived at thebes and immediately proceeded to take the drawings of the tombs and impressions as i stated before in the arrangement i had made with mr salt previously to my reascending the nile this time it was agreed that i should make researches on my own account but on my arrival at thebes i found that all the grounds on each side of the nile were taken partly by mr drouetti's agents and partly by mr salt himself who marked the grounds before his return to cairo this last time seeing that there was no chance of making any researches on my own account without incurring the risk of some difference either with the french party or the english i retired to my tomb and devoted my whole time to taking models of it it is somewhat singular and by no means pleasing to my recollection that at this time i was at thebes on my own account and at my own expense yet with less chance of finding anything than a perfect stranger who had never been in that country a stranger might come fix on a spot of ground and take his chance whether good or ill my case was different for if i pointed out any spot in any place whatever one of the parties i mean the agents of mr drouetti or those of mr salt would consider it as a valuable ground and protest that it was taken by them long before i verily believe if i had pointed out one of the sandbanks or the solid rocks they would have said they just intended to have broken into it the next day being however in the midst of thebes a place which was become to me quite familiar and accustomed as i had been to continual researches i could scarcely keep myself from doing something i had already tried on an exhausted ground known to have been originally opened by me so that no one could say it was taken by them but i soon perceived that it was a hopeless attempt to proceed on spots which i considered as exhausted between the memnonian and medinet abu it is well known there are several fragments of enormous statues particularly behind the two colossi i had long before marked the ground and mr duetti first opened near these fragments but finding nothing except broken pieces of lion-headed statues he quitted it some time after mr salt began to excavate in this ground while i was in cairo and found it to be the site of an extensive temple there are pedestals of many columns of very large diameter and in great numbers i counted about thirty but it appears they are not half uncovered and among them mr salt found several colossal fragments of breccia and calcareous stone but all so mutilated that none were worth taking away he proceeded in his work for a long time but left the spot at last i believe as unworthy of farther labour 
on mentioning my wish to proceed in my researches in the same place to mr beechey he informed me that it was reserved for the consul as it had been dug before on his account and under his own inspection but such was my hope of discovering something of importance that i determined to proceed whether for my advantage or that of the consul i accordingly commenced my operations and having observed that the part where the sicos and cella must be was not touched i set the men to work there it was perhaps fortune that would have it so but the fact is that on the very second day of my researches we came to a large statue which proved to be the finest of the kind i had yet found it is a sitting figure of a man in all points resembling the great colossus of memnon on the side of its chair are the same hieroglyphics which are to be seen on the chair of the memnon it is nearly ten feet high and of the most beautiful egyptian workmanship the stone is gray granite and has the peculiarity of having particles in it of a color not unlike that of the substance generally known by the name of dutch metal this and a lion-headed statue are the only ones of the kind i ever saw part of its chin and beard have been knocked off but all the rest is quite perfect in the same ground i found several lion-headed statues like those i found in karnak some sitting and some standing i know not what to say about this temple as i do not pretend to give an absolute decision on any subject but as every one may have an opinion of his own i shall venture to make a few remarks or rather put some questions why may not this be deemed the great temple of memnon with as much or perhaps more reason than what is now named the memnonium it is to be observed that the name was given to those ruins on the supposition that the great colossal statue now lying on the ground within the space included was that of memnon but now when every one agrees that the statue of memnon cannot be any other than that which is to the north of the two in the plain between medinet abu and the memnonium i think that the temple which stood in a direct line with these colossi might with more probability be named the memnonium that the northernmost statue of the two in the plain of gornu was that from which the sound proceeded i believe is beyond doubt from the combination of numerous circumstances but in particular from the testimony of the many visitors who have verified it by their inscriptions on its leg if the said statue were intended to represent the great memnon i think the temple with which it was connected was the memnonium the magnificence of this edifice has never been described because it never was seen or known to exist between the two colossal statues and the portico of the temple is an enormous colossus thrown down and buried all but the back of its chair which is broken in two about the middle i cannot conceive how this colossus escaped the notice of travellers it was one of my principal objects to uncover it but i never had an opportunity i have no doubt some interesting points may be solved and perhaps pieces of antiquity may be found in it and i hope this opinion of mine will induce some of the travellers or other antiquaries in egypt to excavate the interesting spot round the colossus among the columns of the portico were found a great many fragments of colossal statues of granite brescia and calcareous stones and from the great number of fragments of smaller dimensions and of standing and sitting lion-headed statues i can boldly state that these ruins appear to me to have belonged to the most magnificent temple of any on the west side of thebes it is my humble opinion that the entrance into this temple was guarded by the two colossi one of which is supposed to have represented the great memnon and that on advancing farther there were other colossal statues in inner courts the fragments of which are still to be seen as i have just mentioned in a line with the temple and the two colossi in the front of the portico are other colossi of smaller size which appear as if adorning the entrance into it the whole combined induces me to think that an extensive temple stood on this ground 
to explore it would require an excavation of no small extent but i believe it well worth attention and i am persuaded it would not prove a disadvantageous speculation to the adventurer the base of the above columns stood much higher than the bases of the two colossi consequently there must be an ascent from the colossi to the temple if we take as an example the temple called the memnonium we shall find the same to be the case and that the ascent into the temple was by steps on my removing the colossal statue from the ruins last mentioned i found that the pavement of the place where it lay was much lower than the interior of the temple whence we may conclude that the former temple was erected on the same principle and if it were so the front of this temple is not uncovered and i do not hesitate to say that some interesting pieces of antiquity might be found there besides perhaps giving farther elucidation of the real seat of memnon it is also to be observed that the regular inundation of the nile over that very ground has raised the soil to such a height that it discourages a traveller from making researches but without perseverance nothing can be effected my occupation at the tomb did not permit me to advance farther in these researches and i quitted them with the intention of recommencing when i should have had an interview with mr salt for as he had marked all this ground to be kept for his own excavation i did not wish to encroach on his theban territory the works at the tomb went on uncommonly well by this time i had taken many impressions of the principal figures in basso relievo to my entire satisfaction the wax alone i found would not stand as the climate did not permit it but with wax resin and fine dust i made an excellent composition the greatest difficulty was to take the impression of the figure without injuring the colours of it the figures as large as life i found to be in all a hundred and eighty-two those of a smaller size from one to three feet i did not count but they cannot be less than eight hundred the hieroglyphics in this tomb are nearly five hundred of which i took a faithful copy with their colours but they are of four different sizes from one to six inches so that i have been obliged to take one of each size which makes nearly two thousand in all some wax i procured in the small towns of the country but in such small quantities that i was obliged to send down the nile to kenna farshiuk and girge at the latter end of june we had a visit from mr briggs on his return from india he brought with him from that country the pineapple and the mango some of which he had planted in the garden of the aga at kina and some he tried to cultivate at thebes the mango at kina i believe turned out very well but those which were planted in thebes died i imagine from want of care as we had no gardener by this time i had ceased all sort of researches as i could not dig on the grounds i wished i contented myself with collecting what the peasants of gournou used to bring to me and i must say that in consequence of having so many acquaintances among these mummy plunderers i have been able to make a little collection of my own in which i can boast of having a few good articles particularly in manuscript and so forth during this time i attempted to make an excavation among the ruins of the temple at ermont's but i was soon convinced it would be to no purpose and withdrew this temple is very interesting for it differs from almost every other in its plan and construction the drawing plate thirty seven is as correct a representation as i could take of it on the back of this temple is the figure of the camelopard which is of such very rare occurrence among the hieroglyphics that this and that which i mentioned in the sequels of the memnonium are the only instances i can point out in egypt motive of my journey to the red sea some time prior to this the bashaw of egypt was informed by two copts who landed on the coast of the red sea from arabia that they had seen some sulphur mines in the mountains near that shore several days a journey above corsir on the report of these two men the bashaw sent an order to the cacheff of esne to enter the desert in search of these mines 
he set off with an escort of soldiers and sixty camels to load with sulphur but on their arrival they found only several pieces scattered about here and there and having collected them all they were not sufficient to load twenty camels among the soldiers of that escort was one of the mameluke renegados who stated that he saw several mines and temples on the road to the coast of the red sea this little success did not discourage mohammed ali who was always ready to persevere in any enterprise he was advised to send some europeans to examine these places and see whether it were worth while to proceed in the discovery of sulphur mr drouetti recommended to the bashaw mr caliud a silversmith who had been employed by him some time in the collection of antiquities mr caliud set off for that place accompanied by an escort of soldiers and miners from syria and found the mines as sterile as they had been described but on his return he did not fail to visit the emerald mountains according to the instructions he received from mr duetti who evidently had seen the work of bruce where he mentions having visited these mines on his arrival at the place mr caliud found several caves or mines which had been evidently left by the ancients and probably had never been touched by any one since from the exterior of some of them he collected several pieces of the matrix of the emeralds and when these were produced to the bashaw they were deemed sufficient to prove that there were mines in the country and to persuade mohammed ali to pursue his researches mr caliud in his pursuit of mines in this country happened to reach sekel minor situated in a valley a few hundred miles from the mountains of zabara and about twenty-five from the sea see plate thirty five it is a valley surrounded by high rocks on each side of the rocks at some little distance are the remains of a few very small houses built of rough stones and all except one or two without mortar the rocks of this place resemble an amphitheatre in form not more than two hundred and fifty yards in length the upper part of the rocks contain several mines of the ancients and at one side there is a small chapel cut out of the rock thirty feet deep and less than twenty wide see plate thirty three number six and seven the houses in all as we counted them on our visiting that place are eighty seven one of which can be considered as the residence of a person distinguished from the rest i do not know how it happened but it appears that the enthusiasm with which m caliud gave the account of this place seemed to impress on the minds of the antiquaries in egypt the notion that it must have been the ancient berenice especially when he reported it to have eight hundred houses and several temples and seemed to him in appearance like the ruins of pompeii and so forth he asserted also that it was near the coast and that the communication with the sea was quite easy at the same time he produced a greek inscription which he also found on the top of a niche we copied it with the greatest care and it will be inserted hereafter this was quite enough the ancient berenice had at last been visited and it was known where it was indeed in a few points it did not quite agree with the situation described by the ancients but these obstacles were soon removed for i saw a modern geographer a man of classical education and a great traveller take the pen in his hand and in order to make the newly discovered berenice fall on the spot where it ought to be and accord with the description of the ancient geographer scratch out a large cape that encumbered him being on the south of the supposed berenice and with the same coolness as if it had been a piece at draught or chess place it on the north affirming that the bay was erroneously laid down by the ancient geographers who made the chart of the red sea in the description of the mines mr caliud was pretty correct but it would have been more to his credit if he had contented himself with an exact account of the new berenice as it was named in consequence of all these reports mohammed ali engaged a mohammedan aga a syrian miner and with two hundred men set off accompanied by mr caliud to show him where he found the ancient mines some time after mr caliud finding that the mines would not be so productive as it was expected quitted the place and returned to egypt leaving the syrian miner to look out for the emeralds 
from the time of these reports i conceived the idea of making an excursion into these deserts on a visit to the new berenice and only waited the opportunity of a proper time to execute my intended journey it happened that near the end of september one of the miners who was sent from the mountains to the nile for provision had to come down from edfu to esne and was returning to the desert when he fell sick hearing from some of the arabs that a christian physician was at biban al maluk he came to beg the doctors would prescribe something to cure him of course i had good and clear information of all i wished from this man who promised to show me the way through the desert if i wished to go i made up my mind at once and set about preparing for my departure having communicated my intentions to mr beechey he resolved to go also and as the doctor would have been useful in drawing i proposed that he should accompany us at this time we had a large boat loaded with antiquities of various kinds among which i embarked the fine colossal statue i had discovered in the ruins of the temple which i should name the memnonium the boat being ready a servant of mr duetti requested mr beechey to be permitted to take his passage on board to cairo which was of course granted the boat set off by the information i received from the miner it appeared to me clear that the place could not agree with the description given of its situation by herodotus and pliny and that the direction of the road monsieur caliud had taken could not bring him so far south as the town of berenice was marked by the geographer d'anville who i had reason to believe was correct having found him so on other occasions at last two days after the boat set off for cairo we hired a smaller one from luxor to take us up to edfu where we were to enter the desert we embarked near the temple of gurnu as the water reached quite to that place End of part eighteen journey to the red sea part one of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain accordingly we set sail on the sixteenth of september eighteen eighteen our company consisted of mr beechey the doctor and myself two greek servants the miner and two boys from gurnu whom we hired to take care of our luggage in the desert it so happened that we were to witness one of the greatest calamities that have occurred in egypt in the recollection of any one living the nile rose this season three feet and a half above the highest mark left by the former inundation with uncommon rapidity and carried off several villages and some hundreds of their inhabitants i never saw any picture that would give a more correct idea of a deluge than the valley of the nile in this season the arabs had expected an extraordinary inundation this year in consequence of the scarcity of water the preceding season but they did not apprehend it would rise to such a height they generally erect fences of earth and reeds around their villages to keep the water from their houses but the force of this inundation baffled all their efforts their cottages being built of earth could not stand one instant against the current and no sooner did the water reach them than it levelled them with the ground the rapid stream carried off all that was before it men women children cattle corn everything was washed away in an instant and left the place where the village stood without anything to indicate that there had ever been a house on the spot it is not the case as is generally supposed that all the villages of egypt are raised so high above the general level of the ground that the water cannot reach them on the contrary most of those in upper egypt are little if anything higher than the rest of the ground and the only way they have to keep off the water on the rise of the nile is by artificial fences made of earth and reeds it appeared to me to be in the midst of a vast lake containing various islands and magnificent edifices on our right we had the high rocks and the temples of gournou the memnonian the extensive buildings of medinet abu and the two colossal statues which rose out of the water like the lighthouses on some of the coasts of europe 
on our left we had the vast ruins of karnak and luxor to the east of which at a distance of eight miles ran the mokatam chain of mountains forming the boundaries of this vast lake as it appeared from our boat the first village we came to was Agalta, whither we went not merely to see the place, but to desire the Kanakan to send a soldier to guard the tombs, in addition to the Arabs, and some of our people whom we had left there. I thought this necessary, notwithstanding the strong door I had caused to be made at its entrance. He appeared immediately on our approaching the village, and greatly lamented his situation, as he expected to be washed away by the Nile. There was no boat in the village, and should the water break down their weak fences, the only chance of escape was by climbing the palm trees, till Providence sent someone to their relief all the boats were employed in carrying away the corn from villages that were in danger both in upper and lower egypt the men women and children are left to be the last assisted as their lives are not so valuable as corn which brings money to the bashaw as this village was then four feet below the water the poor fellows were on the watch day and night round their fences they employed their skin machines or bags to throw the water out again which rose from under the ground but if their fences should be broken down all was lost we offered to take the kamaikan with us in our boat but he could not quit the place which he was ordered to guard when we left this village there was but little wind so we did not proceed much farther and in the evening made fast our boat to some high ground between agalta and ermitz on the seventeenth we saw several villages in great danger of being destroyed the rapid stream had carried away the fences and their unfortunate inhabitants were obliged to escape to higher grounds where it was possible with what they could save from the water the distress of these people was great some of them had only a few feet of land and the water was to rise twelve days more and after that to remain twelve days at its height according to the usual term of the inundation fortunate was he who could reach a high ground some crossed the water on pieces of wood some on buffaloes or cows and others with reeds tied up in large bundles the small spots of high ground that stood above the water formed so many sanctuaries for these poor refugees and were crowded with people and beasts see plate twenty six the scanty stock of provision they could save was the only subsistence they could expect in some parts the water had left scarcely any dry ground and no relief could be hoped till four and twenty days had elapsed the kachefs and kamaikans of the country did all they could to assist the villages with their little boats but they were so small in proportion to what was wanted that they could not relieve the greater part of the unfortunate people it was distressing to behold these poor wretches in such a situation to approach them in our little boat would have been dangerous both to them and to us for so many would enter it at once that the boat would sink and we along with them to increase the number on our arrival at ermitz where fortunately the land is very high we found many of the neighboring people collected we landed immediately and employed our boat to fetch the people from an opposite village the kamaikan set off himself with another boat and in the course of an hour he returned with several men and boys he sent the boats again and they returned loaded with men corn and cattle the third trip brought still more corn buffalo sheep goats asses and dogs i remarked that there were no women in that village but we were soon convinced of the regard paid to the fair sex in that country the fourth voyage was employed in fetching over the women as the last and most insignificant of their property whose loss would have been less regretted than that of the cattle i hope this circumstance will convince the european fair sex of our superiority over the turks and arabs at least in point of due respect to them these people say that women have no souls and indeed by the brutal manner in which they are treated we cannot expect such poor creatures to have any on the eighteenth we arrived in esne khalil bey was gone to cairo to take the command of the province of benesouf and ibrahim bey was now governor of esne 
he received us with uncommon civility and furnished us with a firman to the cachep who commanded the province of edfu on our return on board we found some bread greens and a sheep sent by the bay for which we returned a fine english gun and some powder at our desire he sent us a soldier to accompany us wherever we went but he gave strict orders that we should not take any of the emeralds from the mines for though he was the most civilized turk i ever knew he could not help supposing that we did not go into these deserts merely to see the mountains and the sand he imagined that if we came where the mines were we should naturally help ourselves to emeralds which he thought would be worthy our notice we set off on the next day and arrived at the island of Huvesek before Edfu. It was rather late in the evening, and on our approach to the fences which surrounded the village, to keep off the water, we alarmed the fellows so much that they all came to the spot where we were, made us proceed up to a place where there was no danger of injuring the fence, and kept strict watch over us all night. They were certainly right for if our boat had struck against the fence it would have inevitably made a breach and of course inundated the village and the rest of the land on the twenty first in the morning we all went to the cacheff who did what he could to procure us everything necessary he sent for the sheikh of the tribe that inhabited the deserts we had to pass his name was abada and he was a hostage for the security of the people that worked at the mines near the red sea we made our arrangements about the camels and drivers and found the terms very reasonable for we paid only one piaster a day for every camel and twenty paras for every man out of which they were to provide food both for themselves and their beasts it was agreed that we should keep the camels as long as we pleased and go wherever we thought proper we crossed part of the island with the boat as there were four feet water above the banks and went on shore on the east side of the main land on our arrival we met with mohammed aga the chief of the miners who had just arrived from the emerald mountains and was repairing to esne he seemed to be much concerned at our going thither and would fain have persuaded us to wait till he returned that he might accompany us as no one could go to the place without him we told him not to be alarmed for we were not in search of precious stones but of antiquities this did not appear to satisfy him and he said he would soon be back again we remained the rest of the day waiting until the drivers prepared bread for their journey in the morning of the twenty-second there was no appearance of departure i had observed a sudden change in the sheikh since he saw the chief miner and began to suppose that his influence still prevailed on the sheikh to detain us at least as much as he could the miner himself had proposed that we should wait at the ruins of a temple about two days on our journey till his return to which proposal of course we did not agree i saw clearly he was not a little alarmed at our going for fear we should make some discovery among the minerals and all our assertions to the contrary had little effect we insisted on setting off that day and we did so the same evening our party was increased by the soldier from esne four camel drivers and a sheikh to guide us making in all twelve men we had sixteen camels six of which were laden with provisions water culinary utensils and so forth we halted at the foot of a hill three hours distance in the morning of the twenty third we set off very early and arrived at the first well in three hours here the camel drivers informed us that we could not advance till sheikh ibrahim joined us as he had to bring us more food for the camels we had been waiting the whole day with impatience but without seeing anybody the valley we entered afforded a good level road till we came to the foot of the mountain about fifteen miles from the nile we were seated under a dry sunt tree at a little distance from a small well hot winds that raised the sand blew the whole day several of the ababde came to water their cattle at the well but kept at a distance from us 
they live scattered about in the rocks and little valleys among the mountains but occasionally assemble together in a few minutes to pass this place without a good understanding with their shake for security would be imprudent and dangerous finding that the guide did not arrive in the evening we sent one of the drivers to the sheik requesting him to send the man immediately otherwise if he were not with us at sunrise we should return and complain to the kachef at length on the next morning the twenty fourth he appeared and we set off pretty early the valley we now entered afforded a very level and good road there are in it several sunt and sycamore trees and in various places the thorny plant called basila represented in plate thirty six this is the plant on which the camels feed it is of a green colour at a certain season of the year i believe in the spring but it soon becomes dry and of course of a straw colour it bears a small fruit of the size of a pea but hollow inside the stalk is of a similar substance with that of rushes and it never grows higher than three feet as we advanced the valley became narrow and the trees thicker in some places but they gradually diminished and at last we entirely lost them on the right of the valley as we went up i observed the remains of a settlement which i considered as a station for the ancient caravans from the nile to berenice of which we afterwards found many others on the road placed at proper distances for the caravans to halt at night at some of them it is evident that there were wells of good water but they are now quite filled up advancing farther the mountains approach till the valley becomes little else than a wide road and after passing a narrow and high defile we entered an open plain here the mountains on the right run towards the south and after a long circuit return to form a valley with those on the left at the entrance of this valley stands a high rock on the left of which is a small egyptian temple to this we now directed our course and arrived at it six hours after setting off from the well in the morning on our approaching it we were not a little pleased at the sight it is of small magnitude as will be seen in plate twenty the plan of it is given in plate thirty three number three the portico which is built projecting from the rock has four columns two in front and two in the centre it is adorned with egyptian figures in intaglio reliviato and some retain their colour pretty well they are as large as life and not of the worst execution in the secos which is cut out of the rock are four pilasters at the end of it are three small chambers and there are two others one at each side in the corners of the lateral walls on which are to be seen figures and hieroglyphics in a pretty good style on one of the columns we observed a greek inscription which i did not copy as mr beechey took the trouble himself i made the drawing of the exterior view of the temple stone by stone the two front columns are joined to the sides of the portico by a wall nearly two-thirds of their height near the temple are the remains of an enclosure which no doubt was a station for the caravans but it is totally different from any other that we met with on that road as far as berenice it consists of a wall the form and extent of which may be seen in plate thirty three number four it was built by the greeks is twelve feet high and contained several houses within it for the accommodation of travellers in the centre was a well which is now filled up with sand all round the well there is a platform or gallery raised six feet high on which a guard of soldiers might walk all round on the upper part of the wall are holes for discharging arrows similar to those we see formed in our ancient buildings for the same purpose the sides of the gateways are built of calcareous stones and the wall is of bricks by this time i was convinced that this must have been a road to some place of consequence as it was obvious that there was a frequent passage of caravans this way the place is named wadi el mia the fort i think might have been built by some of the ptolemies to protect the caravans at the time when the trade with india by way of berenice and the red sea flourished at three o'clock in the morning of the twenty-fifth we continued our journey 
no vegetation of any sort was to be seen anywhere sometimes we passed over wide and level plains and sometimes crossed rugged hills till two hours before sunset when we entered the valley called bizak by the arabs this valley runs from south to north and has several sunt trees scattered about in it and the usual thorn here we halted for the night and while our cook prepared our supper mr beechey and i went to see a granite rock at some distance as the abade had informed us that there was a magical stone there we entered the valley toward the north and observed that it must have been an ancient road as the usual marks of camel's feet were clearly impressed on the ground there is seldom any sand on these roads on the contrary they are covered with small pebbles and where the passage of camels was frequent they formed a strong impression which is to be seen to this day and may be traced to great length through these valleys till they reach the sandy country when we arrived at the rock we found it to be of fine granite in very large masses on one side of it are several figures cut on the stone which cannot be taken for any other than imitations of the egyptian they are meanly scrawled without shape or form but united with the circumstance of the camel's paths they are sufficient to indicate that the valley was a high road which by the direction it takes must have been that from coptos to berenice so well described by d'anville at this place mr ricci the doctor was attacked with a violent disorder and it was decided that he should return the next morning as it would increase if he advanced farther in the desert on the twenty sixth in the morning our caravan was divided into three different detachments we sent the luggage and provision on the way toward the east which we intended to take the doctor returned toward the nile on the west mr beechey and myself went in a south-east direction to see something that the abade had mentioned though we could not make out what they meant we entered a sandy valley with rocks on each side nearly perpendicular of white and calcareous grit stone with some veins of white marble intermixed after some hours march we reached a place named samont here we found the remains of an ancient settlement or station which appears by its situation to have been on the road from berenice to coptos it has several pieces of walls which are the only remains and evidently a well in the centre see plate thirty three number five the walls are built of rough stones without mortar we took the road to the east through several beautiful and romantic valleys if so they may be called the soil was sandy and stony but there are thorny plants to feed cattle and so many soot trees as to form a complete forest in some parts the rocks on each side are of diverse colours exhibiting the most beautiful and solitary scenes one who wishes to retire from the world might find a charming retreat in these wilds were it not for the want of water and all that is necessary to the subsistence of human life beside the intense heat of the sun which on calm days is so great in these valleys as to be almost insupportable advancing onward in three hours we reached a summit whence we saw at some distance what appeared to be the walls of a large and extensive town surrounded by high rocks as if by a fortification on our approach we saw it was an extensive sandy plain with several granite eminences the rocks rose at some distance from each other and appeared like so many little islands if the sand had been water i could not have distinguished this spot from the centre of the cataract i mean from above syene to the island of philo this place seemed to me as if it were passing the cataract with the difference only that i had a camel instead of a boat and the granite appeared to be of a finer quality than that of the cataract approaching to porphyry if the ancients did not make any use of it it was no doubt in consequence of the difficulty of conveying it to the nile from this place we travelled to the left toward the valley where it was intended we should halt our caravan had reached the place an hour before us though we proceeded very fast on our march here we found two wells one of salt water and the other quite putrid and brackish there are few waters in the world better than that of the nile and now to have to drink the worst was such a change in one day that we could not help feeling the consequences of it 
Mr. Beachy was taken very ill from drinking at the first well, and we had great apprehension of the next, which was worse. We had provision for a month, but our fresh meat was gone, and it was with difficulty we could procure a very lean goat. The tribe of this country are all Abade, and extend from the confines of Suez to the tribe of Bijarine, on the coast of the Red Sea, below the latitude of twenty-three degrees. The manners of this race show them to be lovers of freedom. They prefer living among these solitary rocks and deserts, where they eat nothing but dura and drink water, before submission to the command of any government on earth it is a great feast among them when they take the resolution of killing a lean goat but they eat it without fearing that any rapacious hands should take it from them a man of this stamp accustomed to liberty and independence would naturally find himself as in a prison if under the control of even the best of governments their greatest care is for their camels which are their support they breed them up to a certain growth, and then send them to be exchanged for dura, which constitutes their food. The camels, as well as other animals, live upon the common thorn plant, which is the most abundant to be found in the country. Some of the most industrious of the Abade cut wood and make charcoal with it, which they send to the Nile on camels, and barter it for dura, tallow, and tent cloth few however undergo such a labour for they like to live at their ease a pipe of tobacco is a luxury and a piece of a fat ram quite raw a great dainty they are all nearly naked badly made and of small stature they have fine eyes in particular the women as far as we could see of those that came to the wells the married women are covered the rest uncovered their headdresses are very curious some are proud of having hair long enough to reach below their ears and there formed into curls which are so entangled that it would be impossible to pass a comb through them therefore the women never use such an instrument when they kill a sheep that has any fat which is very seldom they grease their heads all over and leave the fat in small pieces to be melted by the sun which makes them appear as if they had powder on their heads and this lasts for several days till the sun melts the whole and produces an exquisite odour for those who have a good nose as their hair is very crispy their heads remain dressed for a long time and that they may not derange their coiffure when their heads itch they have a piece of wood something like a packing needle with which they scratch themselves with great ease without disordering their headdress of which they are very proud their complexions are naturally of a dark chocolate their hair quite black their teeth fine and white protuberant and very large the spot where the well at which we halted is situated is an amphitheatre of rocks with trees in the centre in the winter all the scattered ababde in the mountains assemble themselves here and if any marriage takes place it is at this time it is always performed with due ceremony the lover first sends a camel to the father of the girl if this be accepted he applies personally to herself in the presence of one man as a witness if she consent the day of marriage is appointed before which the lover does not see his bride for seven days on the eighth she is presented to him in the tent of her father this day is celebrated by killing some of their lean sheep and by camel races the next day the happy couple retire to the tent of the bridegroom if the man becomes tired of his wife he sends her back with the same camel which he sent to her father as this is her own from the time of the marriage the mother of the bride must not speak a word to the bridegroom as long as she lives a regulation intended to prevent her from making mischief between the young couple and which might perhaps be adopted with advantage in some countries of europe it was now three years since they had had any rain whence there was a scarcity of thorns which was the cause as they said that their sheep were so meagre to make some arrangements for our proceeding and to purchase some sheep we were obliged to stop all this day at the well having contrived to boil a quantity of the water it became a little sweeter and we were told that the water of the next well was not so good as this 
the nile water we brought with us became bad two days after we had to put it into skins called hudri before taking leave of this place i shall give some farther account of the manners and customs of the people when a child is born the next day the father kills a sheep and gives the child a name when they are sick they say hula karim and lie down till they are better or till they die i saw old men that did not know or could not tell their age as they keep no account of such things but by appearance they must have been ninety years old when any one dies they dig a hole in the ground and put the corpse into it and very often on the spot where the person died and then remove their tents a little farther on they never intermarry with any but their own people a girl had been refused in marriage to a turkish kachef though she was as poor as any of her tribe the kachef attempted to use force and the consequence was that they assembled to the number of above three hundred and he prudently retired leaving his intended bride to be married to her cousin they have shown that they are sensible of their wild manner of living but continue in it for the sake of liberty for they wrote to the bay at esne that they were content to live in that wild state as all their forefathers had done to remain free from tyranny and despotism and that they would be quiet if they were left so but on the contrary they would sooner perish than lose their liberty some of these wild people as they are called came to the well in the course of the day and as they saw us quiet and peaceful they ventured at the persuasion of our drivers to approach us a few of them had been as far as the nile to purchase dura and these were accounted men of knowledge but the greater part had never quitted their mountains one of them seeing a piece of lemon peel lying on the ground wondered what it was and another who had been to the nile to show his great knowledge of things took it up and ate it with an air of self-sufficiency we gave them a piece of loaf sugar and when they had eaten it they declared that our valley must be better than their own as it produces such good and sweet bread when they buy dura they generally get it ground with the usual hand millstone in the village where they buy it and carry the flour into the desert their bread is baked under the ashes and is in the form of a large cake without leaven or salt their great enemies are the tribe of el masha and banuzi which dwell from between suez to the interior of arabia and the confines of syria with these tribes they had had many battles but it appeared that neither one or the other advanced beyond their old possessions they had also been at variance with the bejarines on the south but were now at peace with them all their arms are chiefly spears and swords or sabres of very old fashioned narrow at the hilt and broad at the point they have very few firearms and those they have are with matchlocks their constant hard way of life made them accustomed to eat raw meat and to suffer the inconveniences of a desert with the greatest indifference i have seen them for near four and twenty hours without drinking and walking the whole day and night in the hottest season they are not so religious as the arabs of the nile i scarcely ever saw them saying their prayers by the great caution i observed in our guide as we advanced in the desert i perceived it was necessary that he should acquaint them of the protection we had from their sheikh by whose permission we ventured among them thus alone and without any escort it appeared to me that they were much exasperated toward the soldiers who had lately been sent into their mountains in search of emeralds and had it not been for the danger of their sheikh whose property and life were in the hands of the turks they would soon have turned these people out of the mountains particularly as the miners were a set of desperate fellows who behaved very ill often assailed their tents committed depredations and insulted their women of which the abates complained very much on the twenty eighth early in the morning we set off and passed through many rocky valleys the road was not quite so level as before but good enough for any horse to trot along there was nothing interesting except large plains of sand and high mountains before us we arrived in the evening at a spot named gurf on the twenty ninth we traversed several pleasing valleys the mountains that surround them were all of hard stones and beautifully variegated with different colored marble 
about two in the afternoon we saw the red sea at a great distance and having entered a range of mountains stopped at a place called owel or place of the dragon end of number nineteen journey to the red sea part two of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain on the thirtieth we set off early bent our course to the south southwest and passed through several valleys towards a very high mountain called zubara a name given to it in consequence of the emeralds which have been found there at the foot of this mountain about fifty men were encamped and at work in the old mines of the ancients in hopes of finding some of the precious stones but it appeared that their predecessors had searched pretty well before they quitted their works these unfortunate wretches received a supply of provisions from the nile but sometimes it did not arrive in due time and a great famine of course prevailed among them there were two small wells not more than half a day's journey distance and one of them had a tolerably good quantity of water their work had commenced about six months before but had been attended with no success the mines or excavations of the ancients were all choked up with the rubbish of the upper part that had fallen in and the labour to remove this rubbish was great for the holes were very small scarcely capable of containing the body of a man crawling like a chameleon they were all thoroughly tired of their situation and cursed the being who had caused them to be sacrificed in these deserts destitute of all the common necessaries of life they rose several times against their leaders and in one instance two of them were killed on the day we were there one of the poor wretches nearly fell a victim to the avaricious caprice of their powerful employer as he was penetrating into one of the holes part of the roof fell down upon him and not only cut off his retreat but nearly killed him on the spot he was fortunately taken out alive but it did not give much encouragement to the rest we contrived to acquire all the information we could about our expedition and received very favourable accounts of it with some additional hopes respecting the old town in question which according to these people was only six hours distant south from us and at six hours more there was a fountain of water the sea was only six hours distant from the town of which we hoped to have a fine view before night we went to see the entrance into the mines they were something like the common tombs at gournou cut in the rock but i observed that the cavities were made so as to follow the veins of mica and marble and had been carried to a great distance into the bowels of the mountain till they found the emeralds there are a great number of mines all over this mountain and the rubbish taken out of them which is scattered about gives an idea of the amazing works of the ancients the excavations are not carried on in any regular direction sometimes they are in an inclined plane of various angles at other times they are perpendicular or horizontal as the mica runs i was told by the miners that as they advanced towards the centre and at great distance from the entrance the two strata of marble which enclose the mica approach each other till at last they join and there is the most chance of finding the emeralds where the rocks form separate hills i observed that the veins of marble and the mica take their course towards the centre and by the distance they run inward from the entrance it appears to me that the place where the emeralds are found must be pretty near the centre of the hill i mean under the highest point of that elevation which distinguishes one hill from another i was not fortunate enough to see any emeralds as these people had not met with any in all their researches indeed their leader showed us some few specimens of a very inferior kind and what was found till that period was only the matrix he was determined however to persevere and i heard some months after that he had succeeded in finding some but in small quantity i believe too they are of a secondary quality by what i have seen of them 
the people who live there are in a dreadful situation the nearest habitation is on the nile which cannot be reached in less than seven days by a caravan they depend entirely on the supply of provisions sent them from esne which is sometimes very scanty though only bread rice and lentils and according to their account it happens very often that their supply is delayed merely by the negligence of the purveyors who are directed to furnish them with it besides they have another source of apprehension they consider and with good reason that the abade are not pleased to see them in the deserts and much less since some of the miners behaved very brutally to them surprising them in their tents and insulting their women as before stated and they were alarmed for the consequences their great fear was that the abade would assail the caravan of provision on its way from the nile for as they had no stock with them before another supply could arrive which would require at least fourteen days they would all perish with hunger these considerations rendered the people unwilling to work and the operations were going on very slowly when we were there having procured an old man from among the natives to guide us to the ruins of the anticipated berenice we sought all the information we could from the people and some of the miners who had been at the very place when m caliud was there their account of it indeed was not in conformity with that of m caliud but we considered that these people went only in search of mines and little regarded the beauties of ancient architecture or the magnificence of edifices which according to our expectations must be stupendous at least we prepared for our departure on the next morning the first of october and when we had gone about half a mile we perceived that we were without our guides both he who had brought us from the nile and the old man who was to conduct us all over the country to see the town and other places were missing we were consequently obliged to return in search of them and found them hidden behind a rock conversing secretly with each other they professed to have been in search of a sheep which was stolen in the night and we had nothing else to live upon but as they said they could not find it we set off for the so much desired ancient city of berenice our road was now among the high rocks and in very narrow valleys but in which there were a great number of trees sometimes the mountains diverged into wide circles one or two miles wide in such places the wood is abundant and it is from these that the miners get the timber for their use the most common plants among them are the sunt and the usual thorn on the ground among the sandy spots i observed the coloquintada and other shrubs our directions was toward the southwest and gradually to the west till we reached the south side of the mountain of zubara which is the highest of the emerald mountains here we were led by the old man in various directions through wild and craggy places for seven hours he told us the place we wanted to see was near but we had a high pass to go over the mountain named araya we continued our journey and ascended a kind of gully at the side of which was something like an ancient road or rather path on the summit of the mountain above we observed a large wall so situated that it appeared to look over the path on both sides of the mountain when we reached the top of the road our camels were exhausted some of them had fallen on the way and were unloaded to enable them to ascend and the strongest camels had to return to fetch the loads of the others i never saw the camels suffer so much on any occasion as on this a steep and craggy road over a mountain is no more adapted to a camel than the deep sand of the desert to a horse from this summit we began to look out for the desired berenice but alas in vain our imagination was so raised by the account of m caliud that i for my part expected to distinguish the town by the lofty columns and architecture of some magnificent edifice or the remains of some high tower which was to serve me as a guide to the spot to which i intended to run on the first view of it mr beechey was not less anxious than myself and in equal expectation of grandeur we had made our arrangements how to proceed when we arrived 
we considered that as our provision was scanty we could stop there but a few days and we had already distributed our time accordingly he was to take the drawings of all the beautiful edifices monuments figures paintings if any sculptures statues columns and so forth i was to run all over the vast ruins like a pointer as fast as i could to observe where anything was to be found or discovered to take measures of all the beautiful monuments and plans of every stone in that great city such was our imagination now to the fact from the summit where we now were i expected to have a distant view not only of the sea but of a wide plain as it was natural to suppose that a town like pompeii could not have been built among these savage mountains without one foot of cultivated land about it the non-appearance of any wide space i attributed to the situation where we were and presumed that we should be agreeably surprised on turning some of the rocks before us so that my expectation was not diminished in the least on our descent the old man told us that we should soon see the ballet he had already said that previous to our reaching the town we should see some grottoes in the mountains which according to our quixotic imagination we concluded were the tombs of the inhabitants of that vast city we advanced insensibly i continually keeping my eyes on the points of some rocks which stood before me with the expectation that on turning the next angle i should have the glorious sight and indeed the scattered and ruined walls of some ancient enclosures announced to us that we should soon see some habitation i observed a square hole in the rock which had evidently been cut by some of the miners in the form of a chapel as before mentioned see plate thirty three number seven i now began to congratulate myself that we had nearly arrived and while i was thus thinking all at once the old man who was at the head serving us as a guide made a sign to halt the drivers gave the signal to the camels and the camels who were already exhausted by passing over the mountains did not wait for its repetition but with all the baggage were quickly crouched on the ground before i could perceive the reason why i told the drivers that we did not intend to stop there but would advance farther into the town where the houses were to be seen when to our no small astonishment we were told by the old man that this was the place where the other christian was before i must confess that my stupidity would not allow me at once to conjecture that the report of m caliud could be so exaggerated as to lead us to suppose we should find another pompeii instead of the place at which we had just arrived and reproach the old man for his stopping there and not advancing to the town which according to his own account could not be far off he again protested that this was the place and that there was no other with houses in any part of these deserts or mountains i was still deeper in perplexity and continued to urge him to take us farther as to mr beechey he was in the same predicament as myself resolved not to submit to what i thought the imposition of the old man any longer as it now wanted four hours to sunset i mounted my camel again which would much rather have remained where he was than have gone in search of old berenice i set off immediately mr beechey did the same and consequently all the rest of the caravan followed at a distance we entered a long valley which ran toward the south and filled with the hopes of seeing the said berenice on turning every corner of the valley in succession we went on incessantly for four hours till it was nearly dark without perceiving the smallest appearance of any habitation at last we reached another valley more spacious and covered with the trees which the abade call egle and other plants the valley runs from south-east to north-west and having lost all hopes of finding berenice that night we halted to rest under a beautiful rock on a clean bed of sand instead of sleeping among the magnificent temples of the great city by this time we were without water and though in the proximity of a great town according to m caliud no water could be had at less than fifteen miles distance 
the camels though more than tired were obliged to set off immediately to the spring not only to drink themselves but to fetch water for us as we were much in want many were the conjectures we made on the cause that could induce the old man not to show us the place described by m caliud i sometimes fancied that our drivers had received instructions from the leader of the miners when we met him at the nile that we might not see any of the mines in or near the town of berenice but on the other hand we could not believe that the drivers would all with one consent deceive us merely to oblige a man who had no influence over them thus we did not know what to think our provision at this time began to make us cautious we had biscuit for twenty days yet but the loss of the sheep in the mountain made it worse our little stock of water also was quite putrid still we were easily satisfied so that we did but reach the desired emporium of the commerce formerly carried on by the nations of europe with india but alas this much sought-for town vanished or rather never appeared like the desired island of the squire of the astonishing champion of la mancha we contented ourselves with biscuit and a piece of mutton killed three days before which by the by gave me reason to congratulate myself on not possessing the sense of smell early in the morning of the second we perceived a high mountain on the southeast of the valley about four or five miles distant the valley we were told was named wadi el gamal it was quite full of that beautiful tree the egli and as we had to wait the return of the camels i thought we might ascend the mountain to have a view of the country or of the remains of berenice accordingly we set off and on our way observed several flocks of antelopes from which we were in hopes to obtain a repast for our empty stomachs but with all our caution we never could get near enough to shoot at them they were pretty fat and we were extremely hungry but for all this we were not able to approach them the valley continued very beautiful adorned with several groves of suvaro and debo trees in addition to a profusion of the egli the rocks on each side afforded many pleasing recesses to admit the traveller to rest and solitude perhaps no one had been in this valley for many centuries and very likely no one will pass through it for many more to come on our reaching the summit of the mountain we took a view to all around we had the map of the coast of the red sea by d'anville and a small perspective glass the peak on which we stood commanded a prospect of many miles all around but no place was to be seen where the city could have stood all that we saw was the summits of other lower mountains and at last we began to be persuaded that no such town existed and that m caliud had seen the great city only in his own imagination it was rather provoking to have taken such a journey in consequence of such a fabricated description and i hope this circumstance will serve as a warning to travellers to take care to what reports they listen and from whom they receive their information from the accounts of persons who were so given to exaggeration you cannot venture on a journey without running the risk of being led astray and disappointed as we were in our search after the said town with its eight hundred houses and much like pompeii having observed all the adjacent country and the mountains near us i took a distant view where the opening between the mountains permitted and observed that the valley from which we ascended the mountain continued its course toward the east and it appeared by the gullies that the water of the rainy season discharged itself in that direction on the southeast i saw some high mountains which we were told by the old man who had followed us all the way were near the sea taking a minute view in that direction on the northeast from the place where we stood i perceived the motion of the water under the sun at a great distance and we concluded that the valley must conduct us to the sea-coast accordingly we made up our minds to pursue that course and as we had been disappointed in seeing the extensive ruins of berenice we proposed to ourselves to try whether we could reach the spot where d'anville lays down the berenice troglodyticia 
we therefore descended the mountain and returned to the place where we had passed the preceding night to wait the return of the camels with a fresh supply of water of which we had so little by this time that a single zembebi a leathern bag containing nearly three quarts only remained our thirst was great and we felt in some degree the dreadful calamity of being in a desert without water hunger is painful to endure but thirst is by far more intolerable we often hear to what extremities a man can be reduced by hunger because water is always at hand but if this element were to be deficient we should see still more dreadful effects at last three hours after the camels appeared in sight at the head of the valley on the west and we rejoiced much at their arrival the poor drivers were excessively fatigued but we had no time to lose in debates when we told them that we intended to go farther on to the south they were all in consternation and we had much ado to persuade them to agree to it indeed it was not without promises and threats that we prevailed on them at length we set off towards the sea in a north-east direction after travelling six hours we arrived in a valley the rocks on each side of which were nearly perpendicular they were composed of calcareous stone intermixed with strata of white marble as well as of red granite during this time we proceeded without knowing in the least where our journey would end our only hope arising from the sight i had of the sea in the morning at sunset we came to a place where there was an opening in the mountains not unlike a breach it is called by the abade shurm el kamel the rent of the camels and appears as if the rocks had been separated by art for each side is so perpendicular that it might be supposed to have been cut for the purpose of making a way through it after we had passed this we entered a more spacious valley the hills were small and the sandy banks made us expect to reach the sea every moment we went on till a late hour and at last halted on a spot where we thought the sand would afford us a pretty comfortable bed fortunate for me that it was so for the camel was so weary that no sooner did we reach the sand than supposing i intended to go still farther he completely threw me off his back left me there saddle and all and without delay set out to feed among the thorns mr beechey and myself anxious for the result of our journey and in hopes of seeing the sea which we thought not far off walked to the summit of one of the small hills but on reaching it we could scarcely perceive any distant object as it was nearly dark i was fully convinced of the non-existence of the imaginary berenice and felt the necessity of being on friendly terms with our guides who i found were pretty correct in the information they had given to us but no one could have supposed that a man who found only a few desolate ruins of the miserable residence of poor miners could fabricate a report that he had discovered the city of berenice the emporium of the commerce between india africa and europe early on the next day we resumed our journey the valley still continued in the same direction but to my amazement the hills instead of diminishing increased in size which made us fearful that we were yet far from the sea at length about noon the valley opened all at once and at the distance of five miles we saw the arabian gulf the sight of an open horizon after the contracted view of a long and narrow valley was much welcomed by us on our reaching the shore we plunged into the sea like the crocodiles into the nile and found that a bath after a long journey was very refreshing we had no time to lose as our biscuit as we calculated would last only seventeen days and not an hour longer directly opposite us we saw the island of jamba it appeared at first sight only a sandbank but on narrower inspection we perceived that it had some high rocks on the south side it was pretty high in the centre and gradually sloped toward the north the abade call it gasira al gimal i suppose because it is just before the valley of this name 
all the shore as far as we could see was composed of a mass of petrifactions of various kind i do not know whether i give the right name to this sort of composition but it is a mixture of seaweeds madrepores corals roots and shells of many sorts all formed into a solid mass like a rock which extends from the bank of sand that forms the boundary of the tide and runs into the sea for a great length in some places there are beds of sand but there is not a spot anywhere for a boat to land without the risk of being staved against the rock we now resolved without loss of time to take the road toward the south along the coast as far as till we might suppose we had passed the spot where our maps placed the ruins of berenice which according to d'anville who is considered as best skilled in ancient geography is immediately after the cape lepte extrema a little beyond the twenty-fourth degree of latitude we communicated our intention to our drivers who were thunderstruck with fear on hearing such a project they positively refused to accompany us any farther and though we were very urgent with them it was all to little purpose they remonstrated that we ran a great risk our stock of biscuit was very scanty there was no water to be found on that road and we might meet the bizarine whose country we proposed to approach but being determined to proceed in our design we took that method which persuades every one to act even against his own will we told them that we meant to go whether they would or not and that as we were superior in number we would compel them they soon saw that it was in vain to resist and at length it was concluded that the camel should go with two drivers to the nearest spring to take as much water as they could that on their return we should set off to proceed as far as el galahen to which place we made them understand we must go and thence take the road across to the well of running water on a calculation we found that with great economy in using the water we could do very well accordingly on the fourth the camels set off for the well and we had to wait two days till their return during this interval mr beechey and myself made an excursion along the coast toward the north to examine a small bay which we observed in the chart we went along the seashore and on our arrival at the spot where the bay ought to have been we found that it did not exist the coast was everywhere the same with respect to the petrifactions and the plain which extends from the mountains to the sea was covered in many places with woods of sycamore and sile trees which confirms the account of bruce for undoubtedly this must be the place where he landed when he went to visit the emerald mines the distance in a right line from the mines to the sea is about twenty-five miles and it may be thirty or thirty-two by the two valleys which are the only passable roads i do not see any reason why mr bruce's assertion of having visited these mountains should be doubted neither the distance he had to walk from the sea nor the danger of falling a victim to the rapacity of the natives are any arguments against it for we have instances enough to prove that he was capable of overcoming greater difficulties than these and i will venture to assert that the only reason why such doubts could have been started as well as many others respecting his work was the spirit of contradiction excited by the illiberality of travellers and those who were no travellers the former because they have not power to resist jealousy which in spite of all their efforts to conceal it shows itself through the veil of their pretended liberality and impartiality and the latter because they are unable to control their bad propensity to dispute and condemn everything that they have no knowledge of in some rocks that lay at the foot of the mountains facing the sea we saw several mines of sulphur but i doubt whether their produce would be advantageous owing to their situation they are near the sea but the conveyance by land to the nile would prevent any benefit from the speculation being persuaded that no vessel could be loaded on that coast we returned to the place where we had left our caravan hunger was not i believe visible on our faces for we contrived to make some repast out of some shell-fish which abound in great quantities along the coast 
and I cherished the idea that as long as I could find some of them I should not perish. The large periwinkles are excellent, and when young are very tender and delicious, particularly to a hungry man. We had some of them which weighed half a pound, and part of the tail quite delicate, though the white or upper part is rather tough. On our return we found that the guide had met with an acquaintance of his who lived by catching fish not far from where we were. His only habitation consisted of a tent four feet high and five feet wide, and his wife, a daughter, and a young man, her husband, formed the whole family. We contrived to persuade the old man to go out and fish, and though he was living in those deserts, he knew the worth of money, for he said that there were people among them who went yearly on the Nile, and purchased dura, which they carried on camels all round those deserts, and sold it to the inhabitants, for which they took in exchange either camels or money. Consequently, we easily persuaded the old fisher to go out and catch fish for us. In fact, he set off to sea, accompanied by his son-in-law. Their mode of fishing is somewhat strange. They throw in the water a part of the trunk of the dumped tree, perhaps ten or twelve feet long, at each end of which is a piece of wood, attached in an horizontal direction, so as to prevent the tree from turning round. At one of the ends a small pole is stuck upright to serve as a mast, on the top of which there is a piece of wood horizontally fastened as that below. A woolen shawl thrown over it and fastened at each end, and to the piece of wood horizontally fixed below, forms a kind of sail, and the two fishermen mount on the large trunk as on horseback, and by way of cord attached to the middle of the sail, take the wind more or less as is required but it is only when the wind blows either from the north or south that such a contrivance can serve for if it blows from the east they cannot set off their boat from the shore or if it blows from the west it will blow them too far out at sea when the fishermen are thus at some distance from the shore i do not know by what means the rest of the operation is executed but from what i could see they darted their long thin spear at the fish when they happened to see any and by these means they procured their subsistence on their return they brought us four fish each of about six pounds weight and one foot six inches long they were of a strong blue silvered colour their fins head and tail red and their teeth which are only four are quite flat and out of their mouths they had very large scales and their form not unlike the bene of the nile i am certain the egyptians must have had a knowledge of this fish as it is so clearly seen in their hieroglyphics and in the new tomb of Semethis i saw some painted exactly as they are in reality they are exceedingly good have very few bones and very large galls on the fifth in the morning i ascended a high mountain to view the coast as far as i could and i saw that it ran straight towards the southeast the spot which we occupied is marked number sixteen on the map to which i cannot give a better name than the mouth of wadi el gamal as it is precisely opposite the entrance into the valley of that name i observed also that the southern point of the island of gambe was in a right line with the rising sun at sea and myself it will be seen on the map supposing the place i stood upon to be on the top of the mountain nearest to the above number sixteen by the help of a small compass we contrived to take the direction of the northern coast as far as we had been the day before our maps being so small we did not find them so correct as we wished early on the sixth the camels returned with a load of fresh water and it was well they did so for our thirst was increased not only from the scarcity of water but by the shellfish which we had found and eaten abundantly an inconvenience which the fishermen had not to contend with being accustomed to the bitter water of a well not so far off we now divided our caravan into two parties. We sent all the luggage, culinary utensils, the soldier, my Greek servant, and the best part of the camels, to a spring of running water in the mountains of Amuse, there to wait until our return. 
for ourselves we took with us as much water as we could and formed a party consisting of mr beechey and myself a greek servant four drivers and the two arabian boys we had brought from gournou with five camels in all End of part 20journey to the red sea part three of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain we set off in the forenoon and went along the coast till we arrived at el wadi agassan near the mines of el kebret or sulphur and on the southwest were the mountains of hamata i observed the coast all the way and took its direction on our road we met some fishermen like the former ones when they saw us at a distance they left their tents and marched off towards the mountains all our signs to them to stop were to no purpose we arrived at their tents and found some excellent fish just roasted which no doubt these people had made ready for their supper we partook of their meal and left some money in payment on the top of a water jar and continued our journey for two days we had been troubled with the winds from the east blowing strong and resembling the siroccos of italy so that all our nerves were relaxed during this time everything we touched felt as if it had just been taken out of the water and at night there was an excessive heat and the atmosphere quite covered with clouds which i had not seen for three years and a half fortunately it changed after two days and the north wind dissipated all had it lasted longer we could not have proceeded on our journey at night we stopped at a well of bitter water on the seventh we set off early to see the mines of el kebrite or sulphur as they were not out of our road they never were productive but what little they may have afforded it appeared that the ancients had carried entirely away so that they left them exhausted like those of the emeralds towards the evening we saw the island of Sref and we arrived at night at the cape el galulum it has here that we began to feel short allowance of water we calculated and found that without great care we should be without it therefore our thirst was not satisfied the eighth early in the morning we set off and continued our road to the south two hours after we saw the sea at a distance and went over a very extensive plain at about noon we approached the sea very thirsty and regaled ourselves with a little water and at one o'clock we arrived on the shore we did not expect to arrive at any ruins for as yet it did not agree exactly with the situation laid down by Danville. but to our agreeable surprise we found ourselves all at once on one of those moles of ruins which show the spot of ancient towns so often seen in egypt we entered and at once we saw the regular situations of the houses the main streets their construction in the centre a small egyptian temple nearly covered by the sand as well as the insides of the houses and our wonder increased on examining the materials with which the houses were built we could see nothing but coral roots mandrepore and several petrifactions of seaweeds and so forth the temple is built of a kind of soft calcareous and sandy stone but decayed much by the air of the sea the situation of this town is delightful see plate thirty four the open sea before it is on the east and from the southern coast to the point of the cape is like an amphitheatre of mountains except an opening on the northwest plain where we came from the cape el galahen extends its point nearly opposite the town on the east and forms a shelter for large ships from the north and northwest winds right opposite the town there is a very fine harbor entirely made by nature its entrance is on the north it is guarded on the east by a neck of encrusted rock on the south by the land and on the west by the town the north side as i said before being covered by the range of mountains which forms the cape protects the harbour also its entrance has been deep enough for small vessels such as the ancients had in those times but no doubt was deeper it has at present a bar of sand across so that nothing could enter at low water but a passage could be easily cut and the harbour rendered useful 
we concluded this to be the berenice described by pliny and herodotus laid down by Donville, and it nearly agreed with the situation where it is marked on the map but in order to ascertain with more accuracy we resolved to venture by going half a day higher towards the south and then we should be certain that we should pass the spot where Donville has put down the said berenice i measured the town which is in breadth from north to south sixteen hundred feet and in length from east to west two thousand feet i took the plan of the temple which seems to be in construction according to the egyptian style and we imagined that the greeks had taken their plans from this ancient people as they had done in many other places see plate thirty two it is one hundred and two feet long and forty-three feet wide it contains four chambers two on each side of the secos and cella and two in the great hall in the front our difficulty now was about the water it became very scarce and we could not positively stay there the whole of the next day the abades nearly lost their patience with our researches for they had not a drop of water for themselves we could not spare any of ours and the nearest well was supposed to be a day's journey distant they had drank but little the day before notwithstanding all this we were determined not to leave anything undone as far as we could we promised them that we would set off on the next day at twelve o'clock and fortunately being moonlight we employed part of the night to scrutinize the place it was now three days since we had eaten anything but dry biscuit and water except the fish we found at the fisherman's hut we were contented ourselves with eating biscuit but our thirst increased and our hunger diminished we persuaded the sheikh ibrahim our guide to go with us towards the south on the next morning and leave the rest of the people at the town he agreed with reluctance and said that he feared his camels and people could not start without water however on the morning of the ninth before the sun rose we set the little musa to digging he was one of the arid boys we brought with us from gurnu i made him dig in the temple he had no spade but with a shell or kakil he worked very well as it was only soft sand we set off along the beach and made straight towards the southern point before us we passed the fore part of the day in calculating that the spot where donville marked the town could not be farther south we saw nothing before us but an extensive plain to the foot of the mountains that formed the cape on the south we had glasses and could see all the ground but no sort of elevation or any other indication that could give a supposition of any remains of habitations we returned to the town and found that the boy had excavated about four feet of sand close to the northeast corner of the cella and to our surprise we saw that the temple was egyptian the part of the wall which was discovered was adorned with egyptian sculpture in basso relievo and well executed we could see three figures two feet three inches high of which i took drawings as well as i could see plate thirty three number one the remaining part of the wall was covered with hieroglyphics and so forth i observed the upper part of the door which leads into the inner chamber and in the same sandy hole the boy found part of an egyptian tablet covered with hieroglyphics and figures see plate sixteen it is of a kind of reddish pudding stone or breccia not belonging to the rocks near that place we took it away as a memorandum of having seen an egyptian temple on the coast of the red sea a circumstance that as yet no antiquarian has had any idea of the plain that surrounds this town is very extensive the nearest point to the mountains which form the crescent is about five miles on the west of it on the north the mountain is about twelve miles distant and on the south fifteen all the plain is inclined to vegetation such as a sandy soil can produce but in particular the lower part of it towards the sea is perpetually moist and would produce if cultivated pasture for camels sheep and other animals this moisture is naturally produced by the damp of the sea which is very strong when it happens the upper part of the plain is not so damp and i believe would be perhaps more productive of dry plants 
i do not know whether grain for bread could be brought to any perfection as the soil is of a sandy nature with but a small portion of clay impregnated with salt incrustations it is full of small plants of sunt and suvaros this last plant i observed along the coast growing close to the salt water and generally out of the rocks some quite under water particularly at high tides it is a small tree generally no higher than eight feet its leaves are of a substance like the laurel its form will be seen in plate thirty six this makes very good firewood and with the sunt tree i have no doubt that the town was well provided with that article water is the commodity of most importance in such a spot for though there are three wells they are so bitter that the human palate cannot taste it without increasing the thirst camels and other beasts can drink it very well as to good water it is supposed that such a town could not be without a great supply of it i observed that the nearest mountain is only five miles distant there must have been some wells in those rocks which are now either choked up or are unknown what i can assert is that at only one day's journey there is a well of tolerably good water and at one and a half an excellent spring runs out of the rocks of granite and as the ancients had such facilities in transporting anything from a great distance by camels so this town may have been supplied with water at one day's journey distance but i am inclined to think that they had it from the nearest mountains as by their situation they must afford wells etc as to greens and other necessaries they might easily have been supplied by the soil or from the nile as kazara is at this very day at a small distance from the city i saw several groups of ruins it appears that they were houses situated out of the town in different directions the calculations i made about the houses and population compels me to observe that the houses were not so extensive as they are built at this day it was the custom of those people to live close to each other i observed that the largest houses were about forty feet in length and twenty in breadth some were smaller but i made the calculation at the rate of twenty by forty and i found that the square of two thousand by sixteen hundred feet would contain four thousand houses but as there were spaces of ground without buildings which may be reckoned half of the town i counted them to be only two thousand that i might not be mistaken for another caliud those people had no need of great sheds to put coaches chariots or any such luxurious lumber their cattle and camels lay always in the open air as they still do in all these countries nor had they extensive manufactories the only massy buildings for their commerce could be but a few storehouses nor could the narrow lanes which were in use in those times occupy much of the ground i calculated that with the houses out of town which are scattered about in groups here and there the population of that port must have exceeded ten thousand inhabitants a town which even to this day would be reckoned of consequence if situated on that coast as a port for commerce with india i observed also some of the tombs dug in the nearest lower rocks of a kind of soft or calcareous stone which are the only ones on the plain near the town on the western side we left the spot before the evening of the same day in consequence of the want of water and as our camel driver had nearly lost their patience we gave them half a pint each and continued our road towards the mountain on the northwest with the firm intention of returning prepared to scrutinize the whole of those ruins at about twelve miles from the sea we entered a vale on the northwest of the town in the mountains which forms the crescent around it we continued the best part of the night by moonlight and fortunately arrived at the well at Aratit at midnight a mountainous place where the water was good enough to drink we were agreeably surprised to find the well but much more so when we saw a few sheep around it there never was a more welcome sight we thought we might have something to refresh us we proposed to purchase one and eat it as soon as it could be half cooked we approached but the guardian of the flock beat a forced march into the mountain and drove the intended repast away from us 
we began to think we would not continue to be deprived of what we could purchase and sent some of our drivers to follow the flock which they heartily did as they were not less hungry than ourselves the fugitives were pursued and stopped we reached the flock and found that its guardians were two beautiful damsels of the deserts the chocolate nymphs were surprised at the fountain by their pursuers and took refuge on the mountains but with some few good words from their countrymen they were soon persuaded to return and trust themselves near us we were gallant with them for the sake of devouring some of their lambs they became gradually more familiar and scrupled not to let us see their chocolate faces by the moonlight but the sheep prevailed above all and took our chief attention those poor girls had no other way to show themselves but at the well that is the only place they have a chance to see or be seen at last we purchased the sheep and devoured it the nymphs watered their flocks filled their skins and set off at daylight on this road we observed camel's paths and pieces of broken pottery which indicated this to have been a principal way to the town and halfway between this well and habu gray we met with a station like the one which we saw before on the road to koptos i inquired and found that this valley communicated with the same i have mentioned which gave us reason to believe that the great road from koptos to berenice was directed to this place which agreed with the opinion and maps of d'anville early in the morning of the tenth we set off again toward the mountains of zabara with the intention to examine sakit minor as we had not well seen it before the valley we were in continued to the northwest and we followed the sea at about one o'clock we arrived at keferari a well of excellent water here we rested the remaining part of the afternoon and succeeded in procuring another sheep but no better than the first the entrails were the best part of it and on all the rest it may have had about one pound of pure flesh no sheep has more in this country and less of an extraordinary size we set off on the eleventh and passed through a valley surrounded by granite rocks in the afternoon we arrived at a running spring rising out of a granite chasm a singular thing in this country as no such abundance of water is to be found anywhere it affords water enough to make a jet of about one inch diameter and the water is excellent this place is called amusne and is only at one day's journey from sakit here we found the rest of the caravan which we had sent from the seaside waiting for us on the morning of the twelfth we sent our greek interpreter to zabara requesting mahabat aga the leader of the miners to send us two of those greeks who saw the frenchmen measure the place in the mountains or the ancient town and we arranged to meet them at sakit on the next night the spot where we were this day formed a cataract which descended from an upper valley connected with others still higher and so on to the top of the mountain on the thirteenth we rested at this place all day as we were all tired and on the fourteenth we set off for sakit on our arrival there we heard from my servant that mohammed aga was not returned from the nile to the mines we might have waited for him at the first temple long enough by this time we were pretty well convinced that no other place was to be seen but to satisfy ourselves we set off on the fifteenth for the coast again through the valley from sakit to the sea on the same road mr caliud passed i took all the directions possible with compasses and calculations we arrived at the sea in the evening a journey much longer than caliud had said as he reported it was only three hours walk but we found it required nine and that by the best mode of travelling in these deserts we had left part of our water-skins at sakit on purpose to facilitate our march we arrived about a mile on the north of the valley el gamil the spot where we had visited before the sixteenth we occupied ourselves with a long examination of this coast and were convinced that there could be no landing on that shore it happens that d'anville's map is not correct on this point for it marks a bay here which according to him would form a fine harbour but on the contrary there is not such a bay and the coast is one continued rocky shore 
so that a small vessel could not approach nor is there any shelter for ships against any wind or any appearance of a road leading to the inland places the road we passed from Sakit is the very place which Kaliud took to the seaside, if a road it can be called. It is a vale which leads to the sea from the pass in the mountains, but it has not the least appearance of having been a road at any time. The inconvenience for camels to pass over this mountain when loaded would make the transport impractical. Besides, if they had to build a town for commercial purposes, they would never have built it on this spot it is one day's journey from the nearest point of the mountains toward the east to the sea situated among craggy rocks in a dry and sterile valley on the seventeenth we returned to sakit i can but conclude of this spot that it could never have been a place of commerce or the habitation of any sort of commercial people but i really believe that these few scattered houses may have been built for miners who worked in the mountains in search of emeralds in the adjacent places and that here was their chief residence we arrived at this place late at night and found that the man we left there to guard our water was gone he had taken the skins with him and did not leave us a drop of water fortunately the well was at only six hours journey distance from us so we sent the camels to water and likewise to bring some to us the following are the greek inscriptions which dr young has translated for me and which i copied from a niche in the rocks if the antiquarians by these inscriptions can make out that the above place is one of the berenices still it is certain that the greeks did not build a great town under that name Reader's note. Here follows a page of Greek text. End note. The translation will be nearly thus. A. The homage of dot 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 with my sons and those who have labored with me and have done this and have testified to the god dot dot and to our lady Isis of Cincius. B. Dot 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 likewise a file untouched by fire of two pounds weight all these things at my own expense having presented to serapis and to Myrius four drachmas the cistern half a drachm the eighth year of caesar the twenty one of Pani, to serapis to manius i have made the temple c under aurelius and trajan of herodian maker twenty seventh d of symphronius doing honor to dot dot and to isis and to apollo and to all the other gods enshrined with them i have made the temple e dot dot of berenice and the sculptured animal and having dug the channel of the river from the foundation and at his own expense has dedicated them with good fortune f pachybistus the dot 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 Pedicirus dot dot made dot dot fafili twenty ninth poetius the son of Asidius Payani the twenty ninth here is no water nearer than one day's journey either for man or beast nor soil for any verger the spot is sheltered from the wind so that it receives the full power of the sun in all points besides all the circumstances before mentioned the small niche where this inscription was found is situated on the road to berenice and i cannot persuade myself that such a place as this can be one of those of that name on the eighteenth we searched for some hours all the neighboring mountains and found several mines at about half an hour's walk distance in the valley that leads to the pass towards zabora and three others near this place the nineteenth early in the morning we took our course to the south and at about two p m we reached the point where the road takes its course to the west in this spot we found one of the stations as before mentioned it is called kafafit we continued till the evening and arrived at habukadi near a mountain in the form of a bell in the valley of wadi el gemal we saw abundance of the trees egli and the plant-like rushes called murk the twentieth early we set off and passed through a wide plain as we left the mountain and arrived at Habukarug, a place that appears to be at the entrance of the chain of mountains that leads to the nile 
Our camels were so tired they could hardly crawl. We had lost three on the road, and one we expected would not last long. It is difficult to form a correct idea of a desert without having been in one. It is an endless plain of sand and stones, sometimes intermixed with mountains of all sizes and heights, without roads or shelter, without any sort of produce for food. The few scattered trees and shrubs of thorns that only appear when the rainy season leaves some moisture barely serve to feed wild animals and a few birds. Everything is left to nature. The wandering inhabitants do not care to cultivate even these few plants, and when there is no more of them in one place, they go to another. When the trees become old and lose their vegetation in such climates as these, the sun, which constantly beams upon them, burns and reduces them to ashes. I have seen many of them entirely burnt. The other smaller plants have no sooner risen out of the earth than they are dried up and all take the color of straw, with the exception of the plant haruk. This falls off before it is dry speaking in general of a desert there are few springs of water some of them at the distance of four six and eight days journey from one another and not all of sweet water on the contrary it is generally salt or bitter so that if the thirsty traveller drinks of it it increases his thirst and he suffers more than before but when the dreadful calamity happens that the next well which is so anxiously sought for is found dry the misery of such a situation cannot be well described the camels which afford the only means of escape are so thirsty that they cannot proceed to another well and if the travellers kill them to extract the little liquid which remains in their stomachs they themselves cannot advance any farther the situation must be dreadful and admits of no resource i must not omit what i have been told happens in such cases many perish victims of the most horrible thirst it is then that the value of a cup of water is really felt he that has a zarafan of it is the richest of all in such a case there is no distinction if the master has none the servant will not give it to him for very few are the instances where a man will voluntarily lose his life to save that of another particularly in a caravan in the desert where people are strangers to each other what a situation for a man though a rich one perhaps the owner of all the caravans he is dying for a cup of water no one gives it to him he offers all he possesses no one hears him they are all dying though by walking a few hours farther they might be saved the camels are lying down and cannot be made to rise no one has strength to walk only he that has a glass of that precious liquor lives to walk a mile farther and perhaps dies too if the voyages on seas are dangerous so are those in the deserts at sea the provisions very often fail in the desert it is worse at sea storms are met with in the desert there cannot be a greater storm than to find a dry well at sea one meets with pirates we escape we surrender we die in the desert they rob the traveller of all his property and water they let him live perhaps but what a life to die the most barbarous and agonizing death in short, to be thirsty in a desert, without water, exposed to the burning sun, without shelter, and no hopes of finding either, is the most terrible situation that a man can be placed in, and I believe one of the greatest sufferings that a human being can sustain. The eyes grow inflamed, the tongue and lips swell, a hollow sound is heard in the ears, which brings on deafness, and the brains appear to grow thick and inflamed all these feelings arise from the want of a little water in the midst of all this misery the deceitful morasses appear before the traveller at no great distance something like a lake or river of clear fresh water the deception of this phenomenon is well known as i mentioned before but it does not fail to invite the longing traveller towards that element and to put him in remembrance of the happiness of being on such a spot if perhaps a traveller is not undeceived he hastens his pace to reach it sooner the more he advances toward it the more it goes from him till at last it vanishes entirely and the deluded passenger often asks where is the water he saw at no great distance he can scarcely believe that he was so deceived 
he protests that he saw the waves running before the wind and the reflection of the high rocks in the water if unfortunately any one falls sick in the road there is no alternative he must endure the fatigue of travelling on a camel which is troublesome even to healthy people or he must be left behind on the sand without any assistance and remain so till a slow death come to relieve him what horror what a brutal proceeding to an unfortunate sick man no one remains with him not even his old and faithful servant no one will stay and die with him all pity his fate but no one will be his companion why not stop the whole caravan till he is better or do what they can for the best till he dies no this delay cannot be it will put all in danger of perishing of thirst if they do not reach the next well in such a time besides they are all different parties generally of merchants or travellers who will not only refuse to put themselves in danger but will not even wait a few hours to save the life of an individual whether they know him or not in contrast to the evil there is the luxury of the desert and also its sport which is generally at the well there one enjoys all the delight of drinking as much water as one likes which tastes not unlike cordials or other precious liqueurs with the others in that situation the beasts mixed with birds drink together close to the well there is a kind of basin made of clay which is filled up by the drivers from the well where the thirsty animals all drink together camels sheep dogs donkeys and birds as it is the only time they can partake of that liquid for if it is not drawn up from the well they cannot reach it i only saw four species of birds viz the vulture crow wild pigeon and partridge of this last we eat some and found them exceedingly good the crows are the most numerous they tease the camels by picking their wounds if they have any the other and most pleasing diversion is the most beautiful damsels who come as shepherdesses to water their flocks who after being assured that there is no danger in approaching strangers become more sociable on such occasions our observing their gestures afforded us great amusement but our water-skins filled and the camels loaded we were obliged to quit these dear spots with the hope of meeting another like it in a few days and so on till we reached the blessed nile but the journey was pleasant enough this day as we had a well only within a few hours we set off at two in the morning of the twentieth and before noon reached the well at hamshis containing very good water here we lost another camel he could not go any farther we set off again in the afternoon and arrived at a place at the foot of a mountain of granite early on the twenty first we set off again and soon entered the ravine of granite rocks that reminded us of the cataract which we saw on our passing before after this we arrived at the station of samut which we also saw before at the same time we arrived at night at dangos where the mountains are not very high and of calcareous stone from the cataract and from nearly dawn to this place we found the track of an old road which continued in the direction of southeast and northwest and i have very little doubt but that it is the same we saw at bezac on our passing before and which takes its course in a right line from coptos to berenice on the twenty second we continued our route at one in the morning and arrived at wadi el midda at sunset we took a measurement of the fort which i mentioned before and early on the twenty-third proceeded and arrived at the first well the water of this place tasted to us very bad on our going up but it appeared pretty good on our return in the night we arrived at the nile and our having been long deprived of good water made us sensible of the superiority of that of the river over the wells we had been accustomed to certainly i am of opinion that there are few waters if any in europe that can be compared with that of the nile it answers all purposes it has the freshness of spring and the softness of river water it is excellent to drink and it serves all other purposes plate thirty eight is a topographical map which i made of the above journey as correct as i could we went on board our little boat the same night on the twenty fourth the sheikh of the abadi came to us and we presented him with a gun and some powder and balls 
we complained of the badness of the camels with which he had provided us he assured us that no one of the abade had ever undertaken such a journey as we had and that the camels were not accustomed to such forced marches we gave a gun a shawl and money to our guide who behaved uncommonly well we talked of repeating our journey and they assured us that if we returned they would furnish us with camels that would take us anywhere we pleased and as long as we would stay we sent a pair of pocket pistols to the cacheff and the island thanking him for his goodness and attention the place we now reached on the nile was a few miles north of that where we had entered in the desert opposite ephru and a little south of elithias the road which i observed all along the valley undoubtedly was a communication between that town and berenice and on the east to the emerald mines it is not to be wondered at that the town of elithias must have been of some consequence as there is all the probability of commerce having been carried on there there is still a landing-place which evidently proves the loading and unloading of boats for that purpose and i am of opinion that this place must have been more frequented by the caravans from the sea than coptos as it is a somewhat shorter journey to the nile we set off for esne on our journey down it was pleasing to see the difference of the country all the lands that were under water before were now not only dried up but were already sown the muddy villages carried off by the rapid current were all rebuilt the fences opened the fellows at work in the fields and all wore a different aspect it was only fifteen days since the water had retired and in that period it decreased more than eight feet it is not so every year when the nile increases slowly it decreases also in the same manner this is in consequence of the abundance or scarcity of rain which falls during the rainy season in abyssinia the natives rather prefer the rapid rising of the nile for it covers more space of land so that it be not too much as was the case this year and if the water remain eight days over it it does so much good as if it continued twenty by this time the drowned people were forgotten and the only calamity remaining was the scarcity of provisions among the fellows the nile had taken away their stock and the cachefs were only busied in procuring grain for seed in all such cases the poor labourer is the last thought of we arrived at esne on the morning of the twenty fifth and visited the bey who received us very politely he inquired about the mines and was very anxious to know the result we told him that nothing could be known on the subject till they were cleared of all the materials with which they were choked up we made him a present of a fine english gun he was much pleased and offered to give us all his assistance in anything that he could we set off and arrived at gournou on the same night after forty days absence which i hope were not uselessly employed end of part twenty one part twenty two of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty two account of the taking the obelisk from the island of philo to alexandria part one having made arrangements for accomplishing the models of the tombs i set off for esne with the intention of inquiring into the possibility of obtaining camels to go to the great oasis which lies due west from that place when i had obtained all the information i desired i returned to thebes to prepare for another sally into the western desert on my arrival in gournou i found the consul mr salt mr banks and baron sack had arrived from cairo having convinced mr salt of the impossibility of making a collection on my own account according to our understanding in consequence of his having taken possession of the grounds in thebes he proposed a new arrangement to be made between us which was that i might be at liberty to dig on either side of thebes on any ground i thought proper taking for my exertion a certain share of what might be found in the intended researches having agreed to this proposition i had to recommence my operations 
I was fully satisfied with the above arrangement, as I supposed that I should have an opportunity of making a collection of antiques out of the share which would be allotted to me. About this time Mr. Druetti arrived in Thebes, and by the medium of Mr. Banks made an offer to purchase the celebrated sarcophagus of alabaster, but his offer was not accepted. Footnote one evening that the whole party were assembled mr druetti happened to be there the consul and he had some few words about a circumstance which i cannot avoid mentioning it will be recollected that previous to our departure for the red sea a man from the opposite party desired to have a passage on board of our boat to cairo which was granted at girgay six days sail below thebes this unfortunate man was drowned by falling overboard as was stated by all the crew and some of our people who were on board when the boat arrived at cairo the report was made to the consul mr salt of the accident and though mr duetti was there at the time he did not signify that any investigation should take place on this affair now that Mr. Druetti was in Thebes, and the consul also, Mr. Druetti complained much that he did not take into consideration the death of that man. The consul replied that he never heard of any occasion to investigate the matter, to which Mr. Druetti replied that he ought to have done it. The consul then told him that, as the man was in Mr. Druetti's employ, he was surprised that he did not make an application while in Cairo. Mr. D. said that he did not for delicacy's sake, which answer was received with general laughter. Nothing was left undone by our opponents to slander out insinuations. End note. At this period, Mr. Banks solicited me to ascend the Nile as far as the island of Philo to remove the obelisk I had taken possession of before in the name of the British consul. The consul then informed me that he had ceded the said obelisk to Mr. Banks, who intended to send it to England on his own account. I gladly accepted the undertaking, as I was pleased to have the opportunity of seeing another piece of antiquity on its way to England, and of obliging a gentleman for whom I had great regard. Two days previous to our departure, the consul and myself crossed the Nile to Karnak, to point out the various spots of ground which had been previously taken by myself. On our landing at Luxor, we met Mr. Duetti, who offered to accompany us to Karnak to be witness of the various spots of ground which were to be allotted to me for excavation. On the way, Mr. Duetti told us a pleasant story of a man who was dressed like myself, who was hidden among the ruins of the temple, whom he, Mr. Duetti, had great reason to believe was a person who wished to do him some injury, and that he had already acquainted the Kamaikan of that place of the circumstance. I begged him to tell me what reason that man could have for assuming my appearance. He said that it was done to deceive him, and if he, the impostor, had done anything bad, it was to make the people believe that it was myself who had done it. The consul laughed at the story, and observed that I could not be so easily imitated. The conclusion of all this was, that if I had happened to go among the ruins, which it was my constant practice to do, and someone had sent a ball at me, they could have said after that they mistook me for the person who had assumed my appearance in dress and figure. I informed Mr. Duetti that I hoped he would tell his European people to inquire before they should fire at the supposed person representing me, whether it was the real or the sham Belzoni, as it would not be quite so pleasant or satisfactory to me if the mistake had been found out after. He replied that that person was sent away from Thebes and would not return again. We went all over the ruins and marked out the various spots of land which had been taken by us previous to Mr. Druetti's agent's arrival in Thebes, so all was well understood, and all was so arranged that it was hoped that no further differences should arise from any party. Now, my reader, read it and judge. It is not agreeable to my wishes to insert in this volume these matters which perhaps may cause a supposition of my inclination to expose, but such is the case that I cannot avoid mentioning it, as I have done many others, for if I was to conceal from the public what happened at that period, an advantage might be taken, and matters brought before them in any light but that of truth. 
after having now gone over the various places where i had to excavate mr duetti with all the complaisance possible invited the consul and myself into his habitation among the ruins of karnak we were regaled with sherbet and lemonade and talked of our late journey to berenice the discourse turned on our next expedition to the isle of philo when i happened to say that as i had to take the obelisk from that island down the cataract i feared it was too late in the season as the water would not serve at the cataract to float and launch down a boat adequate to support such a weight on hearing this mr duetti said that those rogues at the shalal meaning at aswan had deceived him that they promised many times to bring down the said obelisk for him but that they only promised to do it to extort money from him i then informed mr duetti that those people knew they could not take away that obelisk as since my first voyage up the nile i took possession of it in consequence of a firman which the consul mr salt who was there present had obtained from the bashaw the consul informed mr duetti that he had ceded the said obelisk to mr banks who intended to have it removed to england on hearing this mr duetti said that he was not aware we had taken possession of it and inquired if any money was spent in that affair on our side and having been answered that we paid money to keep a guard over the obelisk and that it was well understood with the aga of aswan that we were again to carry it away on the first opportunity he replied that those people had deceived him to exact money from his agents and so forth but notwithstanding all this as the obelisk was intended for mr banks he would not say a word about it and voluntarily ceded it to him this was not in compliment to our consul who was present i thought this was another present made to mr banks like the cover of the sarcophagus made to me which was so far buried among the rocks of gournou that all their efforts could not prevail to take it out mr duetti inquired when we should set off and the consul told him on the day after to-morrow accordingly on the sixteenth of november we left thebes for the first cataract of the nile the party was numerous mr banks mr salt baron sack a prussian traveller and a celebrated naturalist mr beechey mr lennon a draughtsman dr ricci and myself a large boat was taken for the consul a cangier for mr banks a small boat for the baron and a canoe for the sheep goats fowls geese ducks pigeons turkeys and donkeys which occasionally joined the chorus with the rest of the tribes and accompanied the fleet with a perpetual concert as to provisions we were pretty well supplied i believe for as their boats came lately from cairo they brought full stores yet it was arduous travelling living in that manner destitute of every commodity of life for even at table we had not ice to cool ourselves after the hot repast which was concluded with fruits and only two sorts of wine in short our lives were a burden to us from the fatigue and dangerous mode of travelling we were not like travellers who live on the best of everything they can get and write at home the hard life they undergo oh no oh no we would scorn to travel in such an effeminate manner to be sure some travellers will say why should i starve myself when i am in a plentiful country oh then but you should not make the world believe you are starving while you live like sir john falstaff on our passing elytheus we stopped there part of a day and nearly the whole of the next as i have nothing to add to the description of that place i shall not enter into any further description of it on the twenty first we visited edfu and took a minute survey of these truly magnificent ruins which are so covered with a profusion of objects that if a traveller was to repeat his visits every day of his life he might still find something new to be observed this place was at that time under the researches of mr duetti's agents one of whom we understood had received a dispatch from his master by an extra courier and had immediately set off for the island of philo we continued our voyage and before we arrived at sicily or the chain of mountains we met a small boat in which was mr leboulo the said agent and countryman of mr duetti of piedmontese he was hailed but would not stop to speak 
we stopped at this place at night and early in the morning we were all scattered about these quarries not in search of partridges but in search of sepulchres ancient stones greek inscriptions sphinxes or any sort of egyptian wonder indeed i must say that this place deserves more of the attention of the scientific traveller than has hitherto been bestowed upon it there are several interesting burial places among the quarries of the rocks and it is evident that the famous sphinxes with the ram's head which are to be seen in karnak have been taken from this spot as one of the same kind is to be seen cut out in the rough and partly removed from the rocks to the nile and another like it is nearly cut out of the quarry as to the old story that these two mountains were chains i can but say that i have my objection as to the fact of it for if the ancients wanted to prevent the passing of boats it may be supposed that aswan was a more suitable place for that purpose as the passage from the island of elephantine to the rocks of old aswan is much narrower than that of the sicily mountains and the cataract itself would form as good a barrier as any that could be constructed on the the nile there is a stone on the west side of the said mountain which is supposed to be that to which the chain was attached but for my part i could not see any marks where the chain was fixed nor does the stone seem to have been suited to such purposes and i am rather inclined to think that the name of the chained mountains is derived from the position of the mountain itself it runs in a chain from east to west and stretches over the nile at each side so that it forms the narrowest passage in that river from the cataract to the sea from which circumstance it is possible that the ancients have given it that name for i do not believe that their commerce was so flourishing as to oblige them to put an iron chain across the nile to stop the boats at night at a time when iron was reckoned a most valuable article and was employed for better purposes we reached ombos on the next day and as the party had to stop there one day longer i was anxious to read aswan as i expected no good from the early journey of lebulo the agent of mr Duetti accordingly i set off for that place in a congere which had come to meet us to take the consul up to nubia i took with me a young scotchman who had been brought into egypt at the time of the last english invasion of that country he was taken prisoner and some years after entered into the service of the bashaw of egypt and assumed the name of osman he became acquainted with sheikh burkhart and in consequence of his honesty and attachment to him the sheikh rewarded him in his will he was the only and the last person who closed the eyes of that lamented traveller and i had much conversation with him on the subject on my arrival at aswan i found that the said lebulo had suggested to the aga of aswan and to the natives of the island of philo not to let the english party who were coming up carry away the obelisk the aga remonstrated with him that the obelisk had been taken possession of by me three years before and a guard had been paid for it on that account in consequence of this refusal mr lebulo proceeded to the island of philo and having heard from all the natives that i had taken possession so long before he adopted the method of a trick to seduce these simple people he pretended he could read the hieroglyphics on the obelisk and said it was written that the obelisk belonged to mr Druetti's ancestors consequently he had a right to it the people believed him and he gave them some trifling presents and brought them to the cady or justice to hear their testimony that the obelisk was the property of mr Druetti. the cady received a present and wrote a sort of certificate on the evidence of these people having done all this mr lebulo wrote a note which he left with one of the sheikhs in the island to give it to us when we arrived and set off immediately as he thought his face could not be impudent enough to meet us on my arrival at aswan i heard of the difficulties this agent had thrown in our way but i remonstrated with the aga that he must recollect that it was well understood that i took possession of that obelisk ever since my first voyage and that the money i paid for a guard was given to him by the medium of one of the bashaw's janizaries who was ready to testify the case and that he the aga himself made a contract to receive three hundred piastres thirty dollars on the removal of the obelisk 
he acknowledged all this and said that the other party would have taken the obelisk away several times but they could not succeed and that lately they tried again but the water of the cataract was too low so that they could not effect the passage through for this season this last observation concerned me more than all the rest of his discourse for it was entirely on the possibility of effecting the passage down the cataract this year that depended the success of exporting the obelisk next day the party arrived at aswan and i went to the island of philo to take a view of the bank where i was to embark the obelisk and have it conveyed to the cataract where it was to be launched on my arrival there an old sheik immediately presented to me the following note le chargé d'affaires de m duretti prie m les voyageurs européens de respecter le porteur du présent billet gardant l'obelisque qui est dans la île de philo apprenant à m duretti le philo le twenty second september eighteen eighteen the people of the island then informed me of the means which mr lebulo had taken to persuade them to testify that the obelisk belonged to his party by the date of the note i perceived that this was done only eight days before and as we had been fifteen days on our voyage from thebes to aswan they had time to do all this underhand work at their leisure on my return to aswan i acquainted the consul and mr banks of what passed and suggested to them that the only mode of proceeding was to have an interview with the aga himself and from him to hear who was the first to take possession of the obelisk accordingly the aga was requested to come on board and in the presence of the consul he declared that i was the first person of all who took possession of the obelisk accordingly i set the men to work i procured a boat for that purpose which by chance was in aswan the greatest difficulty was to persuade the rais or captain of the shalal to undertake to launch the boat down the cataract with the obelisk on board the water was very low at that time and what was more against the undertaking of the operation was that the opposite party had applied to him two months before when the water was much higher and he refused on the score that it was not high enough however the promise of a good present and half of the money in his hands mollified the captain and he promised that he would accomplish the undertaking to the aga he made a present of a gold watch worth one hundred and fifty piastres fifteen dollars in the name of mr banks the sheikhs of the maraida and other places round were to be gained to our side that they might provide men to work this was done of course by way of giving a trifle more than the rest of the labourers and promising more if they behaved well i had some little difficulty to procure a few sticks or small poles at aswan as there is no wood in those places except what they procure from cairo merely to repair their boats i had also some difficulty at first in removing the said obelisk from its original station but once put on its way it soon came to the waterside the pedestal was rather more troublesome owing to its square form it was almost buried under the rubbish and as we had no tackle whatsoever and very little wood it retarded the work one or two days longer at this time the aga of aswan came to the island and presented a letter he had received from mr drouetti himself sealed with his own seal which the aga knew well ordering the aga not to permit any one to take away the obelisk the letter was translated by the scotch osman from whom we had no doubt of the correctness of its contents the consul begged the aga to send back his compliments to mr drouetti and to tell him that we were going to remove the obelisk at this time mr bailey mr godfrey and two other gentlemen arrived in the island from their tour through greece and so forth our party prepared for their voyage to the second cataract the obelisk was now ready to be embarked when the following accident happened which was entirely owing to my own neglect by trusting a single maneuver to some who speak more than they can execute i had left the care to others of making a sort of temporary pier of large blocks of stones while i had to go to examine a certain passage in the cataract where the boat was to be taken up empty and launched down when loaded on my return the pier appeared quite strong enough to bear at least forty times the weight it had to support but alas when the obelisk came gradually on from the sloping bank and all the weight rested on it 
the peer with the obelisk and some of the men took a slow movement and majestically descended into the river wishing us a better success i was not three yards off when this happened and for some minutes i must confess i remained as stiff as a post the first thing that came into my head was the loss of such a piece of antiquity the second was the exultation of our opponents after so much questioning as to what party it belonged and lastly the blame of all the antiquarian republic in the world it happens very often that after a vase slips through the hands and breaks on the ground it is by a natural impulse that one turns himself to look at the pieces so did i I fixed my eyes on the place where the pier set off by itself into the Nile, and observed that the stones which were to serve as a foundation on a sloping bank had been only laid on the surface of it, so that naturally the weight of the obelisk must have carried it, or rather pressed, down into the Nile. The obelisk was still peeping a little out of the water. The laborers were of various humors. Some were sorry, not for the obelisk, which was no loss to them, but for the loss of what they might have gained in future operations in passing it down the cataract, and others were laughing, I suppose, at seeing the evident disappointment expressed on my countenance. Some went one way, some another, and I remained alone, seated on the bank, to contemplate the little part which projected out of the water, and the eddies made by the current on that spot in consequence of the obelisk below. The effects of surprise did not last long. I began to reflect, and saw the possibility of taking the obelisk up again unfortunately i had not a single machine to help the undertaking and even our ropes which were of palm leaves were broken and half rotten and scarcely any wood at all suited to employ to that purpose the obelisk is one single piece of granite of twenty-two feet in length and two in breadth at the basis it is not smaller in height than that in st george's fields but of a stone of a much heavier quality i had however in my favor the people who are excellent watermen and who could stay in the water the whole day without the least difficulty having made up my mind to have the obelisk taken up i found that the loss would be only two or three days work accordingly i ordered the men to come the next morning and sent to aswan that evening to fetch some ropes if possible mr banks was not there when this happened as he had crossed the nile that afternoon but the laborers who returned home after the obelisk had fallen in the water informed him of what had happened i believe he was not less displeased than myself when i saw the accident and on his arrival he said that such things would happen sometimes but i saw he was not in a careful humor himself so i informed him that the obelisk was not lost and that in two or three days it would be on board the two next days were employed in this operation which was done as follows i caused a great quantity of stones to be brought to the waterside i then desired several men to enter the water and to make a heap of stones on the side of the obelisk opposite to the shore and to form a solid bed for the levers to rest upon i accordingly placed the levers under the obelisk one at the bases and the other near the leaning point so that by the pressure of the levers the obelisk must turn round upon its axis the men could not put down the lever under water as they do on shore but by seating themselves on the extremity of the levers the pressure of their own weight produced the effect two ropes were passed under the obelisk that end which was from under it was fastened to some date trees which happened to be on the bank and to the ends which came from above i put as many men to pull as i thought were sufficient at the side where the levers were i put some good divers who were ready to put large stones under the obelisk when it rose so that it might not return back to its former situation having set the men at the rope to pull and those of the divers to mount on the extremities of the levers the obelisk rose on the side opposite the bank and when the levers were to be removed the obelisk was propped by stones under it it was risen so that its own weight caused it to move round at each turn of it when we gained nearly the space of its own breadth and so on till it came quite on dry ground which was effected in less than two days the party then set off for the second cataract 
Previous to the taking on board the obelisk, I thought it better to export from the island the pedestal of it, as I could not use the boat for both. I embarked and took it at the Marada in a good situation that it might be easily embarked. At this moment, an agent of Mr. Druetti came to Aswan and put the whole town in an uproar. He brought the Aga to the island of Philo to speak to me, and to persuade me for my best advantage to leave the obelisk there. I asked the Aga what he had to say on this affair, that if he thought proper I should leave the obelisk where it was, ready for embarkation for Mr. Druetti. The Aga, seeing me smile, replied that he had nothing to say on the subject, that Mr. Duetti had written to the Defterdar Bey at Siut, and that the Defterdar Bey had written to him, the Aga, not to meddle with either party. The agent abused the Aga, but to no purpose, as all his proceedings would not interrupt my work. He then attempted to convince the sheikhs that they might stop the men from working, offering to pay them for their loss of time without any trouble. Such offers, made even to the laborers, were rejected by them with disgust. I continued my operation, and put the obelisk on board by means of a bridge of palm trees thrown from across the boat to the land under the obelisk, which was now turned on the bridge and entered on board. When in the center of the boat I removed the trees from under it, and no sooner was this done than we set off with the obelisk for the Marada, to have it ready to be launched down the cataract on the next morning. The rice of the shalal, or cataract, continued firm on my side, and I continued to keep him so. He had half of the money. He now came to receive the other half previous to his undertaking. I did not think it prudent to disappoint him in his expectation, so I paid him the other half, which was twenty-five dollars, on condition that he would make a promise, before two of my people, to maintain his word, and on the contrary, if he failed, that I should appeal to Muhammad Ali, the Bashaw at Cairo." He was satisfied, and having made the arrangement for the number of men who were to be employed the next day, he set off on his business. On the same evening I took a walk among the granite rocks of the cataract where we had to pass. The next day an object of attention came in my way, which I often thought to speak of. There were many of these rocks with hieroglyphics and figures cut on them, which evidently were done only by scholars, who perhaps were practicing the science of sculpture on those masses. The observation I made was that a calculation of ages might be made by the various colors which the rocks have taken from their original and from the time it has been cut. For instance, we have to suppose that when nature first formed the mass of granite, it was as white as it may be seen now when newly cut. We next must fix on an epoch for the time when the hieroglyphics on these rocks were engraved, and by that we may calculate the degree of the three colors which are in view. For instance, the part which has never been touched is dark brown. That which has been cut, supposed about three thousand years ago, is light brown, and some sculptured in later ages is still lighter. That which has been cut only one hour before may be supposed to be as it was on the day of its creation as above. So, by the proportion of the various colors on the rocks, a calculation of the age may be formed, and by that means we may found the age of the creation." I beg my readers to pardon my thus speculating on a point which, in my humble capacity, can afford but little instruction. However, as the idea struck me, I lay it before the public. Next morning all was ready for the dangerous operation of passing the cataract with the obelisk. I have mentioned before that this is the greatest fall, or rather descent, of water in the cataract. When the inundation is half high in the Nile, it is a column of water of about 300 yards in length, which falls in an angle of 20 and 25 degrees among rocks and stones, which project out in various directions. The boat was brought to the margin of the cascade. A strong rope, or rather a small cable, was attached to a large tree, the end of which was passed through the beams of the boat, so as to be slackened or stopped at pleasure. 
in the boat there were only five men and on the rocks on each side of the cascade a number of others in various places with ropes attached to the boat so as to put it either on one side or the other as it required to prevent its running against the stones for if it should be touched in the smallest degree with such a weight on board and in such a rapid stream the boat could not escape being dashed to pieces the cable which i borrowed from a merchant boat in aswan was pretty strong but not sufficient to stop the boat in its course in case it should be in danger of running against a rock it was only sufficient to check its course down nor could the boat have been stopped in such a situation for in that case the water would run over the boat and sink it instantly under these circumstances all depended on the dexterity of the men who were posted in various parts to pull or slacken according as necessity required i did not fail to use all the persuasion possible and promises of backsheesh to the wild people as they are called but who on this occasion were as steady as so many pilots the rise of whom i had hired the boat was almost out of his senses thinking it would be certainly lost the poor fellow had engaged his vessel merely because it happened that his trade failed, and he was in Aswan for some time without hope of getting a cargo, and had incurred debts which confined him there, and he would have been glad of any freight to get out, but when he saw the danger his boat was in, he cried like a child, and begged I would relinquish my project and return his boat safe to him but when he saw the vessel on the point of being launched he threw himself with his face to the ground and did not rise till all was out of danger having seen that all was ready i gave the signal to slacken the cable it was one of the greatest sights i have seen the boat took a course which may be reckoned at the rate of twelve miles an hour accordingly the men on land slackened the rope and at the distance of one hundred yards the boat came in contact with an eddy which beating against a rock returned towards the vessel and then helped much to stop its course the men on the side pulled the boat out of the direction of that rock and it continued its course gradually diminishing its rate till it reached the bottom of the cataract and i was not a little pleased to see it out of danger the laborers altogether seemed pleased at the good success of the attempt even independently i believe of the interest they might derive from it and it is not very often that such feelings enter the bosoms of these people the rise of the boat came to me with joy expressed in his countenance as may be easily imagined having set all to rights to pass the other parts of the cataract i went on board and we continued the course of the current we had only two or three places of little danger to pass but thank god we arrived safe at aswan on the same day i beg it to be observed that this is not the passage where small boats are taken up or down the cataract for there are other smaller columns of water which are deep enough to float small boats but not such as that one with the obelisk End of part twenty two part twenty three of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty three account of the taking the obelisk from the island of philo to alexandria part two immediately after my arrival there i prepared to depart for thebes and having satisfied the aga according to our promise i departed Previous to my arrival there, I quitted the boat, as the wind was against us, and went by land. I took up my old residence at the tombs in Biban el Maluk. There I found Mrs. Belzoni, who had returned from Jerusalem, as I had written to her, that I could not go into Syria. It was then Christmas, and we passed the solemnity of that blessed day in the solitude of those recesses undisturbed by the folly of mankind, and only a few inoffensive Arabs who guarded the new tombs were there, but it was not to last long so. I must now enter into new contests with evil beings, and in spite of all the study I made to avoid bringing before the public the foul deeds of malice, I find that I cannot avoid inserting them in this volume. 
the following circumstances have induced me to quit egypt and any one who will kindly read and attend to the catastrophe will agree with me in saying that it was high time to do so it happened at this period that a certain person whose name for compassion's sake i do not wish to mention but who was neither english nor french came into upper egypt not to see antiquities but to purchase some if he could he came from one of the capitals of europe and was to return he offered to do anything for me in europe if i wished he was on friendly terms and i believe sincere till the diabolical spirit of interest got into his breast and then he suffered himself to be led by it as i happened to know him before i took the opportunity of his return to that very place where i was in want of a person to transact some business for me the business was that as he was on his return to europe he would take four of the sphinxes or lion-headed statues which were allotted me for my share to the very metropolis where he was going and there make an offer as a present to a certain high personage in my name which he undertook to do with great pleasure and it was so arranged that i should give him an order on the british consul in alexandria to receive the aforesaid statues which were lodged in the charge of the british agent in rosetta it happened that at the same time this man became acquainted with the people of our opposite party and as he must come in in the following account i shall call him the stranger on the eve of christmas the boat with the obelisk on board arrived and stopped at luxor waiting for a few small articles to be loaded and then to proceed to rosetta it will be recollected that previous to our last departure for the cataract i entered into an arrangement with mr salt settling where i was to excavate on several spots among the ruins of karnak on st stephen's day i passed the nile to that place with the intention of examining the spots of ground which were allotted to our party according to the arrangement made by messrs salt and druetti at luxor i was mounted on a very high donkey the only mode of travelling short journeys in these countries as horses are scarce and it is too inconvenient to mount a camel for a small distance i was followed by my greek servant and two arabian drivers i was unarmed my servant had two pistols as usual our opponents with their commander mr druetti were lodged in some mud houses among the ruins of karnak the boat with the obelisk which i had just brought down and put up at luxor was rather too close under their noses as they expressed themselves and it irritated them to such a degree that they premeditated the mode of revenge by as they said only abusing and insulting belzoni but this could not have been done without some danger of retaliation and perhaps with interest equivalent to the merit of the operation the only way this was to be done was by taking the advantage of a pretext and by raising some differences against me in some way or other the plan was well laid the first piece of ground i had to examine among these ruins was occupied by the labourers of mr Duetti consequently it was expected that i should take notice of it that some altercation would ensue and then would be the time to satiate their revenge previous to my arrival at the above ground i was warned by an arab not to go where the other europeans were but i took no notice of what he said as sometimes those people make much out of nothing i continued my route till i arrived on the above ground and the first thing i saw was a number of men working on a spot too well known to be of our lot according to the arrangement i then perceived what these gentlemen wanted so i took no notice and actually passed on without stopping to look at them none of the europeans were there and my servant observing to me that the ground was of our share i told him not to meddle himself about it and we passed on the above working ground was close to the small lakes, and these gentlemen were living in the window of the great Propylion, which is at least a good quarter of a mile distant from the above ground. We passed quietly before them and continued on our way straight to the north side of the ruins as far as their extremity, another quarter of a mile from where they were. 
i remained some time there in examining some grounds and on my return towards the great propylion where we had to pass on our return to luxor we met an arab running towards us crying from having received a severe beating from our opponents merely because he served and was faithful to us as far as an arab can be this would have been another motive to create some altercation but it had no effect i took no notice of it and was going on straight to luxor i was at about three hundred yards from the great propylion when i saw a group of people running towards us they were about thirty arabs headed by two europeans agents of mr duetti on their approaching mr lebulo was first and the renegado rosignano second both piedmontese and countrymen of mr duetti lebulo began his address to me by asking what business i had to take away an obelisk that did not belong to me and that i had done so many things of this kind to him that i should not do any more meanwhile he seized the bridle of my donkey with one hand and with the other he laid hold of my waistcoat and stopped me from proceeding any farther he had also a large stick hung to his wrist by a string by this time my servant was assailed by a number of arabs two of whom were constantly in the service of mr duetti at the same moment the renegado rosignano reached within four yards of me and with all the rage of a ruffian levelled a double-barrelled gun at my breast loading me with all the imprecations that a villain could invent by this time my servant was disarmed and overpowered by numbers and in spite of his efforts took his pistols from his belt the two gallant knights before me i mean lebulo and rosignano escorted by the two other arab servants of mr duetti both armed with pistols and many others armed with sticks continued their clamorous imprecations against me and the brave rosignano still keeping the gun pointed at my breast said that it was time that i should pay for all i had done to them the courageous abilo said with all the emphasis of an enraged man that he was to have one-third of the profit derived from the selling of that obelisk when in europe according to a promise from mr duetti had i not stolen it from the island of philo my situation was not pleasant surrounded by a band of ruffians like those and i have no doubt that if i had attempted to dismount the cowards would have dispatched me on the ground and said that they did it in defence of their lives as i had been the aggressor i thought the best way was to keep on my donkey and look at the villains with contempt Lebulo said that another of their party had been drowned at Girgay on board of an English boat, and that they had no redress for it, meaning, I suppose, the poor man that fell overboard at Girgay on his passage to Cairo. I told Lebulo to let me proceed on my way, and that if I had done anything wrong, I should be ready to account for it. But all was to no purpose. Their rage had blinded them out of their senses." while this was going on i observed another band of arabs running towards us when they came nearer i saw mr duetti himself among them and close to him a servant of his armed with pistols on his arrival before me mr duetti demanded in a tone not inferior to that of his disciples what reason or authority i had to stop his people from working i told him that i knew nothing of what he meant and that i found myself extremely ill-used by his own people and that he must answer for their conduct in an authoritative tone he desired i should dismount which i refused to do at this moment a pistol was fired behind me but i could not tell by whom i was determined to bear much sooner than come to blows with such people who did not blush to assail me all in a mass but when i heard the pistol fired behind my back I thought it was high time to sell my life as dear as I could. I dismounted, but then the kind Mr. Duetti assured me that I was not in danger while he was there, and Mr. Lebulo, who had before acted the part of a ruffian, now contrived to play that of a neutral gentleman. By this time many other Arabs of the village of Karnak had reached this place, and seeing me thus surrounded, would any one suppose it, for the honour of Christendom and civilization, those wild Arabs, as we call them, were disgusted at the conduct of Europeans, and interfered in my behalf. They surrounded the renegado Rosignano, whose conduct they thought most outrageous and base, not for a European, but even for the worst of Arabs. 
what ideas must have been formed in the minds of those people of the civilization of europe by the conduct of such villains i was now informed that an european stranger was in the place of residence of mr duetti i sent an arab to beg he would come where we were as i thought i might have a witness to what might afterwards take place though the affray was almost over mr drouetti who was now very mild said that he never had given any order to his people to work on any grounds belonging to us that i should have made application to him and he would have put them right but that i should not stop the people from their work i repeated that i did not know what he meant and that all this was a combination of traps put together by his agents he said that an arab came to his lodging and informed him that i ordered the people away from their work i persisted that the arab should be brought before me but he was not to be found he was called everywhere but did not answer one of the two arabs from gournou who followed me as a driver recognized the said arab who all this time was close to mr drouetti who had called to him in vain and who though he had seen him a few minutes before did not recognize him again being before me i stared in the man's face and ordered him to repeat what he had said of me to mr drouetti he replied that he did not say to mr drouetti that i stopped the men from working but that my servant did though i was totally confident of the contrary as he was not two yards from me when we passed that way it was useless for me to contest that point as i saw it was brought forward merely to cover the true cause for which they attacked me which was shown by their first words to me about the obelisk i insisted that mr drouetti should come where the men were at work that i might point out to him that his people were the aggressors by encroaching on our lot of ground of which he was forcibly convinced as we went on the assailant rossignano continued at a distance behind me the stranger arrived where i was and proved to be the person alluded to before by whom i had to send the four statues to europe on his arrival i informed him of what had passed but mr drouetti told him that we had only had a few words and that was all the stranger observed to him that he saw those people take up arms while he was in their house or habitation and run out and remembered mr drouetti himself said he must run after them for fear they should do some mischief and that they did wrong to act so to which mr drouetti replied that he could not help what these people did to which observation the stranger replied that he should not keep them in his service mr drouetti made a long lamentation on the taking away the obelisk i reminded him that he must have known it was taken possession of long before any of his agents reached the island of philo and that he did wrong to send his agents to that place to prevent my taking it after he knew we had set off for that purpose he said this was owing to mr banks not calling on him previous to his departure for that place and conversing with him on the subject the fact is that mr banks did not think proper to put himself under any unnecessary obligation to mr drouetti i then informed mr drouetti that i had resisted many and various sorts of attacks by his agents but i did not expect they would come to such a pitch and that it was high time for me to quit the country so i returned to biban el malouk and immediately commenced my preparations to depart for europe as i could not live any longer in a country where i had become the object of revenge of a set of people who could take the basest means to accomplish their purpose and notwithstanding the advantages i might have derived in the continuation of my researches the conditions of which with the consul were now more advantageous to me than any i had hitherto obtained i was so totally disgusted that i took the above resolution accordingly i had written the particulars of what had happened to the consul adding that by the time he received my letter i should be on my way to alexandria as i was determined to proceed to europe by the first opportunity as to my redress i did not ask for it as i could not expect to have any in that country and as the boat with the obelisk was not set off i availed myself of the opportunity of descending the nile on it having finished all the modelled drawings etc of the tombs and put on board all that i had accumulated on my own account i began the operation of taking the sarcophagus out of the tombs i must lament the unfortunate fate of some of the figures within this place 
it will be recollected as i mentioned before that the entrance into the tombs was situated under a small torrent of water which when it happened to rain runs over into the valley i was then making a canal to turn the course of the water that it might not run into the tomb in case of rain but on the arrival of the consul all was put an end to the consequence was that while i was absent up the nile it happened to rain the water finding the entrance open ran into the tomb and though not much was enough to occasion some damage to some of the figures the dryness of the calcareous stone which is more like lime itself than raw stone absorbed the dampness and consequently cracked in many places particularly in the angles of the pillars on the doorways and so forth and in one of the rooms there was a piece of stone detached containing the upper part of three figures and in another chamber was a figure which fortunately fell without much injury though broken in three pieces i saved it from farther destruction i was not a little vexed to see such a thing happen the damage done at that time was inconsiderable in a place of such an extent but i fear that in the course of a few years it will become much worse and i am persuaded that the damp in the rainy days has caused as much damage in the tombs as has been occasioned in any other way it is worthy of observation that the atmosphere must be much changed since the time of herodotus when he mentions a circumstance of some rain having fallen in thebes as an extraordinary case or a phenomenon for at present it rains in thebes every year i do not mean to say that it rains in a manner similar to what we are accustomed to in europe but enough to say it does rain for instance two or three days in the winter and in these two or three days perhaps only half an hour at a time it appears also that at moments the water drops are pretty large and wet the traveller who not being prepared feels it strange to be thus served but the great body of water as i mentioned before comes from the desert through the valleys into the nile it is curious also to remark the great difference in the climates only in the short distance of little more than two hundred miles to the south of thebes where it very seldom rains indeed some years pass without any and it is owing to this circumstance with the combination of this place being under the tropic of cancer that it may be calculated to be the driest and hottest spot on earth i mean that tract of land which extends from the first to the second cataract of the nile named lower nubia it includes the tropic of cancer consequently these countries receive greater heat from the sun than any other on this side of the equinoctial line as it passes vertically over it twice in the course of a few days at the time of the solstice this circumstance united with the phenomenon that it never rains for it never can be said to do so unless a few drops perhaps in the course of five years or more can be reckoned as rain cause the rocks to be so perpetually hot that the heat rises in higher degree than any other part on earth it will be recollected as i mentioned before that in the beginning of june in the island of philo we had the thermometer at a hundred and twenty four degrees of fahrenheit in the shade but it is to be observed that the thermometer did not show us to what degree the heat arose as it only marked a hundred and twenty four degrees consequently the mercury might mount higher if the glass had permitted but now to our departure from thebes having put all things in readiness and all the models of the tombs being embarked i took out the celebrated sarcophagus which gave me something to do in consequence of its being so very slender and thin lest it might break at the smallest touch of anything however it was safely got out of the tomb and put in a strong case the valley it had to pass to reach the nile is rather uneven for more than two miles and one mile of good soft sand and small pebbles i had it conveyed on rollers all the way and safely put on board by this time mr wright and mr fisher arrived in thebes on their return from nubia i had the pleasure to walk over the remains of old thebes with these gentlemen and i must confess that i felt no small degree of sorrow to quit a place which was become so familiar to me and where in no other part of the world i could find so many objects of inquiry so congenial to my inclination 
i must say that i felt more in leaving thebes than any other place in my life it was on the twenty seventh of january eighteen nineteen when we left these truly magnificent ruins and we arrived in cairo on the eighteenth of february after passing benizoff we saw a small boat and by its appearance concluded there must be some europeans in it they called to us as they too saw we were europeans we went to shore it was mr fuller who ascended the nile a gentleman of most excellent good manners and whom i had the pleasure to know after in cairo he was accompanied by a person who ascended the nile to distribute the arabic bibles for the society it was pity that he was not well informed of some particular places in egypt and in the province of Fanum, where many christian copts are residing and would have been happy to have had a bible amongst them in the above boat i saw a person of a strange appearance which caused my inquiring who he was i was agreeably surprised when i found him to be mr pierce who resided in abyssinia for several years and was left there by lord valentia now the earl of montnorris our acquaintance was soon made but i was sorry i should have met him on such an occasion as we could be together but so short a time to the inquiries i wished to make of him concerning those countries he answered in a manner that convinced me he was an enterprising man much accustomed to fatigue the life and hardships he underwent in abyssinia would be most interesting to the public at cairo we only stopped a few days and continued our journey to rosetta there we landed the various pieces of antiquity the obelisk the sarcophagus found in one of the king's tombs and the cover of another sarcophagus which is the best piece i accumulated on my own account it had been thrown from its sarcophagus when it was forced open and being reversed it remained buried by the stones and unnoticed by any visitor i cleared off all the stones and on examination of the under part found that it was a fine figure larger than life in alto relievo and except the foot all the rest was quite perfect on turning the stone i found that besides the said figure which is in the center of the cover there were two others at each side in basso relievo and also excepting the feet are quite perfect its preservation is owing to its being reversed having re-embarked all those articles again on board of a jam we came to alexandria with a firm intention to set off with the first opportunity for though i felt much regret in quitting the very country in which i wished to remain undisturbed a little longer yet under the circumstance of such a persecution i could not help hastening my departure but the time was not yet arrived at alexandria i found letters from the consul and from mr banks in answer to mine from baban el maluk the letters had been sent by an arab as far as cairo and from thence to alexandria the consul advised me to stop till i could receive a certain answer from england and to have redress of the outrageous behaviour of those gentry this was the last thing that i could wish for for i knew enough of the country to know how that affair would end i knew the influence of their master who i was certain would do all in his power to prevent any justice being done so i did not find my inclination to remain particularly as it happened to be the time of the plague but mr lee the vice-consul in alexandria acquainted me that he had already made a deposition of the deeds in thebes and presented to the french consul mr roussel i was glad to see that my cause had been taken up but i was in very little hopes to have any redress as no such a thing ever happened in those countries in particular against such people mr drouetti who was by this time in alexandria took to himself the defence of his agents and made a protest against mr salt the british consul who he said was his accuser and it was agreed that the matter should be left alone till mr salt's return from upper egypt so my departure was postponed till that period at this time i had the pleasure of becoming more acquainted with mr briggs a gentleman who was on the eve of setting off for europe 
he was the person who suggested to the bashaw of egypt to cut the canal from fua to alexandria to facilitate the exportation of the products of the country on board of the european vessels in the harbours which sometimes were obliged to wait six months for their cargoes owing to the difficulty of passing the bogazo or bar that crosses the mouth of the river and often kept the gems loaded for three months without effecting the passage this cut is forty miles in length and cost above three hundred thousand pounds to finish it but it is a great accommodation in the exportation and of course useful to the commerce of egypt in general before this time the stranger to whom i have before alluded had arrived in alexandria and was quite changed in his conduct as a witness he had already signed his name to a deposition written by le Bulo himself which of course was not against the party and when he was called to give evidence had forgotten that he saw those people take up arms and run towards the spot where i was whatever points or words i could clearly put in remembrance and repeat to him he had forgotten all and did not scruple to say before the consul mr lee that if i had been the first to apply to him or to make my own deposition he would have signed his name for me as he did for the other people now having proved him contradictory to his deposition he came into the office of the consul and with the greatest indifference actually made a deposition to contradict what he had asserted in favour of the assailants he had stated previously that he was present at the dispute or altercation as the gentlemen of our opponent's party would have it called but he now said that he only heard by mr duetti and his agents that an altercation of words had taken place such were the preparations for this defence and now to end the affair with the stranger no sooner did he communicate to my opponents the intention i had to make an offer of the four statues above mentioned as a present to a certain court of europe than they immediately entered into a league with each other and everything was carried on in great secrecy some statues of their own were put on board a vessel for europe and a collection of antiquities was made up to be offered for sale to the above court and this was to be done previous to my offer being made and when i thought my statues were to be embarked and conveyed to europe to be presented as above i found that the stranger had set off with what he had procured from my opponents leaving me and my statues to learn how to know him better i do not mean to blame any one for endeavouring to do anything to their advantage so that it is done in an honourable manner but i cannot help observing that whatever speculation he could have made with what he has brought into europe for our opponents was obtained by a very wrong proceeding seeing that some time would elapse before the consul returned i did not know how to employ myself in the interval i thought of making some researches in lower egypt but i doubted not i should encounter some difficulty there also as the fountain-head of our opponent was not far off but idle i could not stay for a long time i had a wish to make a small excursion into the western desert i had observed that the temple of jupiter ammon had been an object of search for a long time and by more than one traveller but that the true spot where it existed had not been fixed i considered that the fayum was a province as yet little explored and that i might make an excursion in it perhaps undisturbed and from thence proceed to the western desert i should have no difficulty in obtaining a firman but as i could not have it without letting every one know where i was going i preferred to go without as i hoped to make my way in some manner or other an english merchant who resided in alexandria lent me a small house in rosetta near the british agency where i left mrs belzoni accordingly i took a small boat and set off for the fayum end of part twenty three part twenty four of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty four journey to the oasis of ammon part one i left rosetta on the twentieth and arrived at benezuf on the twenty ninth of april eighteen nineteen 
i took with me a sicilian servant whom i hired in alexandria as my irish lad had taken the opportunity of returning to england from jerusalem with mr legg i took with me also a moorish hajj who was on his return from mecca and begged to be taken on board our boat at Gien. i thought as he was a hajj or pilgrim his company would be of some service to me and he proved very useful at benezov we procured some donkeys to take us and a little provision as far as the lake morris on the twenty ninth we set off and directed our course through a vast plain of cultivated land of corn and other products of the country this plain is all under water at the time of the inundation excepting the scattered villages which stand elevated and appear like so many islands during that time about fifteen miles from the nile the chain of mountains on the west are but low they open and form a valley into the fayum and it was at this entrance that we arrived on the first night of our journey the bar yusuf passes into the centre of this valley and enters in various serpentine directions into the fayum we took our station under some date trees near the water about two miles from the first pyramid here after a slight repast i went to sleep on my usual bed a mattress thin enough to serve as a saddle when folded up but when laid on a mat or on the ground affording as good a bed as any traveller ought to expect the sicilian servant the moorish hajj and the donkey drivers kept watch in their turn and i arranged so that this system should be observed during the whole of our journey on the thirtieth we set off before sunrise and soon arrived at the pyramid it is composed of sunburnt bricks and stands on a high ground at the foot of the hill on the northern side of the valley its basis is covered round with sand and stones out of which it arises sixty feet but its original height must have been above seventy as the top has been thrown down the basis above the sand is eighty feet i observed several large blocks of stone intermixed with brickwork so disposed as to support and strengthen the whole of the mass the bricks are twelve fourteen and sixteen inches long and five or six inches wide i ascended the pyramid and from the top could see the whole valley and the entrance into the fayum on the west at only two hours walk distance i could see the other pyramid situated on a lower ground consequently it appeared less high further to the west i saw medinet el fayum which stands on the ruins of ancient arsinoe and has a respectable appearance at a distance from this pyramid i descended towards the canal again and crossed a strong bridge on the west side of the valley we then continued along the foot of these hills till we reached the other pyramid we forded the river on donkeys to come to the west and pass over another branch of the same river which was nearly dried up at that season we entered a place six hundred feet square surrounded by high earthen dikes apparently to protect the above ground from the inundation of the canal this spot had no doubt been the seat of some ancient town of which nothing remained but a few blocks of stone and the appearance of some brickwork we advanced towards the pyramid and after passing a small canal which had been cut by some of the late rulers of egypt came to the foot of the pyramid i found that the basis of it is only thirty feet above the level of the water of the canal and nearly of the same size as the first it is surrounded by smaller tombs and on the south side there are the remains of an egyptian temple which must have been most magnificent of this there are to be seen only some fragments of the colors of granite and i must observe that it is the only column of that stone i had seen anywhere and that in all the temples known in the valley of the nile there are none that can boast of such grandeur there are several tombs quite in the egyptian style cut underground we quitted this place and arrived at medinet el fayum on the same evening the whole country is very fertile and interspersed with plantations of fruit trees and roses this place is celebrated for making rose water which is sold in cairo and all over egypt for the use of the great people who continually keep their divans and other places sprinkled with it and present it also to any stranger who visits them on our approaching the town i agreed to call at the house of Husef bey the governor of the province of fayum but found he was gone to cairo 
However, on application to his Kakia Bay, I obtained a firman and a guide, which was all I wanted, and was also accommodated with a lodging in one of the rooms of the house. On the morning of the 31st, a soldier was given to me as a guide to the Lake Morris. I set off the same day by the road leading to the northward, and passed the extensive ruins of Arsinoe, which I reserved for inspection till my return, as I intended to come back by the same route. The country continued very fine and well cultivated. At noon we arrived at El Kassar, the ruins of an ancient temple and site of a town, where nothing remained but part of the walls. The temple was not very extensive, as may be seen by what is left of the foundation, and two parts of the wall, the only remains of which are composed of large blocks of stone without hieroglyphics. At night we arrived at Senures, a village situated about ten miles from Lake Morris. On the morning of the 1st of May, we proceeded on our journey, and after passing several groves of palm trees and other plantations, as before, the view opened all at once on a wild country, which gradually sloped to the edge of the lake. The water extended from northeast to southwest, and the mountains opposite formed an awful and sterile appearance. At noon we reached the lake, but could observe no trace of any living being. The guide conducted us along the shore, till we arrived at a small habitation, or rather a fisherman's hut, situated near the place where the canal, or Bahar Yusuf, discharges into the lake, where only a small rotten boat was seen. The hut was inhabited by a few fishermen and a soldier, who formerly received the duties on the fish they caught, but now the fishermen have only a share of the fish they catch, and the remainder is sold at Medinet al Fayum, of which the bashaw receives the profit. Our guide bespoke a boat, which was sent for at some distance up the canal, and when it had arrived I never saw anything that could be better compared to Old Baris or a boat of Sharon. It was entirely out of shape. The outer shell or hulk was composed of rough pieces of wood scarcely joined and fastened by four other pieces wrapped together by four more across which formed the deck. No tar, no pitch, either inside or out, and the only preventive against the water coming in was a kind of weed moistened which had settled in the joints of the wood. Having made an agreement with the owner of the boat, who might have been named Old Sharon himself, we put on board some provisions and made towards the west, where the famous labyrinth is supposed to have been situated. The water of the lake was good enough to drink, but a little saltish. It was only this year that it could be tasted at all, owing to the extraordinary overflow of the Nile, which surmounted all the high lands, and in addition to the Bar Yosef, came in such torrents into the lake that it raised the water twelve feet higher than ever it had been remembered by the oldest fishermen among them. We advanced with old Baris, or Charon's boat, towards the west, and at sunset saw the shore quite deserted, and nothing to look at but the lake and the mountains on the north side of it. Old Sharon, the pilot, lighted a fire, while the others went to fish with a net, and soon returned with a supper of fish. The land we were now in had anciently been cultivated, as there appeared many stumps of palm and other trees nearly petrified. I also observed the vine in great plenty. The scene here was beautiful, the silence of the night, the beams of the radiant moon shining on the still water of the lake, the solitude of the place, the side of our boat, a group of fishermen, the temple which bears the name of old Charon, a little way off, put me in mind of the lake Asheron and the boat Baris, and the old ferryman of the Styx. I perceived this was the very spot where the poets originated the fable of the passage of the souls over the river of oblivion. Nothing could be more pleasing to my imagination than being so near the Elysium, perhaps on the very Elysium itself. I thought that the plants which appeared nearly petrified have been the very ones when the souls were enjoying the happiness of their purity. I was thus strolling along the banks of the lake in solitary musings, not unlike one of these wandering souls waiting its turn to cross the sticks, while my old Charon with his semi-demons were preparing supper. 
i wish that i had been a poet that i might sing in verse the beautiful ideas and sensations i felt on that occasion i thought that night one of the happiest in my life and myself out of the reach of evil mortals happy in the elysian fields i feared not the malice and treacherous arts of envy jealousy spite revenge nor the thousand other snares of man i nearly forgot i was living and i suppose that had i continued in my ecstasy i should have verified that these waters had the power of oblivion on the second before sunrise we entered the old baris and steered towards the west till we arrived near the end of the lake which according to these fishermen extended further this year than ever they remembered it in consequence of the above extraordinary inundation we landed here and i took two of the boatmen and set off for the temple named kassar el haron about three miles from the lake standing in the midst of the ruins of a town of which there is still a track of the wall to be seen and the foundations of several houses and other small temples there are fragments of columns and blocks of stone of a middling size the temple is in pretty good preservation excepting in the upper part it is of a singular construction and differs somewhat from the egyptian but i believe it has been altered or rather rebuilt and divided into various small apartments as may be seen in the plan plate number thirty two there are no hieroglyphics either inside or out and only two figures on the wall of the western side of the upper apartments one of which i took for osiris and the other for jupiter ammon in the front of this temple there is a semicircular pilaster at each side of the door and two pilasters attached to the wall but the exterior workmanship is evidently of a later date than the temple part of the town is covered with sand on the east side of it there is something like a gateway in an octangular form and at a little distance there is a greek chapel elevated on a platform with cellars under it after having taken a proper view of the temple and of the town i went to see the small greek chapel accompanied by the two boatmen and as there was no appearance of any danger i left my gun and pistols in the temple but had nearly suffered for my temerity for just as i was mounting the few steps that led to the platform of the small chapel a large hyena rushed from the apartments beneath the chapel and had i not been on the first step it could not have avoided attacking me as there was no other way by which it could come out the animal stopped three or four yards from me and then turned round as if determined to attack me but it appeared on second thoughts to have relinquished its intent and after having shown me its pretty teeth gave a hideous roar and set off galloping as fast as it could at the moment i regretted i had no arms with me but was happy to see it gone i attributed its flight to the noise made by the two boatmen who being near me thought the hyena would swallow them alive this little chapel was evidently built in a later age than the rest of those works of which but very little now remain on the west of the temple there are parts of other gates connected with the wall i observed several pieces of marble and white granite the granite has given me reason to think that there must have been some building of considerable importance in the town for they must have had more trouble to convey it hence than to any other place in egypt in consequence of the distance but whatever remains of beauty might be seen in this town it does not appear that this was the place of the famous labyrinth nor anything like it for according to herodotus pliny and so forth there is not the smallest appearance which can warrant the supposition that any such edifice was there the labyrinth was a building of three thousand chambers one half above and one half below the construction of such an immense edifice and the enormous quantity of materials which must have been accumulated would have yet left specimens enough to have seen where it had been erected but not the smallest trace of any such thing is anywhere to be seen the town was about a mile in circumference with the temple at its centre so that i could not see how the labyrinth could be placed in this situation i accordingly left the place and on my return towards the lake passed a tract of land which had once been cultivated and saw a great many stumps of plants almost burnt on my arrival at the lake a high wind arose from the southwest which swelled the lake very much drifted the sand in the air and drove our boat on shore 
at the above place we gathered plenty of wood made a fire and passed the night under shelter of a mat hung over two sticks planted in the ground before morning of the third the wind ceased and the lake soon became smooth we re-embarked and shaped our course towards the north side coastwise the whole day at the foot of the mountain which bounds the lake on that side i perceived nothing worthy of remark there are a few spots near the water's edge where great quantities of weeds grow from under the water and great quantities of game are always found among these plants the pelican is as common on this lake as it is on the nile there are many wild ducks and a kind of large snipe towards evening we arrived at the shore opposite to where we embarked and the boatmen made up their minds to cross the lake the next morning and take us back to our former place of embarkation but as i recollected that in some of the descriptions of that lake i had seen a town marked not far from the spot where we then were on the morning of the fourth instead of going on board i took my route towards the mountains the soldier and the boatman ran after me to persuade me there was nothing to be seen there but i told them i must ascend the mountains to see the lake and the whole country round one of them happened to say unguardedly that there was nothing to be seen except a few houses in ruins and a high wall that was enough for me and having secured the man by promises and threats i insisted that he should show me the above place I accordingly set off with my whole crew, and had scarcely reached the summit of the lower range of the mountains, when I perceived the ruins of a town not far distant. On my arrival I found it to be a Greek town, vide plate 23, and it cannot be any other than the city of Bacchus, which I have observed in some of the maps of ancient authors. There are a great number of houses half tumbled down, and a high wall of sunburnt bricks, which encloses the ruins of a temple the houses are not united nor built in any regularity as streets but only divided by narrow lanes not more than three or four feet wide and all built of sunburnt bricks there is a causeway or road made of large stones which runs through the town to the temple which faces the south in the center of the city i observed several houses or rather cellars underground as they appeared from their tops which were covered with strong pieces of wood over which there were some cane and then above that a layer of bricks on a level with the surface so that one might walk over without perceiving that he was treading on the top of a house as the fishermen had brought their hatchets i caused two or three of these houses to be uncovered after removing the layer of bricks we found a layer of clay then a layer of canes which were nearly burnt and lastly under the canes some rafters of wood forming the ceiling the wood was in good preservation and of a hard quality the inside of the hut or cellar was filled up with rubbish but they had evidently been habitations as we saw a fireplace in every one of them they were not more than ten or twelve feet square and the communication to each house was by a narrow lane not more than three feet wide which was also covered i cannot conceive the reason why these people lived in such places certain it is that they did not live there to be out of the heat on the contrary they must have had all the force of the sun shining upon them without the slightest chance of a breath of wind the houses above ground were constructed in a manner somewhat different from any i had seen before there were few which had a second floor and those which were higher than the rest were very narrow so that they were more like the form of towers than common houses but now there is scarcely one to be seen entire as to the temple it has fallen but appears to have been pretty extensive the blocks of stone are of the largest size some eight and nine feet long the ruins are in such confusion that it is impossible to form an idea of its plan or foundation i am almost certain by what i could see that the falling of this temple was caused by violence as it appears to me that it never could have been so dilapidated by the slow hand of time among these blocks i saw the fragments of statues of brechia and other stones of grecian sculpture but no granite and i observed the fragment of one which appeared to me not unlike part of an apollo 
there were also fragments of lions of grey stone not belonging to these mountains the town from what i could see might have consisted of five hundred houses the largest of which was not more than forty feet square the area of the wall which surrounds the temple is a hundred and fifty feet square thirty feet high and eight feet thick on the north side of this town is a valley which appears to have been once cultivated but at present is covered with sand on inquiry i found this town was known to the arabs of the lake under the name of Denay. we returned to the boat and crossed to the island of el hir which is entirely barren and no trace of any habitation anywhere to be seen we then crossed the lake to the east and saw several fragments of pillars and ruins nearly under water and arrived in the evening at the same shore where we embarked i took up my station for the night to the eastward of the small hut and made an excellent supper of fresh fish and a piece of pelican the soldier who lived there happened to kill one of these birds which was devoured by the fisherman as soon as it was boiled its flesh is not unlike mutton in substance and appearance but it tasted much like game and was upon the whole very tender and pleasant to the palate it must have weighed at least forty pounds the fat was rancid and as yellow as saffron on the morning of the fifth i took the road on the west side of the lake and saw the site of another town named el haman of which nothing now remains but scattered pieces of brick and part of a bath this place is situated full forty feet above the lake and the ground all round was covered with small shells such as cockles small conchilis and others not unlike periwinkles we returned afterwards on the east on the same day and passed several ancient villages built of sunburnt bricks at a place named tirza i observed several blocks of white stone and red granite which evidently must have been taken from edifices of greater magnitude than what had ever stood there reflecting on the description of pliny of the situation of the labyrinth which he says was on the west side of the lake morris i made diligent researches on that subject in particular on the ground where i then stood i could not see the smallest appearance of an edifice either on the ground or any appearance from under it but i observed all through that part of the country a great number of stones and columns of beautiful colours of white marble and of granite i saw the above pieces of antiquity scattered about for the space of several miles some on the road and some in the houses of the arabs and others put to various uses in the erection of huts and so forth i have no doubt that by tracing the source of these materials the seat of the labyrinth could be discovered which must be most magnificent even in its ruined state but i fear it is rather too late for such researches for the cause of its disappearing might be that it was not an edifice of great height and the lower apartments being underground it may have been buried by the earth which is yearly brought there by the water of the nile or it is not impossible that the labyrinth stood in such a situation as to be covered entirely by the water as we may see other remains of antiquities on the east side of the lake which are nearly all under water it is certain that the yearly discharge of the nile into the lake brings with it a great quantity of earth or clay and leaves it there consequently the lake must have risen from its original bed and spread so much over the land as to induce one to suppose that the said lake was made for a reservoir to retain the water at high nile and to make a kind of second inundation it is evident that it is made by nature and not by art but that it might have served as a reservoir for the above purpose does not appear to me to be at all impossible this second inundation could not extend out of the fayum the water might be retained in the lake at the time of the high nile by a bar across the canal at the entrance into the lake and at low water it might be let out but the canal must be stopped at the entrance into the fayum on the east otherwise the water would again return into the nile by the said bar yusuf consequently a second inundation could not take place in any other part but the fayum which being surrounded by mountains on the north and high grounds on the other side would form a lake of itself
we continued our journey in a direction parallel with the lake through several villages woods of palm and other fruit trees and well-cultivated lands and at sunset arrived at fedman el cunos which means the place of churches it stands on a high mound of earth and rubbish and has evidently been rebuilt on other ruins it is divided into two parts by a small canal from the bar yusuf one side of the town is inhabited by christian copts and the other by mohammedans and though the two religions officiated almost in sight of each other they never interfered on each other's rights the poor copts were destitute of the principal means of educating their children and the only reference they had to the rights of the christian religion was an old book of manuscripts copied from the bible but even this was kept as the only relic they had if by chance i had had an arabic bible or testament i might indeed have become a great man among them and i wonder that the missionaries of the bible society who lately visited egypt omitted this place being a noted christian town but i suppose the magnificent works of old pharaoh made them forget moses his followers and all those who wished to know anything about him but i must do justice to truth a young man of the name of burckhardt cousin to my good friend a celebrated traveller of that name came unprotected into egypt for the purpose of distributing bibles consequently was persecuted and obliged to fly in great haste he went into syria but with over fatigue or perhaps from the effects of the climate he was unable to proceed higher than aleppo where he died and i am sorry to say that others who succeeded him and went up the nile with protection and all their leisure made their journey to very little purpose the tradition of the town of fedman el hanizer is that in ancient times there were on that spot three hundred churches which were allowed to fall in ruins by the old inhabitants of the place and that when the mohammedans succeeded to the country they built the present town on these very three hundred churches for which reason the town is named fidman of the churches the story is somewhat strange and may afford grounds for a modern traveller to place the egyptian labyrinth in this spot for by conceiving that the three hundred churches were the three hundred cellars of the labyrinth as mentioned by herodotus or by supposing that the father of history meant to say three hundred instead of three thousand the above churches could have been nothing less than the old egyptian labyrinth itself all this might pass off well enough among the wanderers but unfortunately there is proof to the contrary which will do away with any such supposition the above branch of the bar yusuf passes through the town cut not above two centuries ago and none of the said churches appeared in the progress of the excavation through the town which must have been the case had it been built on the said three hundred churches however i must conclude that notwithstanding the little probability there is of the labyrinth being in this place i cannot help repeating my observation that it must have been at no great distance from the lake as the great quantity of materials which is scattered about the country has evidently belonged to some extensive and splendid building we left fidman on the sixth and after traversing a most beautiful country arrived at night at medinet el fayum End of part 24part twenty five of a narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty five journey to the oasis of ammon part two on the morning of the seventh i went to see the ruins of the ancient arsenal it had been a very large city but nothing of it remained except high mounds of all sorts of rubbish the chief materials appear to have been burnt bricks there were many stone edifices and a great quantity of wrought granite in the present town of medinet i observed several fragments of granite columns and other pieces of sculpture of a most magnificent taste it is certainly strange that granite columns are only to be seen in this place and near the pyramids six miles distance among the ruins at arsinoe i also observed various fragments of statues of granite well executed but much mutilated 
and it is my opinion that this town has been destroyed by violence and fire among the rubbish there are pieces of stones and glass which have evidently been nearly melted by fire it is clearly seen that the new town of medinet is built out of the old materials of arsenault as the fragments are to be met with in every part of the town the large blocks of stone have been diminished in their sides but enough is left to show the purposes for which they originally served about the centre of these ruins i made an excavation in an ancient reservoir which i found to be as deep as the bottom of the bar yosef and which was no doubt filled at the time of the inundations for the accommodation of the town there are other similar wells in these ruins which proves that this was the only mode they had of keeping water near them as the river is at some distance from the town among these mounds i found several specimens of glass of grecian manufacture and egyptian workmanship and it appears to me that this town must have been one of the first note in egypt having seen all i wished in that place i visited the obelisk which is too well known to require any more said about it i then prepared for my journey into the oasis on the west accordingly i went to see Husef bey who by this time had returned from cairo he was a native of circassia and bought at the usual market as a slave by the bashaw of egypt who after many years servitude made him bey or governor of the finest province of that country he was uncommonly civil and eager to know anything with which he was unacquainted but on my application for a bedouin guide to conduct me through the desert he said that the bedouins were all encamped in that part of the province which was subject to khalil bey at benizuf i was happy to hear that my old friend khalil bey was the person to whom i had to make my request and immediately inquired where the bedouins were encamped and on being told that they were about ten miles distant on the morning of the tenth i set off and reached the camp before noon but none of these people could inform me about the oasis on the west they all pointed towards the south indicating that the oasis were in that direction i saw that they meant the oasis of siud and maloney which are known by the name of the great oasis at last after much ado an old man told me that there was an eloa on the west of the lake maurice the very place i wished to go but that none of the bedouins would go there i inquired if any of them knew the road he said that he knew a sheikh of theirs who lived in a camp at eight miles distance who had a daughter married to one of the sheikhs of the eloi i was not a little pleased with this discovery and flattered myself that i would be able to persuade the said sheikh to accompany me thither we remained all night at the camp and on the morning of the twelfth set off for the nile again we passed through several plantations of fruit trees and a great quantity of roses with which as i mentioned before they make the rose water the cotton plant is quite abundant and figs are in such plenty that they dry them in the sun and send them to cairo it was quite night before we arrived at the banks of the nile and as no business could be done that evening i caused my saddle to be prepared for my bed and went to sleep i do not know to what cause it is to be attributed but i certainly slept more soundly on the banks of the nile or on the sands of the desert than i ever did in any other place and particularly under a roof early in the morning of the thirteenth i was awoke by the moorish Hajj, who told me with an air of surprise that a strange person was coming towards us he mistook him by fear and supposed that some thief was at hand i took up my arms but was soon undeceived when i saw an european who turned out to be the rev mr sloman a gentleman sixty-two years of age who for a walk had alighted from his kanjar and in spite of his years followed the tracks of celebrated travellers but who did not boast to his friends in england of his arduous task and consequently did not pass for a courageous and gallant adventurer this old reverend divine had the courage to go through all the lands in syria which travellers fancy wonderful difficult he never had an interpreter nor did he know a single word of arabic he encountered and overcame every difficulty 
He suffered much, but never complained, except of the ill-treatment he received from other travellers, who were ashamed that a venerable old man of sixty-two should silently follow all their steps, and think nothing of what he had undergone, nor did he care whether any one ever knew anything about his journey. He was then on his way to the second cataract, and some time afterwards I had the pleasure of seeing him, safe and well, on his return from that place." He was laughed at and even ill-treated by some person who deserves to be mentioned and who wished to be alone in travelling. But as I said before, I will not now enter into the particulars of the proceedings of some travellers in Egypt, as I mean to explain the whole facts in another volume. The Reverend Mr. Sloman proceeded on his journey, and I went to see my good old friend Khalil Bey of Esne, who was now commander of the province of Benezuf. It happened to be after dinner when I called. He was much pleased to see me, and glad he had it in his power to serve me. Having informed him that I wished to penetrate into the western oasis, he immediately sent, agreeably to my request, for the sheikh of the Bedouins. He inquired after many things, and in particular about the sulphur and emerald mines, as he thought them extremely interesting to the treasury of the Bashaw. I remained with him the rest of the evening, and promised to see him again the next day, when I should see the sheikh of the Bedouins. I went accordingly on the 14th, but the sheikh did not arrive, and I spent the whole day in the laborious task of idleness. As the bey entered his harem after a certain hour, I went to the coffee-house in the bazaar of the town, the only place of amusement, and in such cases one cannot help wishing for something to occupy the time. These places are only frequented by the Turkish soldiers, for though a cup of coffee is only five paras, little more than a half penny, yet it is more than an Arab can afford to pay, as his general pay for a day's labor is only twenty paras, three pence, so that it is very seldom an Arab is to be seen in these spendthrift places. It is somewhat singular to observe that while these soldiers are drinking their coffee, they assume the same airs and consequence as their bays. Abin Bashe, who is only in rank with a sergeant, issues to the corporal the order he received from the Kachef in the same tone as it was delivered to him. The corporal does so to the soldier, who occasionally passes it on to an Arab in the same manner. On the 15th, the sheikh arrived and protested he was unable to show me the road to the place I wished to visit. The bey insisted that he should find someone in his camp who knew the way, which he, of course, promised to do. It was agreed that I should meet the sheikh at a village at the foot of the desert, where I was to meet Sheikh Grumar, who would conduct me to the oasis. I proposed to the sheikh that I should have a firman from the bey for the sheikhs of the oasis, but he said it was unnecessary, and made me understand that it was better to go without one, as I should be accompanied by a man sent from the bey. Accordingly, on the morning of the 16th, we set off for the appointed village, named Sedman el Jabal, at the foot of the desert, where the Bedouins were encamped. I need not describe the ground we went over, as it is pretty much like the rest of the Fayum. On my arrival, I went to see the Kachef of the village, where I also found the Sheikh of the Bedouins and Sheikh Grumar waiting for us. I had some little difficulty in persuading them to take only six camels, as they feared we should not be able to carry enough of water. But the great difficulty was that Sheikh Grumar, who was to accompany us, was afraid of ill consequences by taking us to the oasis, as he assured me that no European had yet been there, and that even very few of the Bedouins themselves travel to these places at all, excepting when they go to purchase rice and dates. But having surmounted all these little difficulties, it was arranged that we should wait three days at the camp for the purpose of making provision for our journey, and so forth. The camp of the Bedouins was situated at the foot of the range of low mountains, which formed the skirt of the desert. See Plate 25. The chief had a large tent, higher than the rest, and was as great as a king among his own people. I took up my residence directly before his tent, and my Moorish hajj, with two shawls, contrived to make a tent for me. The mode of living of these people has been so often described that I conceive every one to be acquainted with it, 
but as there may be some peculiarity in one tribe more than in another i shall insert what i have seen in that of sheikh grumar he was a tall stout man six feet three inches high with a countenance that bespoke a resolute mind and great eagerness after gain he preserved an air of superiority over his subalterns and what he ordered was instantly done without any hesitation he had two wives who agreed pretty well with each other and an old black slave by whom he had two fine children and who in consequence had as much power as the other two who were only somewhat fairer than herself their chief occupation was grinding corn and making butter their hand-mill was rather of a larger size than what is used by the arabs of egypt which proves their superior strength the flour is put into boiling water and by stirring it with a stick they make a large pudding it is then turned out upon a straw plate when a hole is made in the top and filled with butter this is their chief repast which is called ashid these people are now happier than they were a few years ago as mohammed ali has given them liberty to rent lands on the borders of the desert they do not trouble themselves about ploughing the ground for they find it more profitable to breed camels their greatest trouble is to break the straw to feed them when there is no pasture and this is done by a machine of five or six irons passing over the straw on the ground their horses are not in very good condition but they are very strong they often remove their camps into better situations but always far from any habitation at least a large village or town the women are covered with a thick woolen cloth made on the barbary coast and sold in cairo and other towns in egypt the men have generally a linen gown and a large woolen shawl which covers the whole person from head to foot they generally have a great many fleas i believe owing to the quantity of thick cloth they wear and even their tents are so infested that it is impossible to approach them without being molested during the time i was there i never slept a moment the first day of our arrival the people were rather shy in entering into conversation with us but when once they did begin they were continually inquiring of many things concerning our country and asking for trifling articles of little value at last after having provided bread for our journey and provisions for the camels we set off on the nineteenth and entered the desert in a western direction along the south side of the fayoum and after two hours march we passed near the ruins of an ancient village and in another hour and a half we reached a place called raji tutan the place of a very extensive ancient town i saw a great many blocks of calcareous stone with hieroglyphics and egyptian figures very finely executed and some pedestals of columns the chief materials were burnt bricks but i observed several pieces of granite and from their extent i have no doubt that this must have been a very large town in another hour after this we came to the ruins of another village named talat al hagar it is somewhat singular that this village is crowded with pedestals of columns which evidently have been taken from the large town and converted into millstones for grinding corn at sunset we reached a place called el karak a land quite detached from fayoum and which is watered by a branch of the canal or bar yusuf this place has a village of that name with several pieces of well-cultivated ground around it which produce dura and clover in the proper season the few people who live there are mostly of the laboring class who rent the place from the bay of the fayoum here we took in provisions for the camels and filled the skins with fresh water on the twentieth we advanced towards the west here the face of the earth is entirely changed we soon found ourselves among low rocks sandy hills and barren valleys at a few miles distant from our last place i observed the upper part of a very thick wall evidently as if it had surrounded a large town but entirely buried under the sand i should have taken it for a wall enclosing some cultivated spots of land had i not observed in the interior of it the upper part of other buildings and very thick walls of sunburnt bricks on the exterior of the wall i perceived a great quantity of stumps of trees and vines nearly burnt to ashes and which crumbled into dust as soon as touched 
this place is named the same as the one we left in the morning el karak we continued the remaining part of the forenoon through several valleys of rocks and banks of sand and towards evening we arrived at a spot parallel with the eastern extremity of the lake morris we passed the night at the bottom of a sand bank and at four o'clock on the morning of the twenty first continued our route the valley we were now in opened wider and in a few hours we came in sight of a high rock at a great distance from us we continued nearly the whole day in the said valley among rocks and sand and towards evening arrived at regen el Kassar, a place once populated where there were several good spots of ground which had been once cultivated but now was nearly all covered up with sand it is surrounded by high rocks and this extent might have been about three miles square there is a great abundance of sunt and date trees which bear no fruit under the sand there is water to be found in great abundance for by only thrusting down a stick the water springs up there are the remains of the foundation of a small egyptian temple which has served as a burial place to people of later ages we passed the night very happily under the palm trees but unfortunately the water of this place was rather saltish otherwise it might invite a hermit to pass his days out of the busy world on the twenty second we continued our route toward the west and had to pass over a very high bank of sand to leave region alcazar and reach a valley in which we continued travelling in that direction till we came to an open plain and a fine horizon before us i observed at a distance a spacious plain of sand and stones with several heaps above the rest on our approach i found that they were tumuli nearly in the form of a parallelogram from twenty to thirty feet long there were i believe nearly thirty and some of them i calculated were large enough to contain a hundred corpses and consequently altogether form a good number i must beg leave to make one observation on these tumuli which perhaps will give some idea to the learned as i hope my humble opinion will meet the approbation of some of them it will be recollected that cambyses after having conquered egypt sent part of his army to the conquest of the ammonii in the deserts of libya which was betrayed by their guides who were egyptians and left to perish in the desert and nothing more was heard of them it is the general opinion that the ammonii were in the western direction of the nile and it is well known that alexander employed only nine days on his visit to that place from alexandria consequently it is pretty clear that the ammonii were not in the southern oasis as it is supposed merely because it is stated by herodotus that cambyses sent his army into that place from thebes but by all other accounts it appears that they could not have been so far from the sea it is more probable that the army was sent from memphis and not from thebes which agrees with many other points in history for instance not only in the distance but also in the description of the western oasis and its temple i am now laying before my readers my own ideas which i formed in consequence of what i had seen and of the little calculation i could make from ancient history on the subject recollecting that the said army of cambyses had been lost in these deserts i have no hesitation in supposing that the above tumuli were made to cover the unfortunate wretches who perished no doubt from thirst the direction from memphis to these eloa either of siwa or el katsar is westward the situation where these people are stated to have perished is the desert of libya the tumuli are situated between memphis and the eloa in the desert of libya where there is no index to direct the stranger on his way if he is left by his guide nor even a stone or a shadow to shelter him from the sun a learned man wrote to me that these people could not be persians merely because it was not their custom or religion to cover the dead bodies but to leave them to the birds of prey consequently these could not be the army of cambyses but let this learned man recollect that independently of the points he has mentioned these people could not have been buried by their countrymen at all 
for it is natural to suppose that they did not know where they were otherwise there would be reason to believe that we should know something more of what became of them than the dry accounts given by herodotus that they were left to perish in these deserts it is therefore more reasonable to suppose that the remains of these wretches were accumulated by some other nation perhaps by the ammonii themselves though they protested they knew nothing of them and that the army never reached their country at any rate i should be happy to know who these people were and by what cause they came there if they are not the above people from the army of cambyses the calculation of the number could not have been made with accuracy in consequence of the different sizes of the tombs besides if these corpses were collected only when skeletons they would of course occupy much less space than when in flesh but notwithstanding all this uncertainty i have no hesitation in asserting that in those tumuli i saw there could have been buried three thousand people besides from the information i received from the bedouins i found that this was not the place where there were the greatest number and that at a little distance there were a great many of the same to which i could not persuade the bedouins to take me as they were afraid that our supply of water would fall short on the twenty third we continued our journey to the west over a plain covered with pebbles of brown and black colours and so flat that in a few hours we found an horizon all around not unlike the sea we continued so the whole day on the twenty fourth we went on and towards the evening reached bahar bellame where we saw high rocks on the west this place is singular and deserves the attention of the geographer as it is a dry river and has all the appearance of water having been in it the bank and the bottom are quite full of stones and sand there are several islands in the centre but the most remarkable circumstance is that at a certain height above the bank there is a mark evidently as if the water had reached so high the colour of the materials above that mark is also much lighter than those below and what would almost determine that there has been water there is that the island has the same mark and on the same level with that on the banks of the said dry river i am a little at a loss to know how the course of this river is so little known as i only found it marked near the lakes natron taking a direction of northwest and southeast which does not agree with its course there which is from north to south yet it has the same name and runs north and south as far as i could see from the summit of a high rock on the west side of it the arabs assured me that it ran a great way in both directions and that it is the same which passes near the lakes natron if this is the case it must pass right before the extremity of the lake maurice at two or three days journey distance in a western direction this is the place where several petrified stumps of trees are found and many pebbles with moving or quick water inside i saw about half a dozen of a flinty substance without veins of any sort on the morning of the twenty fifth we continued westward and passed several isolated rocks and sand banks at noon we saw a high hill at a distance and soon after the guide pointed out the rocks of eloa in a few minutes after this we saw two crows which appeared to have come to meet us a sure sign that water is not far off for though these birds can travel both cheap and expeditious they generally keep near the water in those deserts in the afternoon we reached the brink of the eloa named el kassar a valley surrounded by high rocks which form a spacious plain of twelve or fourteen miles long and about six in breadth there is only a small portion of the valley cultivated on the opposite side which we reached and it can only be distinguished by the woods of palm trees which cover it the rest of the valley is wholly covered with tracts of sand but it is evidently seen that it has once been cultivated everywhere many tracts of sand are of a clayey substance which could be brought into use even now there are several small hills scattered about some with a natural spring on the top and covered with rushes and small plants we advanced towards a forest of date trees and before evening we reached within a mile of a village named zabu all of us exceedingly thirsty here we observed some cultivation several beds of rice and some sunt trees and so forth
before the camels arrived they scented the water at some distance and as they had not drank since they left rajan they set off at full gallop and did not stop till they reached a rivulet which was quite sweet although the soil was almost impregnated with salt i observed here a great many wild birds particularly wild ducks in greater abundance than any other at this place we alighted for a moment to allow our camels to drink and i observed a certain uneasiness in the manner of sheikh grumar our guide that i could not account for he had often hinted to me whether i wished to pass for a mohammedan or christian but i always told him i could see no reason for disguising myself i went some distance from the camels to drink too and after having watered our camels we were about to proceed slowly towards the village but no sooner were we mounted than we heard a voice hallooing at us and at the same time a man rushed out of one of the bushes with a gun and put himself in an attitude as if to fire upon us his appearance was not very terrifying nor did his garments bespeak him to be a person of any consequence in that land he was not above four feet high of a chocolate colour most wretchedly ill-made and covered with a black woollen cloth sheikh grumar immediately dismounted and advanced towards the man speaking to him in a kind of arabic dialect which i found to be the dialect of the place the man soon recognized him and they approached each other in a friendly manner which gave me hopes that all would go on well at that place the man was anxious to learn who we were when our guide at once told him that we were people in search of old stones and that one of us was a hajj just returning from mecca this last assertion appeared to satisfy the man but he replied that no one ever came there to seek for old stones and that he did not know what the sheikhs of zabu the village would think of our coming there and that he was going to shoot me when i was drinking meanwhile we advanced towards the village and our guide contrived to persuade him that we were harmless franks meaning me and my sicilian servant he did not know of what tribe the franks were but said that their cady who had been once in cairo must know them all this was told us in arabic by our guide who continually kept inquiring about the health of such and such a sheikh and above all of the sheikh abrims his son-in-law the man began to walk before us and on our approaching the village he ran off as fast as he could into the wood of palm trees we advanced and entered a lane among these plants and as we penetrated farther we entered a most beautiful place full of dates intermixed with other trees some in blossom and others in fruit there were apricots figs almonds plums and some grapes the apricots were in greater abundance than the rest and the figs were very fine the soil was covered with verdure of grass and rice and the whole formed a most pleasing recess particularly after the barren scenes of the desert on our approaching a wide place the guide halted and desired us to wait till he returned he walked on and i observed him go into a kind of habitation at some distance accordingly we waited there some time but in about half an hour i thought it rather strange that he did not return i inquired of the drivers where our guide had gone they told me they did not know at last i became tired of waiting and set off with my gun towards the place where i saw the guide enter but before i reached the place i heard the voices of men women and children and when i came nearer i saw a wall enclosing a great many houses and immediately within the gates there was a yard in which were assembled all the chiefs of the village and many others sitting on the ground debating whether or not we should be admitted and my guide very busy in persuading them that we were but harmless people and only come there to look after old stones on my arrival at the gate their whole attention was turned upon me and a perfect silence ensued i walked straight forward when they all rose and stared at me but from their countenances i saw they did not know what to say i went in among them and inquired who was their sheikh when my guide told me that three or four elders and a young man were the sheikhs of the place i saluted them freely and shook hands which they do not unlike the english manner i wished them prosperity i saw by their manner on this occasion that they were divided in opinion 
some received me with good humor and others retired murmuring something i could not learn at the moment they inquired what i wanted i told them i was a stranger merely come to visit that place as i expected to find some stones belonging to the holy mosque of my ancestors and hoped we should be friends at the same time i sent my guide to fetch the camels and on their arrival ordered coffee to be made i had a good mat and a new carpet which made a fine appearance i spread them by the side of the wall sat down and invited the sheikhs to come and sit near me at the same time i asked if i could procure a sheep at a cheap rate some of them cheerfully seated themselves on my mat but others kept at a distance frowning upon me which i pretended not to see the son-in-law of my guide approached and said he would sell me a sheep for a dollar which i accepted on condition that he would boil two large basins of rice in its broth i knew that rice was very cheap there and took that method to let them suppose i had not plenty of money but at the same time that i wished to make a feast with them by this time my sicilian servant and the hodge had made a large pot of coffee and become quite free with some of them in serving round the coffee i gave the preference of the first cups to the sheikhs and the sight of such a treat brought the other rusty fellows to sit down also and share the same dainty as they could not resist the attraction of a cup of coffee a luxury which they perhaps taste only once a year on the first day of the arrival of the caravan of bedoweens who come there for the purpose of carrying dates to cairo or alexandria by this means the wildest became more mild and seeing my indifference whether they were friends or not thought it would be more to their advantage to become social by this time the rest of the village had assembled cows camels sheep donkeys men women and children all staring in a semicircle as if i had come from the moon some of them had seen turks and other tribes of arabs but none had ever seen a frank or a christian before i produced a little good tobacco and having presented each of the sheikhs with a pipe we commenced smoking and talked of what i could see the next day they told me i could see nothing there but must go to the next eloa four days journey northwest where i would see something i was in search of no doubt they meant siwa which is also reckoned to be one of the oasis of the ammonii there is a temple there visited by messrs brown horniman and de Boudin. my guide told them several stories during this time wonderful indeed but one in particular that he and some of his companions had gone far to the south and met with a tribe quite different from us who walked like dogs and that the women fought against the other tribes these tribes said my guide are so far off that their bellad or village is very near the skies and that if i had time to walk to the top of a high hill i might touch it with my own hands the ideas of these people are that the sky and the earth meet at the horizon while all this was going on the other sheikhs held a consultation among themselves and appeared much concerned about my expressing an intention of visiting the country all around to see if i could meet with some old stones at this time three men brought some large wooden bowls filled with rice and having put one down to me they set the rest before the other people they all sat round theirs and i remained with my large portion by myself i immediately told them that unless all the sheikhs ate with me i would not taste it at which they were all much pleased and came to mess with me even the most rough among them came and dipped in the same bowl soon after a man came and threw a basket on the ground which raised such a dust that it covered our rice like sugar on cream as i could not conjecture i was anxious to know what was in the basket when one of the sheikhs opposite thrust his hand in and took out a piece of boiled mutton i had seen dinner served up in many ways but i never saw boiled mutton eaten out of a basket thrown on the ground in that manner the pieces were distributed and devoured we became more intimate after dinner as i found that an empty stomach makes a man angry as well as hungry but the fact is that strangers in these countries after having eaten together lay aside all enmity and sometimes become friends 
There is treachery, it is true, but after a person has eaten with a stranger in public, he must at least play the part of a friend. We had some more coffee and pipes, and I again hinted about going to see the grounds the next morning, and the son-in-law of my guide promised to conduct me anywhere I chose. Our conversation was in bad Arabic, as far as they liked to converse with me, but amongst themselves they talked in another language, in use in Siwa. It being rather dark by this time, a wax candle was lighted, which astonished them much, and was handed all around for every one to see it. I should not have mentioned this circumstance had it not appeared almost incredible that these people, living only at the distance of a few days' journey from the Nile, should never have seen a candle. Coffee being ended, one of the sheikhs rose, when the rest followed, and without saying a single word, walked off with the candle, leaving me in the dark with my carpet and saddle to sleep on. The camel drivers had brought all their provisions and so forth quite close to us, and continued the old plan of keeping watch all night, of two hours each. End of Part 25Part 26 of Narrative of the Operations and Recent Discoveries in Egypt and Nubia by Giovanni Belzoni. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 26 Journey to the Oasis of Ammon. Part 3 On the 26th, before sunrise, some of the natives came thither to see us, and for all my civilities to them on the preceding evening, they were quite rude in the morning as the sun rose the sheikhs came and held a consultation whether i was to be permitted to see the ruins or whether i was to be sent to the other village over the mountain i was already informed that on the west of the eloa there are other and greater villages than this and that there were several ruins among them but as i had made an acquaintance here i wished to see everything before i proceeded elsewhere accordingly when the sheikhs were all in council i went and told them i had not come there as their enemy but their friend and that i wished to be informed of their objection against my going to see the country they replied that they knew i wanted treasure and not stones and that a man would not cross the desert to procure stones in the eloa and so forth in short all i could do was to no purpose they were persuaded that i wanted to go there for treasure which is their constant story i then adopted the ancient mode of persuading them to the contrary i told them that if i found any gold i would give it to them to which they all agreed and said it was done meaning that they should have the treasure at last off we set towards the east and after passing through a thick wood of palm trees and so forth as on the day before we came to an open ground the soil of which is in some places so covered with fine salt that it appeared like snow and what is more singular there are several rivulets which run over that salt plain and form a sediment of their own which does not incorporate in any way with the salt and keeps quite sweet and on advancing farther we came to a place where there had evidently been an ancient town a little farther there were several holes not unlike the tombs of egypt on my approaching these cavities i entered one to the great astonishment of the natives who never in their life ventured to penetrate any of them as they supposed the devil was in them i found it to be a tomb cut out of the rock in the same manner as those in egypt and running downwards in various directions on my coming out again i underwent a minute scrutiny by the sheikhs in order to discover if i had any treasure it was well i had no money of my own as they would have said that i found it there and it is somewhat singular that their chief notion of coin is the spanish dollar the reason is because the few bedouins who go there to buy dates and rice bring some of that money to pay for them besides several articles for barter and it sometimes happens that the caravan from mecca to fizan or tripoli passes through the oasis and purchases rice which is paid for in dollars we advanced farther and at last i was taken to see the ruins of an old edifice made only of sunburnt bricks and which perhaps might have served for a christian church but no sign of anything now remained and i only judge so from its form which is somewhat inclined to that mode of building 
we then took the route towards the village again but in another direction we passed over several pieces of ground which might have been cultivated and i believe the only reason why it was not was merely because the inhabitants had enough for what they wished to cultivate their lands are watered from the running springs on our way i was taken to see what they named the devil's habitation made by himself in one night for his own use it was a low rock at one side of which there were several tombs also in the egyptian style but as their entrance was somewhat different from the other it bore the above title and the natives never ventured near them on my approaching the place they all kept at a great distance and even the moorish hodge who had seen the tombs near the pyramid in the fayum began to be alarmed on their report that the devil was in these places i took my sicilian servant and a lighted candle and entered a chasm in the rock which in the interior led into various small apartments and little chambers cut out as sepulchres in the egyptian manner but without any hieroglyphics in an inner apartment we found several sarcophagi of burnt clay in the form of a man and generally of the usual size to contain one they are two inches thick and baked very strong the lids are quite flat and have a head of a man woman or animal just above the head of the mummy the sarcophagus being rather too heavy for a camel to carry through the desert i took with me some of the men's heads on the lids and one of a ram they are most roughly made on our coming out we found the sheikhs and others in doubt whether we could return from the habitation of pluto but notwithstanding this they did not give up the supposition that we searched for money we returned to the village and after a slight repast went to see a fountain of water or rather a running spring it is a rivulet of curious water and very convenient for the people for by putting their woolen cloth if white into it for twenty-four hours it is taken out as black as any dyer could make it this is a great accommodation to the women and children who are nearly all covered with gowns of that colour the sheikhs and people of respectability are in white they are of the mohammedan religion but very poor followers of it in the village there was a young man who had been in egypt and had learned a little spelling and was an oracle among them and all his references were made to a few sheets of paper with copies of texts of the al Quran. what a precious article would an arabic bible have been in this place their mode of living was very simple rice of which they have great abundance was their chief food but it is of so inferior a sort that they have but very little traffic in it and what they have is only among a few bedoweens who go there yearly to purchase dates which are very fine they have a few camels and donkeys several cows buffaloes goats and sheep and altogether have no reason to complain they could be happy in this elysium indeed for this place has more to deserve that name than any other as it is separated from the rest of mankind but they are mortal and they must have their evils the greatest enemies they have are their own neighbours at the other village named el Kassar, on the other side of a high rock separated from them a three hours journey and siwa four days they are continually in dispute and often attack each other's party and sometimes for very trifling causes in the afternoon i was taken to see another piece of antiquity not far from the town and passed over some high hills of sand and arrived at a wide plain which extended to the foot of the rock which divided the two villages in the midst of this plain there is a small hill on which there were the ruins of a small temple built of large bricks of sandstone not unlike the egyptians but not one single hieroglyphic was to be seen on it it has several scrawls in greek letters but so defaced that i could only trace one or two in different places round the temple there have been houses built of burnt brick by this time the village of el Kassar were informed that a stranger had arrived in zabu in search of treasure which was to be found in the ruins under the village and that he had ventured into the devil's house without fear they were all in an uproar and swore that he should never enter their village or even come near it 
a man who lived halfway between the two villages and occasionally reported what passed or was said from one to another came to me while i was looking at the said temple and said there was a very large temple in the other village named el Kassar, and that there were holes underground directly under the village where great treasure was to be found but that the people had sworn that i should not enter the village at all i inquired of him the names of the principal people the great sheikh and the cady and having taken down their names i asked him if he would take a message to them from me at first he hesitated but on promising that i would not tell them that he informed me about the treasure he agreed to go to the village early next morning the message was my salutes to the great sheikh salem and to the cady or justice sheikh ibrahim and to tell them that i came into the eloa to visit them that i was not a soldier and that if they would appoint a place where i could meet them the next morning i should be glad to see them anywhere they pleased i returned to the village and the man to his habitation the evening was passed much in the same way as the preceding one and the great talk was on the risk i had run in entering the devil's house without finding any money or gold in it the sheikhs were laughing at each other at the thought of their having approached near enough the place on the morning of the twenty seventh i was taken to see the seat of an old town in the south the sheikhs were sure that if i knew how to look i should find the treasure there but all my endeavors to persuade them i was not in search of treasure were of no avail we arrived at this place which is not more than a mile and a half distant there are several heaps of rubbish and tombs cut out in the same manner as the rest some of which were choked up with rubbish i proposed to dig and open one of them and they did not dislike my idea as we might find some jewels in it but after a faint trial they got tired and left the tombs with the supposed treasure we returned towards the village but before we reached it we were informed that the great sheikh and the cady of the other village were coming towards zabu we hastened to meet them but i observed that some of our sheikhs were not pleased with the intelligence on our arrival at the village we met the party coming towards us the first was a good-natured looking man on horseback dressed in linen cloth striped blue red turban pistols and a gun i was informed he was the great sheikh of the eloa the next was a complete rough-looking fellow as ever i saw dressed in green cloth and turban pistols and gun he was the cady and sheikh which means justice of peace and the sheikh of the church he was more conspicuous than the rest in his attire with a turban of a cashmere shawl which he had procured when in cairo after these two personages came about twenty horsemen and as many foot all well armed with pistols guns and swords my guide by this time had drawn near me and informed me that these two personages were the chief commanders of the eloa when sheikh salim reached the walls which surround the village he halted dismounted and looked round to see whom he knew the cady did the same and the other people on horse and foot surrounded them a few mats were brought and laid on the ground under the little shade of a wall ten feet high the chiefs seated themselves there and invited some of their attendants to sit with them meanwhile i observed the principal sheikhs of zabu had retired to another spot by themselves i kept at some distance till i saw they were all accommodated and then went to them after the usual salute of salam was over i was requested to sit down between the two chiefs i do not know what figure i cut in that place but i certainly knew this that to judge from appearance the party round me except the sheikh salem was not favorably inclined towards me i then began to enter into conversation with the two great men who were anxious to know my business in the eloa but did not like to be the first to inquire at last the cady said plainly to me in arabic where are you going and for what are you come here i replied that i was a wandering traveller in search of old stones that i only came there to see if any old buildings could be seen that could give me any idea of the religion and writing of my ancestors which was now lost 
it appeared that this man had the same impression as daoud kachef in nubia for he made me the same answer but rather more roughly you came here in search of treasure said he and not for stones what have you to do with stones i replied that i wanted no treasure but only to look at the stones that i did not want to take them away unless it was agreeable to him and as a proof of my sincerity i promised to give them whatever treasure i found my proposal made the cady consider and the sheikh salim said that if i found any treasure the bashaw of egypt would make war against them and take it away his reflection was very just but i told him there was no danger of their running any risk in my finding money for i had no thought of the kind but said the cady for what purpose then do you come into this country i again explained to them about the stones and that i came only to look if they would allow me and if they did not that i did not care that to-morrow i should return to the nile again since they threw so many difficulties in the way of a stranger who wished only to see a few stones my apparent indifference had its desired effect and the two sheikhs began to relax in their austerity by this time some of my good coffee and tobacco came in when we all smoked and drank the cady kept a secret conversation with some of the horsemen by his side and one of them suddenly rose and swore by mahomet that the stranger should never enter their village for if he did they should all fall sick and die this was done at the instigation of the cady perhaps to see what impression it would make on me i replied again that if my going into the village was the cause of dispute i would return sooner than have the bad will of any of them the sheikh salim then said that his people were afraid i would bring some evil disorder into the village i then observed that if i had the power of doing so i certainly had not done it to the people of zabu who were all well although i had been there three days there was much to do and say on this subject for about two hours at last it was concluded that i should enter the village in the evening but only on condition that i was not to write a single word to touch or take anything away and that i should keep at a great distance from the ruins i agreed to all these points and as i had ordered a sheep to be killed fortunately a dinner was brought in the armed men were fed by the sheikhs of the village zabu and we were left to eat by ourselves the sheikhs of zabu seeing that i would become friendly with the others were more free with me than before however on my inviting them to eat they refused but at the request of the cady they came and we all ate out of the same dish or wooden bowl except sheikh salem who ate with none i asked him several times to say what was the reason but he refused and smiled at me i soon perceived that these people were not on friendly terms and that he as chief sheikh could not eat with the people of zabu for if he did it would have made a general peace among them but as i was perhaps not sure in my conjecture i could not interfere in such an affair which would have been dangerous in my case no sooner had the rest finished their dinner than a portion reserved for that purpose was brought to the sheikh himself i was then invited to eat with him which i contrived to do as my first repast was not so abundant but that i could take another after dinner and coffee they all set off some time after we prepared to follow them and the sheikhs of zabu made me promise that i would come there on my return three hours before sunset we set off and passed over the sandy banks on the west of the village crossed the plain and ascended the rocks which separate the two villages from the summits i had a fine view of the site of the eloa and on the side of el kassar the country was most pleasant a forest of palm trees surrounded the village and stretching over a wide circuit which included a great space of cultivated lands farther on before us there was the range of rocks which surrounds the eloa and opens to the west forming an entrance into a valley which runs in that direction 
we descended the rock and gradually advanced toward the village and on our approaching we found the place we had to pass crowded with people they knew the stranger was coming there to seek for treasure and they were not pleased with our intrusion it was well for me that i had an interview with their sheikh and Katy, who had previously assured them that they would take care we should do no harm to them the first we met came right before us stopped the first camel and would not let us proceed any farther consequently we stopped where we were at a quarter of a mile from the village but he thought we had advanced far enough i told my guide to speak to them and to send one to the sheikh or to the cady but it was almost night and there we remained the people kept watch all night that we did not advance any farther early in the morning of the twenty eighth many of them came to look at us but kept at a great distance we wished to send some one to the sheikh but no one would hear us the guide told them that the camels could not stay without provisions consequently that they would die the people replied that we might die too as soon as we liked all the forenoon was passed in this manner the place we were in was a dry spot without shelter from the sun and no water near us nor had we brought any provisions with us as we did not expect such a reception my guide and camel drivers were determined to return to zabu as soon as the sun was declining and i could not prevent them near this place i observed a quarry from which large blocks of stone had been taken which assured me that some building of the same must be in the village or not far off at last towards evening the cady came to us and said that we could not enter on the night before because the people were not consulted and did not agree that we should enter till that moment a difficulty which i afterwards learned was entirely owing to the cady himself for though the people were not pleased at our going into the village they did not make more objection on the first night than the second at length we marched slowly toward the village and before we entered we dismounted we passed under a gateway which led into a spacious place this was their market the place where camels and other cattle were sold in the midst of which we took up our abode the principal difficulty was to obtain food for the camels which they absolutely refused at first but on consideration that a mohammedan would be at the loss of his beast they gave them some rice straw we made a fire and prepared our utensils for coffee the baggage was all put close to us and we seated ourselves around it the fragrant smell of the enticing coffee made these wild people stretch out their noses by the time it was made some of them came near us in soft conversation i drank my coffee and so did my guide the people drew nearer still till i could ask them if they wished to take any to which they replied with a hearty affirmative the sight of drinking coffee by these people drew many others nearer and round us we began our conversation and after some time the cady appeared and caused a large mat to be spread on the ground near me and to my great surprise two large bowls of rice were brought before us this was in return for what i had given to them on the morning before after this coffee was given again and the great sheikh himself came to partake of it i might with reason exclaim on the virtue of a cup of coffee we talked of everything but the subject of seeing the ruins at last as the night grew dark and late the sheikh invited me to enter his house to pass the night i would rather have remained where i was but i could not venture to refuse him i went and having laid my saddle on the ground i thought i could sleep the house of the sheikh was as usual made of mud a few beams of palm trees laid across formed the roof on the top of which was thrown a great quantity of straw with old mats over it rains in this place sometimes but not much when we were alone the sheikh told me that all he could do for me he would but that the cady's father being a merchant of dates had received many dollars from the bedoweens who came there to market once a year and that it was supposed that he hid them in the ruins consequently he was alarmed thinking that i would take them from under the ground by my magic i assured the sheikh that i was not a magician and that i did not care for treasure at last the old sheikh went to sleep and so did i but i hope my reader will not do the same 
on the morning of the twenty ninth a great consultation took place and the great difficulty was to persuade the father of the cady to let me walk to the ruins the debates were great but at last it was concluded that he himself should accompany me and no one else that i should go no farther than where he led me and that i should not write anything down or take anything away all the above conditions were of course agreed to as i considered that if there should be such to see i could not avoid observing it and could put it in my memorandum book at night or if anything of consequence to examine that i would find the means to see it again after my first visit we set off with the old miser and he took me through a lane where the houses were built upon the ruins of some great edifice the blocks of stone project in several parts and into the very path in the lane but this was all seen in passing at last we descended on one side of the village which is situated on an eminence no doubt formed by the ruins we went round part of the village and on the north side of it i saw the remains of a greek temple consisting of a high wall with two lateral sides and an arch in the centre it was so situated that it must have been built on the ruins of another of larger dimensions this is not more than sixty feet in breadth and of course it must have been long in proportion the people were in crowds behind us but kept at some distance and it appeared to me that the influence of the old man was great at about one hundred and fifty feet he stopped me from going any farther and i could not persuade him that the distance was too great for me to be able to distinguish anything on the top of the wall there were many people looking outside at what i was going to do as i thought i might see some inscription on the wall i took from my pocket a small telescope which when opened was not more than two feet long having put it in a direction to the upper part of the wall all the people that were there retired in great precipitation and the others near us were on the point of doing the same the old man stared at me and at the telescope and wished to know what i was about i thought it best to please the old man by letting him have a peep he was shy at first but he took it and after a long examination i had some trouble to make him put it to his eyes at last he caught the focus of the glasses and was much astonished that the stones of the wall should come so near to him he thought this was not fair as i promised not to do anything magical i explained to him that it was not magic but what the europeans could make every day i took a long observation on that wall but could not discover any inscription except four letters on the lateral wall on the east and above the cornice which are exactly as follow a p h s we reascended the ruins and entered through a house into the interior of the temple but there i could see nothing but the inner part of the above wall which must have been the sanctuary we returned to the house by the same road and all i had observed was apparently to me the vast ruins of a great edifice covered with the mud cottages which formed the village and that the standing part of a temple was built by later nations and that the materials of the former temple have been employed to erect the latter but the stones had been diminished in size the rest of the evening was passed in the house of the sheik to persuade him and the others of my honourable views as by this first trial they must have found that i did no harm to any one the telescope remained fixed in the mind of the old man and he told the rest that though i did not trespass farther than he permitted me to go yet i had the mode to draw the wall of the kassar or ruin near me so that it was the same as if i had gone near but all this was said in a pleasant manner by the old man so that all the rest laughed at this time two negroes who lived in the eloa brought in two pumpkins of a liquor which they extract from the palm tree by cutting all the branches of it they make a hole in the top of the tree into which they thrust a pipe attached to which is a pumpkin flask the liquor runs up the trees and is discharged into the flask through the pipe it is not unlike ale but the natives cannot drink much of it without getting tipsy i drank some and ordered the blacks to bring more by this time the principal people of the village had arrived and in consequence of my not having taken any treasure from the temple they began to persuade themselves that i was not in search of gold 
but notwithstanding all this the idea that a man should travel so many miles only to come to see the stones of that place could not enter into their heads the telescope was what drew their attention at present and it was handed from one to another but unfortunately after the first no one could see anything he protested that a branch of a date tree which was at some distance came so close to him that it touched his nose all the rest were willing to see this wonder but he unwarily had put the telescope off its focus consequently the others could not see when i put the focus right again the first that could see exclaimed that he was close to the tree his pleasure of sight did not last long for no sooner did he say that he saw something than the glass was taken from him and put out of its focus again this created a sport for more than two hours and i received my telescope back again without injury which was more than i expected they were so pleased with it and with their knowledge that i proposed to take a tour round the village on the outside of it and they all agreed to accompany me anywhere i pleased to go i was on my legs immediately and off we all set out of the village with at least half of the people of it after me for when the people saw that i had not brought any disorder among them they became more free with us i inquired from some of them who seemed to be disposed to tell me anything if there were any places underground anywhere they seemed surprised how i should know of any places of the kind and told me that there were many around the village i took my course towards them and on my arrival i perceived several tombs cut out of the rocks like the others at zabu and much in the same manner as the egyptians i entered with candlelight i found three or four chambers in each of which were several sarcophagi of burnt clay with the mummies inside their folding not so rich or so fine the linen of a coarse sort and the corpses without as faultum consequently not so well preserved they are in great quantity in each tomb many of the sarcophagi are still in good preservation but i could not take any away as it would have been too great a burden for a camel after a long tour over these tombs we returned towards the village my next point was the well of warm and cold water which i heard talked of by my guide had i inquired for this fountain i should have found perhaps some difficulty to be taken there so i expressed a wish for bathing and the said fountain was pointed to me i returned to the house of the sheikh and after all the crowd had dispersed which must have been about three hundred people i waited for an opportunity to set off unperceived not to have such a crowd about me i took my sicilian servant and the hajj who by this time had been to see the fountain as he was more at liberty to go unnoticed than i was i found it to be a well eight feet square and above sixty deep when i first put my hands into this water i felt it warm it was then after sunset it springs from the bottom of the well and overflows in a rivulet which runs to irrigate some cultivated lands this well is situated near the ruins in the centre of a beautiful wood of palms and other trees the water is blackish but perhaps this is owing to the soil of the earth it passes from the bottom to the top of the well the next visit was to be made at midnight to observe the difference of the temperature of the water on our return to the sheikh's house i found there the sheikhs of the village of zabu who came to see me as they said but i rather think that these people were inclined to become friends again with those of el kassar some rice was brought to us as usual but no mutton i observed that the great sheikh of zabu did not eat with the rest as the other did on his visit to his village and a portion had been brought to him as the other had also for himself he invited me to eat and of course i could not refuse so i partook with him rice and fried eggs was the supper for him though it was rather late they all set off to return to zabu again and we went to rest for a while but not to sleep as i waited till midnight to visit the fountain they all went to sleep and i contrived by the light of a small lamp to write my little journal of what passed on that day at midnight i took my servant and the hajj and we went to the fountain on our way we passed by several people who sleep always about the lane which leads to the outer part of the village and reach the fountain 
we had to go over a wall to get at the place as the door was closed at this time but we soon overcame that difficulty i found the water apparently much warmer than i had left it in the evening and indeed i regretted i had broken my thermometer we returned safely to the house and went to sleep early in the morning before the sun we went to the fountain again on pretext of bathing i found the water as i left it at midnight or rather less warm but not so much as in the evening for instance if we were to suppose the water to have been at sixty degrees in the evening it might be at a hundred degrees at midnight and in the morning at about eighty degrees but when i returned at noon it appeared quite cold and it might be calculated in proportion to the other at forty degrees these are to my little observations the various degrees of temperature which appeared in the water of that fountain but i am well convinced that it must have been the effect of the various degrees of heat in the atmosphere and that water being so kept in a well of sixty feet deep by eight square has not had time to cool so that it being constantly in one temperature and that the effect of the apparent change is caused by the change of the atmosphere itself particularly as the water has proved to be pure and free from any saline incorporation as i had the analysis made since my arrival in london but whatever may have been the causes of this apparent change of temperature it does not signify for the principal point is to prove the existence of the fountain itself according to the description found in herodotus in melpomene where he says that there is a fountain near the temple of jupiter ammon whose water changes its temperature being cold at noon and midnight and warm in the morning and evening this does not altogether agree with my finding the water warm at midnight but we have to recollect that herodotus was only told of this phenomenon for he never was himself in the deserts of libya and that if the fountain was only apparently changed in its temperature owing to the heat of the atmosphere we have to consider that the simplicity of these people did not let them observe the true reason of the above change but they naturally supposed it was the water that made this alteration it is enough for me to remind my reader that it is said that such a fountain was described to be near the temple of jupiter ammon and that in the combination with other descriptions concerning the distance and situation of these ruins we have reason to suppose that this may be the seat of jupiter ammon's temple for my part i shall leave others to conjecture whether it is or is not in my simple opinion i think that with all this combination we ought to consider that siwa which is another eloa of the ammoni has as much right to be supposed the seat of the above temple of jupiter ammon though unfortunately it is the opinion of many of the first literati that it is not according to the description given by the travellers who have been there particularly mr horniman and mr brown who positively affirm that the temple they saw in siwa was not that of jupiter ammon still i beg to observe that the eloa of siwa agrees with the account in point of distance as well as the eloa el kassar and as it forms an angle with that place and alexandria and is at the same distance of nine days journey from that port i think that one place has as much claim as the other the only objection i have against siwa is that the ruins in that place are surrounded by water of which we have no account from the ancient authors yet it might have formed a lake since that time but what i will give as my firm opinion is that no other places but these two eloas are meant by the old authors as the residence of the ammoni consequently the seat of its temple can but be within them or not far off having seen all i could in this place i made a proposal to pass to the other eloa of siwa but for all my offers promises and entreaties i could not persuade my guide grumar to take me there i then proposed to go to the eloa el hex three days in a southwest direction and found some little difficulty but i overcame it by a small present to the sheikh and the cady and on the thirty-first we set off through the valley on the west side of the eloa 
we continued our route southwest the whole day and nothing of consequence to be described as i saw only a few rocks elevated above those which formed the valley end of part twenty six part twenty seven of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty seven journey to the oasis of ammon part four we went a good day's march as the camels were fresh again and the next day the first of june towards the evening we saw another eloa at a great distance on the second we arrived there it was a long tract of land forming a crescent of more than twenty miles from one point to the other there are several good spots of ground to cultivate and various springs of good water the side where we entered was at one point of the crescent there we found a few trees some spots of ground with rice a tomb of a mohammedan saint and no one to be seen anywhere we advanced in search of water and soon found it close to a large sycamore tree which afforded a fine shelter from the sun close to the tree we found a hut made of four mats attached together inside of it we saw a bowl of fresh milk and in a bag attached to the hut we found some dates one of the drivers was sent in search of the inhabitants of this hut and it was some time before he could find one at last a miserable-looking wretch was brought there who was so frightened at the sight of strangers that notwithstanding the good treatment he met from us he could not get the better of it he was a good-natured sort of being living far from the wicked world as i thought and i almost envied him but mankind are the wildest of all animals particularly against each other we took the usual acidi which we ate with the milk and made the man partake with us we gave him some dura and flour and some grains of burnt coffee which he tasted with delight after eating he set off and soon returned with another man with an appearance even worse than his own a sort of short ugly-looking fellow turned up nose long teeth out of his mouth and uncommon thick lips his eyes standing out of his forehead and his hair resembling the serpents of medusa he was very sulky with us and for all we tried to be friendly with him he could not reconcile himself to us i could not conceive what was the reason why this man was so totally different from the other the fact was this that my guide happened to be recognized by him to be one of the assailants of part of his tribe at a place near the southern eloa and that he escaped from them by chance all this was told by the good-natured man to my Hajj in arabic who repeated it to me i told it to the guide and he immediately recognized the man the guide then went up to him and talked in friendly terms but he could not put him into good humour i caused the Hajj to inquire how many people there were in the eloah and he said a great many but would not tell the number probably i thought they were but few only they wished to frighten us away notwithstanding all this i thought it would be proper to keep a strict guard at night but we soon found that we were not to sleep there the ugly man disappeared half an hour before we perceived it and by this time it was quite dark we perceived great uneasiness in our guide but he did not wish to show it either to us or to the other men of the place some time after the other man on pretense of fetching water set off so that we remained by ourselves our guide was still more uneasy at last i insisted to know what was the matter he then told us plainly that he expected we should be attacked by a party on that night and that he feared they would be too strong for us he thought the best expedient was to load our camels and set off as soon as we could i thought there was no time to be lost but notwithstanding i did not like to be frightened away merely on supposition we concluded that we should load the camels and change our position till we saw what might happen it was well that we did so for soon after we perceived a number of men from various parts our camels were sent off with the luggage and i remained not far from the place where we were before with the guide though it was pretty dark we could see enough of their actions and of their disappointment at not finding us there 
they were in greater numbers than we could have opposed we made a forced march or rather a hasty retreat and with the same pace we kept on the whole night till we reached the opposite point of this aloha here we were extremely tired the camels could not stir any further without resting at last after a few hours we entered this place in the morning of the third which we found better cultivated than the other side of the crescent it was owing to the necessity of wanting water that we came there to refresh our camels otherwise we should not have passed that way as it was not in our road back to the great aloha here i found more verdure and several trees of small sweet apples which are also found in egypt there are dates plants and vegetation for the camels at some distance i saw a high wall which drew my attention on my arrival there i found the site of a small ancient town built of burnt bricks the baths were the only buildings which remain in good preservation they are cemented within with the same material which was in use by the greeks and romans for that purpose it is a kind of reddish cement made of ground bricks mixed with lime the walls of the houses are to be seen and close to the town stands the high wall which drew me there it evidently enclosed an edifice of which a very little portion now remains no doubt the materials have been taken to erect other buildings as at no great distance from this i saw another wall and on my approaching it i found it to be a greek christian church in a good state of preservation the inside is built in the form of a cross and has various divisions at each side at the end there is the usual chapel and the two places for the lateral altars which form the sides of the cross it is about fifty feet long and twenty wide the materials are of burnt and unburnt bricks at some distance from this i came to another building very massive it was a square wall without entrance i contrived to ascend to the top of it and found that it must have been a copped convent there were several cells separated from each other and a very deep well of water in the centre so that the inhabitants of the place were independent of the necessity of coming out to seek that element having fed the camels we advanced farther into this part of the aloha as we had to cross it to come on our road again at some distance we found a man who no longer perceived us than he set off like an antelope our guide ran after and succeeded in reaching him within the distance of a gunshot he then hailed him and he stopped for when a man is within the reach of a gun if he do not obey he may expect a ball will reach him our guide then turned back and the man followed him when he came sufficiently near to allow me to speak to him i found that he was nearly out of breath with fear as it is time that i should state the reason why this man as well as he of the other part of this aloha were so frightened i must inform my reader that my guide was no less than one of the sheikhs of these bedouin tribes who make their incursions into these places at a time when the rice or barley are up and take away all they find rob the poor inhabitants of the fruits of their labor and often leave them to starve in the lone desert and if any resistance is made their lives are often the forfeit of this attempt to protect their property grumar was well known by all of the people of the aloha but no one communicated this to me but the moorish Haj came to the knowledge of it by other people and he of course communicated it to me and if we had stayed a little longer in the place where we were the night before we should have paid the forfeit for what grumar had done before to these people this was the reason why he would not take us to siwa for he was too well known there and if we had gone to that place with such a man we should have become the victims of revenge we requested the poor man to show us some water which he took us to in a few moments we halted a while to refresh our camels and make our achite or flour pudding we took our station under a large suit tree and set the camels to finish their repast the country here forms a circle with a running rivulet in the centre the water is very sweet and the land produces good rice and barley the inhabitants are only six in number four men and two women they live entirely on the product of their own labour and water it is not to be wondered at that they were afraid of my guide as they knew his past tricks 
when he visited them with all his tribe of these people we only saw two the rest were absent far off at work and would not return till night we left this place and arrived at a day's distance from our first aloa or el Kassar, and on the fourth in the evening we reached that spot again it appeared that our hajj had lost his purse on the road with three or four dollars in it he thought he could find it if he could procure a donkey to go back a few miles but no one was willing to lend him one and having informed themselves where he thought he might have lost it they set off themselves and found the purse which they of course claimed as their own we passed the forenoon of the fifth in the village i inquired if any of them had any article to dispose of and told them that i would give them money in return nothing was brought to me of any consequence only a broken grecian vase of bronze about eight inches high of a very curious shape and a small cherub of greek work not more than three inches high during the morning i was taken on one side by the cady who was uncommonly polite to me all this time for which attention i could not account he told me in a few words that himself the sheikh salim and his father had made up their minds to offer me to remain there with them that i should become a mohammedan and that a great feast would be made on my account on the day of the festival of that ceremony that i should partake of part of their lands and if i knew how to introduce some new produce it would be all to my own advantage and lastly that i might choose four wives from among their own daughters and that i should be happy there without going about so much after stones i had not a little difficulty to get myself out of this scrape i left the cady with hopes that i would return soon and then perhaps my mind might be more inclined to stop there and marry but for the present i could not leave all the rest of my affairs at cairo which i left unsettled my sicilian servant was attacked also at the same time but he got off in a more speedy way than myself he told and promised them that as soon as he had accompanied me to cairo he would return immediately and stay there with them all the rest of his life at last we set off in the afternoon for the village of zabu and left all good friends at the village of el Kassar to sheikh salem i made a present of a string of very ordinary sort of corals which he took with great pleasure some pieces of soap and a portion of coffee to the cady i gave equally the same on our coming out of the village the people saluted us very cordially and said they expected us soon back again to stay with them this day we began our journey very merrily but it ended very badly we ascended the rock we had to pass to come at the village of zabu and on our descending my camel slipped his foot on one side and rolled down the rock the height of about twenty feet taking me of course along with him i did not get off so easily this time as i did when i fell on the sand in wadi el gemal for here they were all hard stones fortunately however no other harm was done as it appeared at the time but a few bruises and a blow on my side i was put on a donkey belonging to a man who followed us from the other village and i was brought so to zabu to the house of sheikh ibrahim the son-in-law of our guide my saddle was my bed as usual fortunately we had a few drops of brandy in our stock and my bruises were rubbed with it but my side did not permit me to stir without great pain on our entering into the house i saw a great number of people assembled eating rice out of their usual bowls i was accommodated in the passage which leads from the street door to the yard behind the house my mattress or saddle occupied half of the space from one wall to the other and in all there was not two feet left for the men women children cows buffaloes donkeys sheep goats and dogs to pass there the passage was constantly crowded with people who occasionally trod on my feet or gave me a kick on the head but this was not the worst of the thing it happened often that while the cows buffaloes or donkeys passed i had reason to fear the consequences of my being thus situated there was another thing which was not the least of all the rest the feast of rice eating was kept in consequence of the death of a man related to sheikh ibrahim the landlord of the house where i was and he was taken to be buried just before we arrived 
no sooner was the eating ended than the most tremendous noise issued from the outer doors it was the widow of the deceased who returned home accompanied with all the rest of the matrons of the village all in great uproar they had all to pass by my side into the yard where the house of the deceased was and every half hour they had to repeat this lamentation all through the street before the house so that the place where i lay was a continual passage the pain in my side was not diminished and the skin became rather black i tried to move but i could not on the morning of the sixth i had many visits of the sheikhs they all congratulated with me that i did not break my neck for it might have been so by the fall i had i spent the rest of the day in taking notes towards the evening of the second day i was with the moorish hodge and my sicilian servant who were my physicians i felt my side was somewhat better and i was in hopes to be able to bear the motion of the camel on the next day after sunset the widow who had buried her husband on the day before came and seated herself near to me sobbing i supposed for the loss of her husband my sicilian servant tried to persuade her to bear the loss patiently but she continued sobbing at last she said that none but me could restore her to happiness and that she hoped that i would not refuse her the favor i could not understand what the woman meant and she sobbed again while the moorish hajj was talking to quiet her but in vain she still continued there and said that none but me could cure her of all her trouble at last i asked what she wanted of me she said that she saw me writing magic and begged i would write two pieces of paper one to get another husband as soon as possible and the other to make use of for the same purpose if he should die we endeavored to persuade her that i was not in possession of magic but she would not be convinced and went away much displeased with my harsh proceeding against her i could not help reflecting that if i had the art of procuring husbands to widows i could have obtained employment enough in europe without travelling in strange lands for such a purpose on the seventh i tried to mount the camel but my side would not permit me at last on the eighth on the afternoon we set off i felt much pain the two first days but it appeared diminishing after the above two days the eighth and ninth brought us to the flat desert of the horizon and another day the tenth to the tumulus the eleventh to rajan there we were without water and we had to drink some from that place which was very salt we however filled the hudris and on the twelfth took the road towards the south east by east as i wanted to go to see a place called el mul we passed a great quantity of sandbanks this day and slept on the summit of one of them on the fifteenth afternoon we reached el mul hoping to find fresh water but alas we were disappointed the drivers made the eside with salt water and we ate it in this place i found the ruins of a small ancient village and the remains of a very large christian church and convent some of the paintings on the wall are very finely preserved particularly the figures of the twelve apostles on the top of a niche over an altar the gold is still to be seen in several parts and their faces are well preserved this place is situated at the end of a long tract of land which had been cultivated in former times but it is now left for want of water it extends more than ten miles from west to east towards the nile we went on as soon as we had refreshed ourselves with salt pudding and salt water for as we were disappointed there our next resource was the nile or at least some of its canals we travelled till midnight and arrived within twelve miles of that river we suffered much from thirst this night though we were so near the water my mouth had formed a crust of salt within it so that i could scarcely articulate a word and for several hours i felt what it was to be truly thirsty we were almost all in great distress at last one of the drivers told us to stop for there was sweet water near us at the sound of these words we were all agreeably surprised but i could not conceive where the water could be as we were in a flat plain covered with small pebbles and stones he had kept a small skin of water concealed in a sack all the way from the aloha as he said he expected this would happen 
i do not know that in all my life i have tasted anything more sweet and pleasant than that water though it had been closed up in a skin for several days at last on the morning of the fourteenth before the sun we arrived in the valley of the nile at the bahar yusuf and on the evening of the same day we reached sudamin the place where i engaged my guide and on the fifteenth we returned to benzerf where i embarked for cairo the blow i received from the fall and the elawa did not get better it continued to pain me much and the part became black and swelled i found the consul mr salt had returned from upper egypt the plague was very violent in cairo at that time but as i had business to transact with the consul i went at night to the consulate and having arranged my affairs with him i returned to rosetta where i arrived on the twenty third in hopes to end the business of the attack in karnak as soon as i could and set off for europe but i was totally mistaken for the intrigue displayed in this affair is almost beyond the possibility of explaining mr druetti in defence of the two assailants lebulo and rosagnano his compatriots and in his service said that mr salt was the accuser that in the account i sent to mr salt i had declared that i did not seek for redress and in fact i did not as i was well aware of the intrigues which would have been displayed by my adversary but as the affair had been brought forward i made a formal declaration against the two assailants lebulo and rosagnano mr duetti availing himself of the influence he had with the new consul mr russell made up a tissue of stories of his own fabrication saying that i went under his window to stop the people from working and that it was a mere dispute and not a premeditated attack mr russell wished to have this affair thrown aside and that nothing more should be said but we insisted it should be brought forward and upon having the two assailants brought down from thebes to alexandria mr duetti continued to put himself forward saying he was accused by mr salt but a declaration made by me that my deposition was against the two assailants put it out of his power to have any farther ground to prevent our proceeding against his agents on the pretext that he was accused also by this time the hurt i received from the fall and the aloha turned out to be troublesome and had confined me near a month to my bed in rosetta it happened that mr russell the french consul was to return to france and mr tednar devan the vice-consul succeeded him provisionally this good sort of honest gentleman a great honour to his country is a justice of peace had been in egypt for many years he was one who cut a conspicuous figure in the days of the revolution he never was higher than cairo and had a great wish to go up to thebes he never had a better opportunity offered to him than the present as he was to be judge in the above cause he answered to our consuls that if i wished to proceed i must deposit immediately twelve hundred dollars as a security to defray the expenses which would be incurred in the examination of this affair that he must go up to thebes accompanied with lojars clerks stewards witnesses boats barges canjars and so forth and all this at my expense while i might only hope for redress i was more than tired and as i knew the people we had to deal with and to what point they could carry their intrigues i had no hopes of redress be assured my gentle reader that in this simple sketch of this affair you can but form a very small idea of what passed for i cannot at present enter too far into the explanation of it i shall only state how it ended the two assailants lebulo and the renegado resignano piedmontese were obliged to come to alexandria to take their trials and when they arrived were so sure of getting off in some way or other that they not only confirmed my deposition but boasted of what they had done now to the conclusion their protector mr druetti knew very well how he should get out when the affair came to the extremity i demanded an interview with him before the consul and a number of other people to have an explanation of the various wrongs he had done to me but all to no purpose 
I insisted, and at last it was arranged by Mr. Duetti that an interview should take place with only the British vice-consul, the French consul, him, and myself. This was not what I wanted, as I thought I might have the chance to expose his conduct publicly, but he took care not to consent that a public meeting should ever take place. Unfortunately, on my first landing in that country, I became under an obligation to him and another person, particularly by having had an apartment in his Ocle for three weeks during the time of the plague, and through the said obligation it was supposed and expected I should sacrifice my principles, which has been another cause of so much hatred against me. When I requested him to explain before the two consuls what cause I had given him to induce him to evince such animosity against me, I believe he was not on his guard at that moment for the first word he expressed related to my wrong proceeding in taking the obelisk from the island of philo i could scarcely believe that a man who held a situation once as a consul should forget himself and show an open inveteracy against an individual merely because he was fortunate in his undertakings i must acknowledge that it must have been provoking to a man like Druetti, who did not search antiquity from the love of these relics but merely for interest and whose views were directed chiefly to the british and french museums to see a stranger accumulate in three years a greater and far superior collection than he had done in fifteen and as in consequence of this his hopes on the british museum were lost he could not restrain his passion the conclusion of all this affair was that after a nine-month struggle to bring the two assailants to a trial the french consul put an end to it in a few words by only saying that the two persons accused were not french subjects but piedmontese and that if we wanted redress we must go to turin for that thus i received redress for that shameful outrage but i was not surprised as i fully expected it would end in such a manner i should not intrude such a narrative on the patience of my reader were it not that even at paris i found the persecution of mr Druetti had not ceased on my arrival in that capital i found his son-in-law busied with the public prince who only on the assurance of his assertion and the prejudice already excited against me for serving another nation put before the public whatever he could persuade the censors to pass and what he could not he publicly asserted in a most atrocious manner i had sent an answer to these publications to be inserted in the journals of paris but such were the intrigues carried on that my reply was intercepted and sent to mr Druetti in alexandria consequently it never reached the hands of the editors at last having put an end to all my affairs in egypt in the middle of september eighteen nineteen we embarked thank god for europe not that i disliked the country i was in for on the contrary i have reason to be grateful nor do i complain of the turks or arabs in general but of some europeans who are in that country whose conduct and mode of thinking are a disgrace to human nature after an absence of twenty years i returned into the bosom of my family from whence i departed for england and having been persuaded to put before the world the narrative of my researches and operations in these countries i hope the english reader will pardon me for the many errors i have committed in this volume particularly in the english phrases end of part twenty seven End of Narrative of the Operations and Recent Discoveries in Egypt and Nubia by Giovanni Belzoni